very close to Khajuraho and Sagar cantonment, he was ordered to visit in this area. That's why I used this term, he visited in Khajuraho in 1838. So in his report, he mentioned a fourth to Lalaji in which I found the large inscription. So it was known as Lala early, Lalaji earlier, but when Cunningham visited in this area, he didn't use this term. He didn't ask, this is called Lalaji. He visited in uh, 18, 15, 1865. That time people were calling this temple as a vision of the temple. Like you can read in this slide, number seven temple called Vishnath is situated on the east side of the old bed of Siv Sagar. And it is the most northerly building of this hall of the Western group. But it is also very interesting. If you will follow the second slide of mine, when you will enter in this temple, you can see two inscriptions are on left and right. So just on left, that's the inscription which was placed by the King Yashovarmana. But the right one is talking about a temple that was built by a businessman that's called Vedanath Temple. That's why in this slide, it is mentioned that when Cunningham visited in this temple, he found there are the two inscriptions. So inside the entrance portico of this temple, there are two large inscribed slab, slabs which are dated respectively in the somewhat year of 1056 and 1059 or AD 999 and 102. But as they are off in different sizes and are not fixed, it is probably that only one of them actually belongs to the temple as the earlier record was the only inscription seen by Burton in 1838. Sir Cunningham want to make clear, I will accept this temple as a Vishnath or, a, or the Barakateshwara temple because when Cunningham visited, he found this inscription on the steps of this temple. So just on the left side, that's the main inscription read by this temple. And this is very important. Like the really, this temple was named with two main temples during the time of Danga Deva. In a one sentence, it is mentioned as a Pramathanatha temple. Like you can read in this shloka, Vigyana Vishwakarta Dharma Dharan, Sutra Dharan, Chicha Bidhen, Vidade Prasada Pramatnathasya. It means the temple of Pramatnatha, Lord Shiva, Pramatnatha is called the, the God who killed the Pramatha or that uh, Kamadeva, was constructed by the architect named Chicha. So it is the only inscription in Khajrao where they mention the name of chief architect, which they mention as Sutradhar. His name was Chicha. And who was virtuous and was like Vishwakarma in knowledge. So that's also very important for us. Generally, when we people talking, we talking these temples were constructed with dif different kind of uh, Vastu Shastra or, or so many books. But here they literally very ma mentioned very clearly, Vigyan Vishwakarta, Vishwakarta means he was literate with Vishwakarma Shastra. So actually the temples of Khajrao were constructed as per the Vishwakarma Shastra and the chief architect of temples are known as the Vishwakarma. If you'll follow the next slide, it's also very interesting and important because at the end of inscription, it is mentioned in Samvat 1059, Sri Kharjur Vaike, Rajya, Sri Dhangadeva Rajya, Sri Markateshwar Prasasti Siddha. So the name of town was Kharjur Vahak. First time it's mentioned, it's a single inscription where the name of city is mentioned. And the king who built this temple is also mentioned. And what is the name of this temple? That's also mentioned. So here we can understand during the time of Dhangadeva, it was known as a Markateshwara and Pramathana temple. During the time of uh, Cunningham, it was known as a Vishnu temple. Still we call it Vishnu temple. But when Captain Word visited in this area, this was known as Lalajika temple. But what is important? Why it is called Markateshwara temple? So in the verse 48, it is it is very interesting, uh, interestingly mentioned. Glorious in the word is the divine lofty ling made of emerald. Markata means emerald or called Panna. I think it can be the reason we have the Panna Valley. So which was worshipped by Indra. So it shows his divinity and importance. It is not from this, from this earth. It came from heaven. And which having been obtained from him as a favor by Arjuna, what brought to the earth by him for worship by Yudhisthira, and lastly was installed by illustrious Dhanga with due options. 
So it's very important like this emerald shoeling came from Indra to Arjuna and Anju, Arjuna gave this lingam to Yudhishthara and then it was worshipped in Krita Yuga means in Kali Yuga by Dhanga Deva. So in the next uh, slide you can see that people want to know who were the constructors, who were the Dhanga Deva, which family he belongs. So here I mention in this slide generally people call this is called Chandela dynasty. And it is a general opinion in all scholars. These are called Chandilas because they were the descendant of moon god, Chandra Varman. But I'm sorry to say, I didn't found this name in four or five different inscriptions, which I read. Like it is not mentioned in the first inscription of Lakshmana temple, not even, even in the second, which is in uh, Vishnath temple. They mentioned a very special name called Chandatreya. So it is means the three, the Rishiya three has Three sons, those got through the blessing of Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva, their name were Chandatreya, Dattatreya and Krishnatreya. Later those names were known as Soma, Dattatreya and Durvasa. So people misuse that name Soma as the moon god. And later in period they propagated this story. There was a love affair between Hemabhati and the moon god and this then Chandravan was, was born. That, that's a very late story. If you will follow about the parental or the parents of Dhangadeo, they are they were the great people. The most important person of this dynasty who built the Yeshua, that's the Lakshmana temple, and also conquered the Kalinjara fort, and he established this Chandela dynasty. His name was King Yeshu Varmana. And his queen was Puspa, and that's highly uh, praised in the scriptures. With the great ladies in our literature, like the Narmada River, the Anisuya, Arundhati and Madalsas, and especially Anisuya, Arundhati and Madalsa were known for their Satatpur. So that's also a great thing. So King Dhanga was the son of King Yashovarmana and the Queen Puspa. And there was a great praises or they, 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 they praised Lord King Dhanga with some mythical characteristics. So like in the verse 42 of Markateshwara uh, Shilalek, they mentioned the queen, queen worth from the god among us man to a son of novel, novel character, manly Dhanga, just as Sachi from Jayant to the ruler of gods or Indra. So like here, they compare Dhanga as the Jayanta. In the verse 43, they mention Dhanga as Krishna. Like Krishna was the beautiful son of Yashoda, but he destructed Putana and the Kansa. So here they worship. Okay, when he was born, a lot of demons or the, the, the foes and uh, uh, opponents were killed and controlled by Yashoda Varvana just in his birth. But the most shocking thing which I read in this inscription, and really it was great information. And that, that's not inscribed or detailed or accepted by the scholars of, or historians of India. In the next two verses, really it will shock us ki, what was the length of Chandera dynasty, which was completely ignored in Indian history. So in verse 45, it is mentioned, Your Majesty, please look at the Lord Kausala here. Lord Kratha, please listen to the commander immediately. Lord Simhala, Simhala means very clear, Sri Lanka now, please stand away from going down. You chief of Kuntala, make your submission after putting the hem of your upper garment on your mouth. So it's really very interesting. At the audience hall or in Darbar hall, the attendant just inviting all the different kings like from King Kausala, the Kritha, the Singhala and Kuntala. They are just giving their obeys or respect to the King Dangadeva. So it's really very interesting. But what is the next? Most shocking. In the prison of Dhanga Dev, there were some beautiful queens. So, like in the next sloka, they mention in verse 46, they mention, Who are you, the wife of the king of Kanchi? Who are you, spouse of the chief of Radha? Radha generally in later period is read as Radha. Actually, it is Radha. Who are you, wife of king of Anga? Such conversation took place among us, the imprisoned wives, 
whose lotus eyes were wet and with tears of his enemies over whom he had gained victory. So it is really very interesting. We are watching the king of Singhala is here, the queen of Radha, Anga and Kachi is here. Even the Andhrapati was also there. So they extended their power towards south also. In the Lakshmana temple, they mention about the Kashmira, Mithila and Kaushala and the Khasa. So it shows that from east to west to north to south, maximum area they 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 they, they visited, they fought, and they, they tried to conquer. I don't know how they lost their that glory of history. And here, as I told you, King Dhangadeo built the temple of Vishwanath. So they also praised in this inscription which kind of temple is this and how it was constructed and what is the size of this temple that we can follow from these uh, these shlokas like verse 49 is clearly mentioning by that king was set up in a temple a second deity made of the stone whose shine as god were the remover of the bond of pain so it is very important now we can't find it the emerald shivalingam we can just see one stone shivalingam so it's also mentioned in inscription with that emerald shivalingam they installed one stone shivalingam so in the temple now we have one emerald that's sorry that's a stone shivalingam here we have a lot of conflict and controversies in Khajrao, especially the local priests they ask there's a temple called matangeshwara temple that has a massive shivalingam so they told the people actually that emerald shivalingam is placed under this uh, huge stone shivalingam and every year it uh, increases a little bit like the one mm so when reporter came to me and just asked mr sukla we want your opinion the local priests are asking this um, that's this shivalingam is increasing every year like a small grain of mustard seed or one mm so i just asked the question to them you just go and ask to the priest just let me know if this is this uh, figure was installed in uh, 1200 AD, if it is increasing every year like 1 mm, so how much it should be increased within 1000 years? It should be 10 meters. And what is the 10 meter means? It should be like 30 feet. So when they went again to the priest and they asked that, okay, what is the size of the shilling? Um, he said, nine feet like the upper area is just nine feet but the priest could not understand the whole shivalingam is divided in three different parts like the top i mean uh, like like lingam the middle is octagonal and the lower in in uh, in, uh, in a square is form so it, suppose it should be 27 feet but if it is increasing gradually it should be cracked down it should destroy the temple so when this question was came then the priest said sorry sorry sir it was increasing but later in period the local king put one small uh, the, that's golden nail in the top of the temple. That's why it's not increasing. So this kind of uh, rumors and uh, stories we have in Khajra. But if you'll follow the second verse, the verse 50, so it is mentioned by the illustrious king Dhanga, this temple was erected of Lord Sambhu. So once it is called as a Pramathnath, one is called Margadeshwar, one it's also mentioned as a Sambhu, the chief of the gods with its summit, white like the autumnal autumnal cloud which his chariot glided past the cloud embracing golden clusters of the temple aruna the charioteer of the sun speckled with color regarded even the crest of meru as larger in height so it shows that it, it was one of the biggest temple in the time so comparatively it's equal size with lakshmana temple and the kandari is the biggest one that's that's built in later period but the last one is also very interesting where it is mentioned in verse 51 verily the divine architect himself made had made its arch having entered the bodies of artists out of the devotion from lord shiva so again the local people ask that these all temple of Khajuraho were constructed within two and a half day because the lord visokarma and divine god were entered in the body of uh, artisan and the whole stone turned like a vex and they just produce all this stone in the form of puppets and then they constructed all temple of Khajuraho within two and a half days. So those kind of myth we have. But look at the next slide, it's very interesting. 
in Khajuraho, we have the two slides or the two uh, uh, images we have where they dedicated some or respected the chief architect. So like one we have in Lakshmana temple, one we have in Kandariya Mahadu temple. Both I will show on my slide. Like here, here you're watching. At the center of my slide, you're watching this gentleman sitting big, big board. That's the chief architect. And which is mentioned as Chicha. He is just keeping a big board and inscribing it and writing and detailing on his board. And all those tiny person is standing on left and right side, keeping some hammers in their hand. Those are the artisans. But people standing behind with beard, those are the acharyas. If you'll follow the next slide, that's very clear. Here, you're watching a man with beard and keeping kamundalu. That's the acharya. He's telling to the chief architect, he's keeping a board on his hand. So without permission or explanation of acharya, chief architect could not inscribe each single figure. So if some was erotic art is there, it was not a fantasy of Chandiala kings. It was a kind of a invention which they did with iconography and placed in a very special of the temple. So I will try to detail some beautiful erotic art which is on the temple of Vishunatha. And the people standing behind those are the chief architect. They're keeping some hammer and chisel in their hands. And here, this makes very clear how did they carry the load? So they carved the blocks, they tied the blocks with ropes, and carried by the bamboos, like palanquin. So that time we have the police, we have this uh, carrying of the load. So whole stone was coming from Panna, and they were they have own uh, quarries where they were collecting the stone. Then they have own workshop where they were carving the stone. From the workshop, they were carrying all the carved blocks to the site, and they start assembling the temple. So there were the three, three groups of the people, the people, like one group is collecting stone from the quarry, second group was carving the stones, third group was assembling the, the, the temple as per the order. So all micro details are here. Here I want to ask again, okay, I'm audible now? Hello? Yes. Yes, you are audible. Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Ah. Ah, ah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hmm. Here now I'm coming on temples. So it is a one temple that looks very pretty from a distance because it's only temple in Kajrao, which is on a platform. First time we can see the Lord sitting with his Vahana. So it's a vision of the temple. So just you watching temple on left side and the Mandapa on the right side. So that's the Mandapa of Nandi because temple dedicated to Lord Shiva. So it is really very surprising. That's the only temple where you can see the Vana. We can't see Garuda opposite to Vishwanath. Uh, that's a uh, Lakshmana temple. You can't see the, the Nandi opposite to Matangeshwara or Kadariya Mahadu temple. So it's the only temple that's perfect combination of attend the is, uh, uh, Vahana and the main deity. And it was Panchayatana temple. Like there was the four shrines just each and every corner. But it lost two shrines from southeast and northwest corner just two are remain those are badly renew renovated later in period and here we can see that as i told you that's what the details are remain what are lost now and here is one of the most beautiful nandi which you can see in central india it's massive it's very big it's a monolithic figure of nandi and sitting in a small mandapa so here are the details of mandapa so it's a Rangamandapa type of pavilion resting on eight central, central and 12 peripheral pillars of the Bhadraka order with Chatuski projecting from the middle of each side. The pavilion with its four balconies looks pancharat on plan. This is very interesting in Khajurao. Balconies are very fantastic architectural development which was utilized for people where they were sitting they were chatting and they were sharing their information or they were doing sastras, especially in big temple. Balconies were the place where the chief architect or the teachers were sitting and they were uh, delivering their lectures to the crowd. And at the Adhisthana on the platform or the Jagati of this uh, this uh, small mandapa, you can see Kharshila and the Chipika and Karnika with Jadikom, Karnika, Graspatika and Antarpat. And the size of Nandi, you can understand the size, 
10 meter long and 1.82 meter high. But Captain Ward, when he visited, he is calculating the weight of this bull in about 10 ton. So that you can understand what is the size of this Nandi. And here we have the main temple. So it is very close to the first temple, Lakshmana temple. It has five different compartments. So in the next slide, you can see the plan and elevation of the temple. So in the top, you can see the plan of the temple where you can see the first Ardha Mandapa, Mandapa, Ardha Mandapa, Mukh Mandapa is the same. Then Mandapa is there. Then Mahamandapa with transpets, Antarala, Parikrama and Garvagriha. If you see the lower elevation of the temple, so first part of the temple, this is Ardha Mandapa or called the Mukha Mandapa. Or sometimes it's, it's mentioned as a Mukh Chatuski. So Krishna Deva mentioned this area as Ardha Mandapa. But uh, Amit Hagi sir mentioned this area as a Mukh Chatuski. The second portion mentioned by uh, uh, Krishna Deva as the Mandapa. And Amit Hagi sir mentioned this area as a Mukha Mandapa. Then the Maha Mandapa is here with transpits. And then Antarala, that's called in outer side as a Kapuli, which Dr. Devang Desai mentioned for beautiful erotic images. Then the Parikrama, the ambulatory is surrounding uh, of the inner, inner sanctum. So that Parikrama we can see in three major temples like Vishunatha, Lakshman and Kandarya. Then the sanctum cinturum, like the whole area is here that we call a Garvagriya. And here we can see the whole architecture, the elevation of the temple. That we can divide in three, the four different labels. Like bottom area, which we call Adhisthana. It has a lot of series of ornamental moldings like Jadikumba, Khar Kapot Pali, Antarpat, all those are Jad or the Kalash Kumbak. All those details are on the wall. Then we can see the Jangha. In the first temple, the Jangha was divided in two tiers of images. But the proportion was the same. Like there was a space for three tiers of or the tiers of images. But in Lakshmana, just we have the two tires. But in Kandarya, sorry, in the, in the vision of the temple, they developed three tires of images. So in all those tires, they put the Lord Shiva at the center. And Apsras, Nakanya, Sursundris are placed just beside of the Shiva, Lord Shiva. So there are the, uh, I can say, the six corners. So like two corners of Mahamandapa area and two corners of Garvagra area and two corners of the juncture area. So six corners are there where we have those kind of images in three tiers. Then the Kapali, the North and South Kapali is also placed where we have images. Then the next is called Jangha. As I told you that all images are on this area. And after that, beautiful balconies, which is known as Kakshasana in Khajarao temple architecture. Those are very special, very unique as per the architectural design. And those are providing the light or air circulation inside the temple. So when you enter inside the temples of Khajrao, you will not feel absence of light. And also when you are entering in this temple during the time of uh, rainy season, sorry, that's uh, uh, the heavy, uh, sorry, uh, especially in summer season. If suppose temper, temperature uh, rises in about 48 degrees Celsius. If you will enter in the temple, you feel like it's air conditioning. You can feel the breeze. So that's the beautiful uh, beauty of architecture of Khajrao, how they manage the arrangement of light in the circulation of air in these temples. Then the last word is Shikhara. And here we have the wall. As I told you, so generally just in the corner, they have the beautiful images. And or this area, you can see on the right side, you can see a big wall area is there. And wall is divided in three different layers. So this is called Kapuli area or the Antaral area where they have the couples in the central projections and the Apsara just in the corner. But generally in the upper and middle row, they put the mythical animal, which we call Shardul. In the lower row, just in the corner, they put the couples. In the rest places, they put Lord Shiva and Apsaras and uh, Sorasundris and Nakanyas. Here I try to explain about the Shikhara, which kind of Shikhara we have in Khajrao. So generally main Shikhara is divided in many proportions. Like in the top we have the Vijayapuraka, then we have the Kalasha, and Chandrika, Amla, Chandrika again, then Madhyabandh, Amla Sarika, Griva, Rath, Pratirath, Karanrath, Bhumi, Circular Bhumi Amalak, Rectangular Bhumi Amalak, 
Urushranga. So generally that Lakshmana and Vishnath, they are very identical. So they have the main Shikara. The main Shikara is divided with Urushranga and Karnashranga. So just on the side, we have beautiful Urushrangas, like three Urushrangas are there. But just in the corner, we have two Karnashrangas beside of these Urushrangas. Then after, the projections, like it has a Meena Bhadra. Meena Bhadra is associated with Pratiratha and Karnarath. And uh, all that, uh, the corner one, the whole projection of Karnaratha is divided with Bhumi Amlakas and the rectangular Bhumi Am Amlakas. So all those details we can see in this temple. And all the temple were nicely decorated with beautiful entrance arch, which we call Makar Torana. Even about this temple, it is mentioned in the verse 50 when its Makar Torana was so beautiful, it looks like the Shukarma himself carved the Torana of this temple. But unluckily now, Vishnath temple lost this Makar Torana. I use just to give an idea about Makar Torana. This Makar Torana is situated or placed in Lakshmana temple. But look at the ceilings. Like the, the, the ceiling on left, it is from just at the entrance from the Mukhmandapa. The second one on the right side, it is from Antarala area. It looks like wooden carving. How did they carve the different stones in different shape and designs with so many cups and coffers? And then they use the Padma Kesha or the pendant and Apshras were just placed in the corner. So we can understand which kind of mathematical calculations they had and how they carve all those things and made this kind of beautiful ceilings. And when you are entering inside the temple, just at the Mahamandapa, you can see Natya Mandapa is there. And there are the four columns just on the Natya Mandapa. On the column of Natya Mandapa, we can see beautiful Shala Banjikas or mythical animals. A lot of decorations are there. Unluckily, what was happened? When you will enter in this temple, you will find maximum Apsharas or Shala Banjikas on the columns are missing now. I don't know. I found some beautiful Apsharas now are in Indian museum or different English museums. So maybe when what was happening, like many great people were visited in Kajrao and when they admitted this is beautiful statue. So maybe just to please them, the local king donated or gifted a lot of images to those people. So that could be a reason many beautiful images now abroad or outside the Kajrao. And here we have some decoration details from the door frame. So generally all the door frame of Kajrao temples decorated in seven layers. Like Sapta Sakha is there. So first Sakha is decorated with Patralata. Means there should be beautiful lotus petals. The second and sixth Sakha with the Vyala. Means called Vyala Sakha. Then the third and fifth shows Ganas. Like here we can see the Ganas standing here. Like it's a Vyala Sakha. It's a Patra Sakha. And here is the Gana, Gana Shaka. Then just in the center, they put the couples. So there are the seven Shakhas are there. What, which, kind, which kind of images we have in the wall? Like I was repeating again and again. But being a Shiva temple, it is divided in six different levels. First, there is Lord Shiva with the family god and goddesses. Like we can see figure of Kartikeya, Ganesha, Parvati and Shiva and, and different Ganas are there. Then the cult images, like many more gods are there. Kajrao for their Mithun and Mathunas. So I will try to show some beautiful Mithun and Mathunas to you. Then the fifth is called mythical animals. Sardul and Vyalas, those are also in this temple. And beautiful human activities de decorated around this temple and about the Shiva and Shiva family. So as the main deity of this temple is Lord Shiva. So it is decorated with Shiva Lingam as it is mentioned in the description. With the Markateshwara, he installed a big uh, stone Shiva Lingam. So that you will see in my next slide. And surrounding of the main shrine being a Sandhara temple, always in the main niches, they decorated Andhakasur, Natish, Ardhan Arishwara, Uma Maheshwara, Bhairava, Harihara, Harihara Hiranyagarva Prajapati. So those kind of images you will see around the temple. 
what I found very common in all Shiva temple of Khajrao, I found in all the temple, Andhakasur is decorated on the south niche of main shrine. Second, I found Nates generally in all the temple, like it's a Kandaria, it's a Duladi temple or Vishnatha temple. Natesh is placed in the western direction of that uh, western wall of the main shrine. But in the northern wall of the main shrine, I saw Tripurandakari in Kandariya Mahadu temple, Ardhana Adishwara in, uh, in this uh, Vishwanatha temple. And Uma Maheshwara is very common in all the temple. Bhairava is also very common is in all Shiva temple. Harihara is also very common in all the temple. Harihara Hiranyagarv is also very common. So it's very interesting. There should be some kind of textual reference, references. So maybe when I was going to write a book or some, some paper, special paper on this temple, Vishwanath temple, I will try to find out the references from some books. Then the form of Shiva, multiple form of Shiva that you will see in this temple. In generally in all Shiva temple, we have Sapta Matrikas in the niches. So like in Vishwanath temple, in Kandari temple, when you walk a, walking around external wall, you will see the first Ganesha is there. With the Ganesha, there will be all Sapta Matrikas like Chamunda, uh, Chamunda, Indrani, Barahi, Vaishnavi, Maheshwari, Komari, Bra Bra Brahmani, or, uh, uh, or Maheshwari. All those Sapta Matrikas are placed on the wall. And as I said, so just at the in the sanctum, they decorated or placed beautiful Shivalingam. So generally, in all the Nagara temple, the yoni pot should be square in shape, in shape, and the main shulingam should be divided in three different portions. So, like top portion is cylindrical, the middle remain octagonal, and lower remain square. So, two areas covered with yoni pot, and generally yoni always have three different projections, and those projection represents srashti sthiti sahar. So, generally, and energy regulate during the time of production, and uh, 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 that's uh, present uh, that's preservation but it remains uncontrolled. So that's the top portion represents that one. But if we follow the genital of woman, so it can also be divided in three different uh, organs or the, the, the proportions like the outer vulva, the inner vulva and the curvix. So like that uh, the genital of man penetrated and enter inside the womb. So it could be the reason that the three projections or the three different division of yoni part represents all those three layers of that's genital of woman and the, the lingam penetrate and enter in the garvagra. That could be the reason we call the inner sanctum as a garvagra. So this is made by the local sense stone and the height of the lingam is about 4.5 feet. As I told you earlier, around the temple, they decorated Andhakasurva, the Natesh, Ardhan Arishur that I'm going to show you ahead in my slides like here. This is the figure of Andhakasurvada. That is on the southern uh, main niches or main niche of sanctum, inner sanctum wall. The next one is it was a Natesh figure that's broken. Next one figure of this temple are broken. I don't know what is the reason. So it was beautiful dan dancing figure. Still, we can see the drum Dumru on his upper right hand. Then after it is in western uh, wall. Look at this one. It's, it was a beautiful figure of Ardhan Arishur on the northern wall of uh, inner symptom. So we can see the, the right, the left portion of the figure is feminine with some expressions, ornamentation of goddess Parvati. And the right one is very much masculine as the Lord Shiva. Then after in the upper uh, niches, there are the, some god big, uh, goddesses and gods are there. So like the first, you can see figure that lost his head, keeping a, a kapal on his head and Nandi sitting down. So it is mentioned by doc, Dr. Devangna Sai as a big Chatan Shiva. Then in the central or the western projection, they placed Uma Maheshwara. In the, they, they placed Parvati in the northern uh, upper niche. So these are the three images. Those are placed in upper niche of Andhakasurvad and uh, Natesh and Ardhanarishwara. Also, when you will follow, these are the images. Those are placed in the lower row. So like each and every wall, the central projections have a god in the top niche. Then the main panel have the story of Lord, Lord Shiva. Then the micro images are also in the lower niche. So like they put beautiful Kubera, you can see beautiful hairstyle and potted belly like Kubera is the Yaksha. 
So Kubera is placed in southern niche in lower row and thus Brahma is placed in the western niche in the lower row and Uma Mahishwar is placed in the northern niche in lower row. So these are decoration on the just the main, main wall of Vishwanatha temple. But when you will come outside an outer wall, you will see beautiful figures. Like extreme on right, these are the different form of Shiva keeping Trishul, Nag and Kamandalu. They are placed just on the projection of the Janga wall. But if you will see the figure on the extreme on left, these are the images, those are placed on Ratikas, in upper Ratikas. So it's a one figure, it is a figure of Lord uh, Vishnu, Lord, Lord Shiva. But it's not keeping the trident in Naga. So it, it creates the question. So I found one figure in Chaturvaya's temple that's very, very close to this figure. And we call that figure as the Dakshana Murti Shiva. That's why I wrote this, uh, I wrote this figure as Dakshana Murti. Just the central one where the Lord Shiva keeping trident and book and the uh, Varadhast and the, the pot. So because in in just northern wall of the that's the outer wall, there is a figure of Agni. So in the southern wall of the same Kapali, in the southern Kapali, this figure is placed to so Madam Desai mentioned this figure as Shivagni. So like she mentioned as a counterbalance. So that's I wrote this as a Shivagni. Then Ishan is placed just in north east corner of the temple. Here we have some very very important images. As I told you, I mentioned earlier, there is Harihara. So just extreme extreme on left, there's a one beautiful figure of Harihara. So on the right side, he's keeping Trasula. But on the left side, we can see the chakra and the shankha. So it's a combination of that's uh, the Shiv and Vishnu. So that's why it's called Harihara. It's just not one single figure in this temple. In four or five different places, I found this figure on this temple. But at the center, it is one of the most romantic and most beautiful figure of Uma Maheshwara. Generally, which you can't find it because it is not on the wall. It is in, in top Ratika of Mukhamandapa towards the north. So if suppose you are with Anurag, then you will find it. Generally, the local guides also, they, they don't show this figure. But it is the most romantic figure of Lord Shiva and Parvati. With Lord Shiva keeping the chin of Goddess, watching like a loving couple. Goddess sitting on his Lalita or on a Janga or Lalitasana Mudra. And then on the right Shukla. side, we can see a Bhairav. Shukla, sir. Shukla, sir. Uh, uh, please, please conclude your talk. <coughs> sir. Yes. Uh. Just my punch mate or Luna just have the five slides. Nay band karne kill in a conclude karne kill you bowling. Just just char punch slide, just I have the full five five slides. Okay, okay. Okay. So here we have just beautiful Bhairava. Then after Bhairava, there are the Saptamatrikas. Here we can see Ganesha with Saptamatrikas. Then after here we have the very special figure of Vishnu. It's called a Vishurupa Vishnu. It has a 12 hands and it has like Vaikuntha, it's generally Vaikuntha figure. So one side it's a boar headed or one side it's a lion headed. Then after here we have again a very beautiful combination of Vishnu, Shiva and uh, Surya and the Brahma. Here we can see three hats, two lotus flowers, Trishul and Naga, Chakra and Shankha and Rosary and Kamandala. So that's why it is called Hari Hari Hiranyagarbha. Here we have beautiful Asadikpalas like Agni and Niruti. But inner part of the temple, we can see some bull had bull headed figure, those called Astavashus and Dikpalas. Then after, there are the variety of lady figures, like this lady is called Apshara holding letter and putting finger on his mouth, like she wants to hide her secret messes. Or this lady keeping conch shell and chavari. So these called Surasanduri. And some lady covered with cobra hood. So those are called Nag Kanyas. But ladies inside the sanctum, standing on the columns under the tree called Shalabhanjikas. Here we have some couples, like when couple is standing, like embracing couple. So those called Alingana Mudra. But when they just embracing each other in a erotic way, that's called Mithuna. But when they are involved in sexual act, they are called, uh, that's Mathuna. So here we have the northern the couple area. So these are some images just on the southern Kapli. So you can see one couple on the 
left left area, some at the center, uh, some on the lower row. And here we have some more erotic figure that's on the northern couple. So here we can see one lady on her head. She is wearing Rudraksha. So actually that's a kind of Tantra Yogini. She is doing some kind of a Yogini cult, a Yogini Tantra. So generally, uh, generally we have one figure in Kantariya Mahadu temple where the man on the top of head, that's called the Kamkala Yantra and that's also related with this Kundalini Jagran. But here we can see some person with those uh, keeping pot. So these are Chapanagas who were involved in this sexual act. And also they depicted a lot of social scenes. Like here you can see a lot of teachers, Savai teachers are there. But sometimes these Shavai teachers and uh, these Jain monks have some kind of discussion with each other. Like here you will see they decorated the army procession, they decorated some uh, camels are there. But here you can see the commune where monks are sitting and monks involved in sexual acts So how the rest monks are reacting around. So all these were some details that I tried to uh, show. Here is my email address and my contact number and my YouTube channel Khajrao Bithamrat where you can learn about the history of Khajrao. It is in Hindi. So maybe in future I will do it in English. So if any queries are there, you can ask now. Here I am. Sir, person, please. Uh, if there is no query, I will just uh, like to thank Mr. Amrath Kupla. It was a very brilliant paper. Uh, in fact, <coughs> and engineering people, and I was expecting they will he will detail, uh, give detail mostly of architecture, but it was a quite balanced paper. It was, uh, gave the history of that uh, temple and the builders of the uh, uh, temple. It gave a uh, detail about the architecture of the temple. And not only this, it dealt with the art of that temple also in quite a beautiful manner. It was a really brilliant paper. And I was lucky enough to hear you uh, in this uh, webinar or seminar, whatsoever you say. In fact, I will also like to thank, uh, as we are late, I won't go uh, in very detail about, uh, or uh, i like to add anything. Uh, in fact, I would like to thank Professor Eskan Mitra also for inviting me to preside over this uh, session. I thank you all who are present here to, uh, for hearing uh, this brilliant uh, presentation. Uh, it was really, uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Sukla, you have done uh, uh, great justice with uh, this topic and it was really brilliant to hear you in this webinar. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, sir. It's you. really... Can I, say one, can I say one word, please? Sir, sir. sir. Excellent presentation. Excellent. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And let us clap with the great. All the, both you. the hands together. Let us clap. Thank and you. one more. Okay. The reason is that while working in Panna area for diamonds, I did visit twice this temple. Not because of erotic scenes. Excellent, everything. Thank mm -hmm. you, sir. I'll contact you by mail. Thank, Thank you, you Satnarayan, sir, Umesh, sir, and uh, Alkes, and everyone who joined. Really, it was a web. I was planning on 3.30, but due to some reason, it was turned. So many so people good. didn't connect it. But thank you again. Maybe okay. I will get another chance to discuss Manvu, some more temples of Khajurao. Yeah, uh, we'd like to hear you once again, uh, sir. Tell me. <laughs> thank you, sir. So, thank you, uh, uh Skan, sir. Thank you. I'm uh, over to you, now, uh, Dr. Umesh Chandwadi, sir, uh, for a given time and share this uh, uh, session, and uh, uh, Mr. Anurag Suklaji, uh, for uh, uh, given his uh, most brilliant talk uh, in this webinar series. Uh, uh, this uh, 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 talk, his third talk on in our webinar series, uh, first in, uh, on Lakshman Temple, then uh, on uh, Bakun Temple, and uh, now Vishwanath uh, uh, Temple. Uh, okay. Uh, Mishra ji, I want to make a, a small observation in lighter vein. थोड़ा जोक भी होना चाहिए सेमिनार में 
आप और शुक्ला जी ब्रदर्स लगते हैं ट्विन ब्रदर्स हाँ मैडम मेरा जो फर्स्ट अपॉइंटमेंट है इन्हीं के यहाँ के जो कॉलेज है महाराजा कॉलेज छतरपुर वहां पे था और ये स्टूडेंट थे वहां पे यस 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 यू लुक सो सिमिलर यू नो व्हेन आई सॉ शुक्ला जी आई थॉट इट वाज मिश्रा जी हाँ चार पांच साल का अंतर था पर वो ये स्टूडेंट थे मैं वहाँ पर फर्स्ट अपॉइंटमेंट मेरा महाराजा कॉलेज छतरपुर हुआ था जो गवर्नमेंट पीजी कॉलेज है वही के ये स्टूडेंट है तो आप ज्ञान के साथ साथ आपके आपका जो फिजिकल लुक है उसके वो भी छा गया उनके ऊपर यस यस मैम थैंक यू केदारेश्वरी जी बिकॉज आई डेंट नो एक्चुअली यू जस्ट ज्वाइन मी एंड इट विल बी ग्रेट मीटिंग विद यू ऑन ट्वेंटी फिफ्थ दैट विल बी अनदर ग्रेट प्रेजेंटेशन अबाउट लक्ष्मण टेम्पल विच आई वो रेफरिंग इन इन माई माई दिस वेबिना प्रोफेसर एम सी सत्यनारायणा professor of uh, abc college uh, chennai uh, tamil nadu welcome sir and i am uh, request to dr satnarayana sir please share the session and uh, introduce our eminent speaker madam hamera uh, one minute sir share my is it visible krishna ji hello no sir uh, okay okay uh, we are no? hearing you yes 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 sir ha yes, oh. ah, okay yes sir right uh, really good morning to everybody really i'm very uh, grateful and also i express my sincere gratitude professor skand kumar mishra see for having you know, organizing such a wonderful international webinar uh, covering the world heritage and also the national parks in most of the countries in the world and uh, we had a very good uh, academic interested topics for all this this during covid that we have the number of lectures i enjoyed listening to the number of lectures because of the efforts made by uh, professor mishra and his team of fellow teachers now today i am going to also welcome our uh, co-chair person and also i welcome you all oh, something wrong now it's moving my second slide hello hello yes sir yes sir uh, okay. uh really i welcome and also i am glad to introduce our eminent lead speaker uh, dr hamira aisha really uh, we are all very fortunate to have hamira aisha <clears throat> now hamira aisha has a background in biology applied ecology and over 10 years of work experience in biodiversity conservation she has been working with worldwide fund for nature pakistan as the manager conservation her work includes developing and leading projects and research studies that can support the protection of diminishing biodiversity and their habitats in pakistan together with addressing key drivers poverty affecting lives of natural resource dependent communities she has authored the national plan of action combating illegal wildlife trade in pakistan her work also includes demonstrating and experimenting with new approaches and methodologies in pakistan that can support to strengthen biodiversity conservation the most recent of which is the concept of 
piloting the zero poaching framework to control wildlife poaching and illegal trade of wildlife focusing on protected areas and their buffer zones of priority protected areas a few examples of our recent work also include the indus river dolphin conservation project indus dolphin is an endangered endemic mammal and facing several challenges in pakistan of which fishing induced mortalities and the shrinking of the river flow due to several factors including climate change and uh, really we had a, a very good uh, eminent speaker and we are going to listen to her on the integration of technology in the protected area uh, within snow leopard habitat now i'll hand over to uh, hamid aisha Thank you very much, Honorable Chair, um, for this generous introduction. Um, I feel really uh, honored to be part of this forum. Um, I must also thank you, Professor Dr. Mishra, who has been the driving force behind to organize this event and really has been coordinating and pushing everyone to come on board. This is really a matter of great collaboration and uh, an honor for me to have this opportunity where so I'm also a student of this field and conservation is one thing which is very close to my heart. Um, and conservation, especially wildlife, pe kaam karna brings you a great opportunity because uh, most of the species are migratory in their nature, which means they know no borders. Um, and everybody has to take up the responsibility for their conservation. So this brings... Um, our collective wisdom and our collective uh, targets of nature conservation together. So um, my talk for today is going maybe not going to be very different than what you must have been hearing from the experts. And if I may please share my screen. Uh, just give me a second, please just bear with me. Yes, so I, I, you can see the presentation mode, I hope, now. Can you see the presentation mode now? No one. It is yeah. dark and black. Yes, now we can see it. Yes, yeah, we yeah. can see now. You can see it now. Okay, so then I'll continue to present. I'll just, yeah. So I think now you can see the presentation, right? We can see the presentation, but it is not in full screen now. Is it now? But it is dark. Okay, probably maybe just give it another second. That's fine. Okay, let me know when you can see it. So can you see the screen now? Can I present? No, only only no. black screen, black. No, black. No. Okay. okay. I, you can Just... go ahead with the previous, previous. Ah, yeah, it's fine. Okay, leave it. Okay. okay. So, okay. Fine. so just, oh, fine. just give me last minute. So probably I'll, yeah, no, I'll turn off the, I'll turn off my camera and this might help. So just give me a second. Apologies for that. We can never trust technology. Okay, so this is how we can see my screen now. Well, you should now be able to see it. Okay, 
I'll just start. Um, can you see it just for the last time if you are able to see it? Ma'am, can you click on slideshow and then say I say full? I did actually. I did this already. Okay, so just give it, give the full screen and just uh, go one by one slide down. That can help. help. Oh, okay, I think yeah, that's a good idea. So let me just give it a last try then. Okay, so I'll just start while I'm trying to connect. For some reason, it's not working. So the presentation that I wanted to talk about today basically focuses on the protected areas because this entire session that we've been attending for the past three days um, addresses protected areas, their importance, and also the sites which are very important for the historic and cultural site. Um, and while there are many stories that we've been hearing from the colleagues from all over the Asia about the approaches that they are following um, for the protection of biodiversity, uh, the technology has been recognized as a very important tool um, which uh, connects the dots in terms of the improvement of the management of the protected areas where this wildlife is found. Um, so one very important tool that uh, we've been using for a very long time, and I think tool would not be the right words to say it, it's basically, uh, so whatever way this is visible, I'm just going to continue presenting. Um, so protected areas management all over the world has been, has been highlighted as one of the important um, tool to protect biodiversity across the globe. And unfortunately, in the sites where you have the highest amount of biodiversity um, are the ones which are not properly managed. So um, a, a recent most study, which was published in 2010, late 2010, uh, mentions that in, in the world, all over the world, the protected areas which are responsible for the protection of biodiversity, um, only less than 30% of them are effectively managed and effective management engaged includes everything having enough staff having enough capacity having enough resources um, which are sufficient for the protection of biodiversity and resources and from the talks and the discussions that have been going on for the biodiversity related aspects we heard other colleagues also mentioning that the pressure which wildlife is facing and biodiversity is facing across the globe are increasing many fold. Either it's the poaching, which is the illegal take, illegal killing or illegal trade, or the destruction of the habitat of biodiversity. It is becoming a common challenge and which is why it's important that we think of basically bringing more resources and innovation to the work for people who are responsible for protected areas management. And I'm sure you are all familiar with the term rangers. So the term ranger collectively, um, we use it for all the individuals who are responsible for the management of biodiversity um, uh, at the terrestrial scapes, at the seascapes, at the freshwater habitats, and they are the mandated officials. Uh, in our countries, koi unko DFO kehta hai, koi unko RFO kehta hai, koi forest guard kehta hai, koi patrol guard kehta hai, but collectively they are called rangers. However, those individuals who protect protected areas, if you look at their numbers, they are very few. So there is this recent paper which was published recently last month, and it has looked at the number of people which are deployed to protect biodiversity all over the world within the protected areas. And very surprisingly, this number is even less than 500,000 people. And those people are not just enough to protect when we think of the charismatic species like tigers, rhinos, whale sharks, uh, whales, dolphins, snow leopards, many more species. But those are very few individuals. And this number is even less than the number of hairdressers that you would expect to be working in, in, a, in a modern country like somewhere in Europe. So 
those are the real life challenges that we get to deal with when we talk about the real life protected areas management and conservation of biodiversity and which is why thinking of the solutions which can then empower these individuals that we know as rangers to perform their duties better are very important because then when there are new techniques and approaches are in place this then enable them to come up with the solutions which can enhance the protected areas management in a long run so zero poaching is once for example one such uh, approach which is being used uh, quite widely to look at many pillars that connects the challenges and it they it helps to then address the the adaptive management challenges into a protected areas so i will not be talking about the entire zero poaching toolkit but linking technology with the protected areas management has becoming more and more popular and one tool which is known as smart it stands for the spatial monitoring and reporting tool has been widely picked up globally as one of the ways on how we can improve the efficiency and um the effectiveness of the work with the wildlife staff and the forest staff and the fisheries department staff performing to the protected areas for the improved adaptive management so smart is basically a technological interface it is based on a mobile based application which you can give to anybody working in the field they don't need to be educated they go into the field whatever they do they collect the data on this application which can then be directly sent to your uh computers are uh, usually the computers are with the protected areas managers which can then see how far their teams are working where are the threats how is the situation uh working in the park but this helps then with the limited staff and capacity for the protected areas manager to come up with the solutions which are effective so then they can figure out okay this is a protected area based on the data which my team is collecting probably right side of the park is where more threats are happening more people are coming into the park for example collecting wood or there are more poachers coming to the park to the south side this is what my data tells me so that's where i need to put my team into to to to, to look after the uh, poachers or to look at the community and this helps then the adaptive management within the limited resources they have and also helps them to develop the methodologies and the techniques which can then support them the effective protection of the biodiversity smart is a globally recognized tool it is a developed by nine conservation organization and right now there are more than 1000 sites all over the world which are using smart as as a solution to better management of their protected areas so this is a map of the world and what you are seeing here are the sites or the countries which are using smart for the protected areas management related data collection and the sites in the dark blue are basically the existing snow leopard habitats that's one of the cases that we put forward to us which are using smart and you could see there is quite a substantial chunk chunk of the snow leopard habitats which which where the smart is being applied so how does smart work so if you are looking at my screen you could see this this small mobile so basically the person who works into the field either it's a park ranger it's a researcher it's a it's a it's a dfo or an rfo they go to the field they use this mobile application and they collect the data and the data could be about where is the poacher where is the threat if they have caught somebody the information is entered into the mobile and then there is an option in it that you can directly sms this information to the main server and the person or you can take it in person and then just load the information casually to the mobile and then the person who's sitting in the protected areas management office helps to generate this information which is handy um it's kind of a solution to the very uh, uh, you know typical methods that we have for data collections i think pakistan and india are not very really different when it comes to the wildlife census and data collection tools and methodologies um but then on the basis of this information you could eventually see that this comes up with something which is useful so this is one of the park where you could see the screen uh the map is basically a protected area where the team was basically patrolling and the green color is basically the core zone of the park the red dots on it basically are the smart based data collection tool for the live uh, animals basically the endangered species which they wanted to monitor so if you look at this map this immediately tells you okay what areas of the park need more presence of the staff in terms of monitoring and for protection because 
they can be maybe under a lot of pressure for poaching or other challenges so this is the kind of solution which then technology offers for the protected areas management and staff to to integrate into the work they are doing um so this is a really simple version of the mobile application which is used so the staff which works in the protected areas they don't need to be even educated they can just use the mobile click on the application and then use the icons to identify whatever information they want to load in and then everything goes to the park manager for the information collection so now how is this uh, technology based solution could be relevant to snow leopards um so snow leopard you all know is also known as the ghost of the mountain it is a charismatic asian big cat which is only found in the mountains of central and south asia if we want to take the name we are just 12 countries in the world where this this cat is present it is a migratory species it is protected globally under the cites under the cms and all the major conventions that governs around the wildlife um as snow leopard has a huge range and you can see in the map basically the distribution and how it is spread across the different 12 countries where it is found snow leopard faces a lot of challenges it is at the current listing in the iucn red list of threatened species is vulnerable um snow leopard faces a lot of challenges climate change loss of habitat are one of them um the species is extremely vulnerable to conflict with communities especially when they share the same habitat and loss of prey which snow leopard feeds on due to poaching and illegal trade it brings it closer to communities it sometimes attacks on their livestock on their bulls and sheep which leads towards its uh, retaliatory killing snow leopard is also a target for the illegal trade and poaching because its skin uh, makes a good um, contribution to the illicit trade uh goods and which is why but snow leopard is also a elusive species and um which is why the organizations which works on the conservation of snow leopard put forward the data collection about the species status and its population as one of the priorities and which is why smart like technology tools could have a very important contribution although we should also realize that a vast majority of the snow leopard habitats are still not protected areas um however it is important because it offers us a, a great deal of what we can do um to use this small mobile based tool to engage communities with us and engage um the park rangers with us to collect the information which is then necessary for the protection of snow leopards so for example there are uh, in pakistan the work that we have started is now moving towards making the use of smart through developing those very simplified models where we can just put those apps into communities mobile and then they can collect information on what is going on with the conflict um and this information is especially critical for the areas where snow leopard faces a lot of conflict pressure and where the the chances of snow leopard being killed due to the due to this issue are very very high smart also has a very important role to play where you can then engage local communities to collect information to what is going on right now the information that we have that the community we are engaging those bakarwal communities those herders which take their livestock to the pastures which are also the snow leopard habitats to collect information about if they see any incidents of the killing of the any play species of the snow leopard if they spot any snow leopard they spot anything related to snow leopard and then this helps the information generation many folds and this helps the protected areas management to decide okay what can be done but if this information collection is then packaged using the smart in form of the any other information tool it can then help to improve the data collection and also the mandate of the wildlife departments which cannot then go anywhere by themselves due to the limited staff capacity um smart has been used a very important tool for the monitoring of the illegal trade because it's very easy just to click on your mobile take a picture it, it gets to your tag easily and gets sent to the protected areas management very very quickly and it can then help them to quickly take the action and protect the snow leopard or any species which is affected by the poaching and of course the data collection the biodiversity census and this is not just for the protected areas managers but also for the researchers then which engage into the research on snow leopard india does a 
wonderful piece of work on the snow leopard research pakistan is very active in it and many other range countries so this then offers a range of the tool which then supports you to um to collect the data which are authentic and then you don't have to do a lot of handwriting and this then just be feed into the computer and you can get the results instantly so how did we start this process in pakistan and Kunjarab National Park is the first protected area where we basically applied SMART as one of the technology-based adaptive management solution to see, well, if this can be also a support to improve the management of the park and protection of the snow leopard. So I must tell you a, a little bit about the Kunjarab National Park. It is a very unique national park. It is found in the extreme north of Pakistan. Uh, sharing border with China and it is amongst the top 10 largest national parks in the country. It's over 4,000 kilometers square in the area and it is a prime habitat of the snow leopard. So the picture of the snow leopard that you are actually seeing is a, is a captive snow leopard. So her mother was killed by poachers and then uh, she was rescued by the wildlife management authorities and then they kept her in a facility which was specially designed for her and now since since her since her young age she she's kept there and managed there in that um, in that particular facility in the north of pakistan so kujrab national park is also a very important habitat of many other species including the marco polo sheep um, ibex wolf and also many other species uh, of mammals and birds some of them are migratory in nature and this is also a widely visited protected area, um, which also means the tourism pressure is extremely high. This uh, protected area also made an important case for us because in the buffer zone of this protected area, um, uh, the conflict between snow leopard and was very, very high because of the because of the pressure on the livestock depredation. And uh, we thought this could make a good case for us to learn about how this can help to be an adaptive solution. So the mandate of this smart, which is a technology based solution, is basically very simple for us to work with together with the help of the protected areas management authority is to basically collect uh, more data, which can then help to see uh, if we can work together to improve the management of the park and especially see what is the scale of uh, violations that are happening into the area and also if smart can be adapted as a potential solution to address the challenges which park management is facing and also bringing in community into the wildlife sighting so india for example has some wonderful initiatives going on especially uh, in the ganga river um, for the ganges river dolphin there is a dolphin mitra program exist um, which basically engages the fishers from the river which collect information on the sightings of the dolphin and then they also collect information on what is the scale of threat so this is a similar kind of initiative but we want we, we were doing it on a small scale where the local communities are helping us to collect information on the threats which are, are to snow leopard and its prey species and then they bring it to the protected areas management and then they are collated and they help the protected areas managers to um, then come up with those adaptive solutions. So our process was actually quite interesting because um, you all know the protected areas management effectiveness evaluation is one tool that we use to look at what can be done. So this was the first step that we took and we identified a, quite a few areas to what needs to be done and that led us to develop a very first uh, site in Pakistan, which was the Kujrab National Park, to deploy this solution. And this is the staff of the protected areas, which were then got trained to use SMART. Um, they were provided with the mobile phones. And bear in mind, this is an area where the mobile connections do not work at many places. Um, in many cases, they do not have backups for the power. So the solutions that were provided to them were mindful of it. And which is why smart came up as a solution where an internet connectivity is not required when you are using it to so any place where a gps based data collection is possible this application works there fine for the park rangers um, and then later on there has been um, a quite a few discussions and the adaptive management solutions the park management and the rangers proposed to as of how uh, they can be adapted and they can be made part of the solutions so this is what was something so this is an old data but i just thought i'll present it to you 
So this is what we've been able to find out based on the information that we were using, collecting using this smart based tool. So the report at the top right that you are seeing is basically a map of the protected area. And the pictures that you are seeing at the bottom are the ones which were collected by the park rangers using this mobile applications, which are the footprints of the snow leopards and its prey species. And then uh, you can also see the number of information and violations that they've been collecting. So none of the information was written up on a piece of paper. All of them were collected on the mobile phone application, which was then connected to the computer and you were able to download this entire information in form of a report, which is incredible. Imagine the work of these rangers who are always busy um, with limited access to technology and resources. So this can be a game changer for them to see exactly what's happening. But based on this information, you can just simply zoom it in. I don't know if you can see. So in the map, you can see there is a there is a line which indicates to how far they went on to collect the information and also how much they were able to generate. And then this is an intensity of the patrols and the information they gathered up after every patrol that they have conducted. Uh, then some more information on the human wildlife conflict because we've been engaging with the communities and we engage them to collect the information with us. So these are some information that they gathered based on the based on the smart tools to to take pictures and collect records of the livestock depredation, especially the livestock which was attacked and killed by primarily snow leopards, but in a few cases it was also from the from the wolf attacks. So so. This this is the first time that uh, we've taken up a technology based solution to really assess its its usability to collect information on a species which is very elusive and it's play based. But what we've been learning out of it is that once technology becomes part of the adaptive management solution, it can then change solution. It can bring a change to the effective management of protected areas, especially in the areas where locations are really remote and movability is not possible. However, this is just the beginning of how we are doing it. This is going to take us maybe a couple more years where we are able to then make it a potential part of the overall management system of the protected areas. And then you have an integrated system, which also provides you a very state of the art, transparent system for you to see that where is the staff working, what kind of information they are collecting. And then that information itself offers a great deal of information to those who are also interested to research for the conservation um, uh, work because the data are untouched and there is a mere chance for it to be to be manipulated or to be wasted. So which is why SMART is a technology-based solution which is now being taken up as a potential um, potential alternate to the to the many ways the the way the data and, and it has been in many countries to improve um, the patrols and the tactics the way the information was gathered and how the, the how the ranges were patrolling. So I will stop here um, so that I can give more time to the other presenters. But I'll be happy to take questions with the permission of the chair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this uh, presentation by Hamira is open for discussion. Any, any clarifications? Hamira, Hamira, I call you Hamira because you're very young and enthusiastic wildlife conservator. I hope things improve with the smart app. It but I feel great. every platform is a learning platform. And uh, I would like to make an observation. Don't take it personally. When you were, could not open your uh, presentation full screen, you said something without uh, you know pause that technology that is why technology cannot be trusted so how do you juxtapose this against the statement of a smart app so first is, lesson yeah. learned is we have to be careful on a public platform because you are talking of technology and then the, the beginning itself you say technology i know you said that out of a little frustration because the system was not opening i am a museologist archaeologist art historian and uh, a heritage manager throughout my life i've been that and what i have learned is hand hands on experience is better than technology definitely technology is good very good it makes see it is connecting both of us i'm from hyderabad you are from are you from lahore yes i'm from lahore, lahore pakistan and i'm from hyderabad india so that that way it helps 
so this is just take it as a just a small reminder that on public platforms we got to be extra cautious of what we are saying because this is this is being live telecast also okay it is a really good observation and thank you very much for pointing this out uh, and and in fact i mean uh, what i said uh, would not be something you would not expect us to hear when we apply technological solution because you are absolutely right uh, technology is uh, an alternate but the the value of the traditional methods and the value of how things uh, can work the way we use it. it it is it can never be denied and which is why smart has been taken up as a as a supplementary tool and by the time especially when we are doing it even in Punjab so by the time we are adapting and using it we are simultaneously collecting the data using the same methods because then it still gives you an opportunity to make a comparative analysis to see okay while we are adapting the technology but we are also still keeping in mind that you know technology can sometimes fail or sometimes make it challenging for people like I clearly did because I wasn't able to connect, uh, share my screen using this. So yeah, but well noted on the suggestion and really pleased to meet you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I wish you all the best in your Thank endeavors you. in future. Thank you. Mara, are you using this technology, GIS technology for Pakistan only or whole range of uh, snow leopard? No, so this technology, so there is a, a basically smart is uh, managed by a global coalition of nine conservation organization. And Pakistan is just one case because we are using it in Pakistan, which is why I presented Pakistan's case. There are more than a thousand sites uh, which are using smart and many snow leopard ranch countries are part of it. I know Bhutan, I know Mongolia. Um, and Nepal, and then many more other countries which are basically applying for it. Um, I presented Pakistan as an exclusive case because this is the first country uh, which has applied exclusively SMART for the uh, monitoring of snow leopard focus protected areas, protected areas where we wanted to focus on snow leopards. Okay, Samira, I have one uh, clarification. Uh, what about the when the question of the validation comes? What about the data entry, the reliability of the data entry, and also just getting your database, and also whether you have any check it and recheck it after getting the data, and what what is the reliability of this uh, one? Maybe in terms of percentage, what's your uh, uh, experience with regard to the case study on the snow leopard in Pakistan? This is this is a really good question, sir. So one pro problem, and I'm sure we all conduct studies and we all collect data in whatever dimension we are focusing on. Um, there is always a margin of error, especially when we conduct it, uh, you know, on a piece of paper. And so SMART basically gives you uh, an opportunity to where we do not require anything to be written down on a piece of paper. It is basically a mobile based application which is also basically connected to the GIS based application. So you can basically geotag and collect on the information. So there is a limited chance in terms of if the data can be changed. It's not possible if you're familiar with the GIS and ArcMap. So basically, you just need to bring in and connect the information and you transfer it. So, uh, so whatever you collect basically comes back, which can also be actually very alarming because then you are liable and also the, the accountability and the transparency can be higher because then you cannot, for example, say, well, I went to patrol into this area where, are, where the data are going to be just for this site because then there is an evidence. And this is, I think, where why the role of SMART and even the experiences that we have in Pakistan gets recognized well. And we've been asked by the protected areas managers that this is probably one thing that they would like to use SMART for to see how far their staff is patrolling and what is the area coverage which is being then uh, considered. Because uh, now SMART has gone to an advanced stage. Uh, we, we haven't done it in Pakistan, but in many countries now they are using Smart Connect, which is very similar to how we track our, for example, our uh, Uber or our taxi to come to our mobile. So basically, a protected area manager, if he, his staff has the Smart Mobile, can open the desktop and see where the staff is patrolling which is also important to consider because then it can be very important for the safety point of view. So they know where the teams are. So if there is a backup required or if there is support required, they can always send the teams back after them. So I hope I could answer to your questions. Yeah. 
okay any more any more clarifications ah okay if there is no more may I request my co chair person have if you have any remarks no chair person one thing nobody uh, uh, the platform transfer the terminal ptt or there's no lapal so i said do you mind repeating your question sorry i could not hear it well yeah you can repeat it repeat it repeat the question has anybody has used a platform transmitter terminal or tagging using satellite data well sir many countries are doing it in pakistan we have not done it in the recent past but there are examples where the snow leopards were tagged across the range countries um and in fact now there are more and more uh, technology based innovations are being used so for example uh, for the human leopard conflict now there are um, ai camera based devices um camera traps which are being put up onto the area so if there is an area where the conflict pressure is high so then those camera traps for example are then trained to take a picture and send it to the park manager and they are trained to identify if the snow leopard is passing by and this then helps to transmit the message very clearly and to make sure that they take an action so and uh, many countries are doing amazing work so for example mongolia has been using those camera trap based uh, now um, uh, snow leopard uh, density um, estimation research going on and that is actually a very important way to see how the population is working um some countries are also using the genetics and other techniques to look at how the population structures and how the population density are working so yeah i mean i think it changes the use of technology is quite novel in snow leopard scapes um and i'm sure the experts can talk more of it when when they when they explain on what is going on at the regional okay th thank you very much hamera uh, actually uh, mr ganesh pant uh, dr ganesh pant आपका कोई प्रश्न सर नॉट एट द मोमेंट आई एम एंजॉइंग दॉक्स या कंग्रेचुलेशन वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग नाइस टॉक थैंक यू वेरी मच सो नाउ टू समन डॉक्टर रफान फ्रॉम मलेशिया Haril Rafan sir Dr Haril Rafan Malaysia Yes thank you very much Hello Yes I'm here sorry I'm on call A Malayan tiger Yes any any can you repeat Ah oh, okay uh, I mean Yes um in Malaysia actually I just want to uh some uh, additional input and for your information of course malaysia also apply the smart tool uh, of course it's similar to the m stripe that applied in india and so on yes of course uh, when we using the technology we cannot rely on the technology itself of course the technology is the support uh, tool uh, to manage the some of the area uh, especially for the uh, wildlife of course the important of the uh, man or the more boots on the ground is very important so it's a very useful tool and after that it must be following by the uh, men on the ground to monitor the area uh, so this is my uh, additional opinion no you are absolutely right and which is why um, i we agree that uh, boots on the grounds are important because without them technology is not going to be able to work anyway you need more boots first and then those people are going to be able to go out and collect data and which is why this research which came out i don't know if you've seen that i'm happy to share the link it just says that you have less than uh, we've just got 550000 rangers which are responsible for the protection of entire planet and this number is nothing in comparison to what you would be expecting and you have a huge earth to protect the biodiversity so this is a really small number so absolutely agree with you um protected areas management is is a combination of everything and technology is just one bit of it so unless you have enabled empowered and then well trained staff which is the boots on the grounds 
you will not be able to test any solution and hence the success is linked to those people who will be applying to it so we have the similar example and which is why in pakistan so um, uh, uh, we cannot still claim at this point if smart is a success but it is helping us to improve and this is what we are going to learn to see because the management effectiveness evaluation tool then helps us to exactly how much is the gap in terms of the management so this can be one of the tools but without having more rangers or having ample amount of rangers are very important and this paper actually tells you to what should be the minimum density of the rangers that you will be needing so i'll be leaving this link in the chat so please take a look so totally agree with what you are suggesting okay share person please conclude okay. sir okay uh, uh, thank you hamera for your excellent presentation actually we are, we are very grateful for having exposed us to an, an innovative a biodiversity a conservation digital technology which is one of the emerging trends in the wildlife or the biodiversity uh, conservation though people say that technology yes we have to rely on the technology the, these are the emerging trends because uh, uh, though i have just in 1980 but technology is uh, we must be exposed to technology technology helps us in the conservation or in the management of the uh, national park in addition to the whatever we have the uh, field information this should be conveyed into the digital world that then only we will be very successful in managing all the protected areas and also now you very well said that the how to manage your biodiversity conservation by using the uh, smart software and really excellent uh, software by what after listening to you i come across that this smart can be uh, applied to any kind of the managing the wildlife resources throughout the world and also you have how you have very well said that the role of the rangers See, unless we have a very good field oriented or the field staff where the ranger their contribution for the generating the data very very essential and as i said you are really encourage the rangers in the field and also how you highlighted the how we were, by using this smart software we have a zero poaching in future i think we hope for a zero poaching not only for the snow leopard and all the wildlife throughout the world and also you have excellently and clearly explained the smart application what are the basic things how to generate the data how you are going to apply this smart really very 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 clear anybody can understand in an understandable way you have just explained that thank you very much for that and also how you have very well explained with the a case study we have in the pakistan where you studied on the snow leopard and also how to implement for the biodiversity monitoring and the conservation and in the punjab national park in pakistan how you have taken up in the data generated and how you have checked the reliability of the software and also you also talked about the how with the help of the smart how we can have the patrolling and also how to generate the data and also you also highlighted very well the key threats or the anthropogenic pressure which is playing a very good role or these are the various threats to the biodiversity conservation or the management of national park really we are very uh, thankful and also we are really lucky enough to have you today's presentation uh, which will be very very appreciable hamera and with this i thank the our uh, organizer and uh, dr mishra and also my co chair person mahesh and others for having uh, given an opportunity thank you very much once again hamela thank you all बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद हमेरा मैडम पाकिस्तान की डब्ल्यू डब्ल्यू एफ की टीम हमारे साथ आ, जुड़ी और हमेरा मैडम ने उसमें काफी मदद की चार लेक्चर पाकिस्तान डब्ल्यू डब्ल्यू एफ की ओर से हुए हैं अभी एक होना है तो मैं बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद देता हूं और आपके जो डायरेक्टर जनरल साहब हैं डॉक्टर हम्माद नकी साहब उनने भी हमारी काफ़ी मदद की हालांकि वो बिजी होने के वजह से सेशन शेयर नहीं कर पाए लेकिन उन्हें बराबर हमें सहयोग किया है और पूरी पाकिस्तान डब्ल्यू डब्ल्यू एफ को हमारी ओर से बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद मैडम थैंक यू सो मच सर फॉर इन्वाइटिंग अस ऑल इट्स इट्स अ मैटर ऑफ इक्वल ऑनर फॉर अस 
हम सब बहुत खुश थे और जब आपने हमें रीच आउट किया तो लाइक यू सेड के हमाद साहब ही एक्चुअली सेड के ऑल द सीनियर टीम शुड प्रेजेंट सो वो आप नेक्स्ट टाइम भी इनवाइट करेंगे तो हम आएंगे आपसे सीखने का मौका भी मिलता है आपका सेशन भी फॉलो करें एंड थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर स्टार्टिंग दिस इनिशिएटिव इट्स इट्स अ ग्रेट अपॉर्चुनिटी फॉर एवरीवन थैंक यू आओ नेक्स्ट सेशन आवर चेयर पर्सन डॉक्टर प्रभास साहू एसोसिएट प्रोफेसर एंशियंट हिस्ट्री कल्चर एंड आर्कियोलॉजी डिपार्टमेंट आर टी एम नागपुर यूनिवर्सिटी नागपुर एंड इमिनेंट स्पीकर प्रोफेसर तुलानी रंगू कोवेला आर्कियोलॉजी डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ आर्कियोलॉजी यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ पिराडेनिया श्रीलंका वेलकम वेलकम मैडम वेलकम प्रोफेसर साहू सर नमस्कार सेशन This is the 82nd lecture to be delivered by Professor Chulani Rambukvela. The topic of the eminent speaker is development of cultural heritage and ancient settlements in the Kandy area of the Central Highlands, Sri Lanka. On behalf of the organizers, I welcome Professor Rambukvela, and it's my privilege to introduce her. Professor Chulani Rambukvela is a professor of archaeology, chair professor at the Department of Archaeology in the University of Peradeniya, Sri Lanka. She has 33 years of teaching and research experience. She is a merit professor seat and also was the head of the Department of Archaeology until September 2022. She obtained her PhD in archaeology and museology from the University of Leicester, United Kingdom. She is also a fellow of the Sri Lankan Council of Archaeologists. She has been serving in a consultative capacity in various organizations and institutes. She worked as the archaeology director for the Badula project, district project of the Central Cultural Fund of Sri Lanka. She has also been appointed as one of the seven directors of the board of members of the Interstatutory Board for the Protection of Kandyan Heritage under the Ministry of Science, Technology, Research, Skills Development, and Vocational Training, and Kandyan Heritage Sri Lanka. She is also a recipient of many national and international awards, and she has authored a number of research publications and books. With this brief introduction, now I invite Professor Chulon Rambubala to deliver her talk, and her topic is development of cultural heritage and ancient settlements. in the kandy area of the central highlands sri lanka professor rambukala please right uh, good afternoon everybody uh, thank you very much for your kind words dr pap uh, prabash uh, sangu uh, first of all i would like to thank professor mishra uh, for inviting me to present this paper in this uh, eminent uh, 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 scholarly uh, convention uh, now i am going to uh, share my presentation
professor chilani yeah yes uh, it is difficult me to share that it not allow uh, allows me to connect just a minute please okay madam this is auto joining not necessary permission from our side just a minute uh, right you must grant permission in order to screen manage can't share your screen it it comes that uh, i'm sorry that uh, it is me, uh, difficult me to uh, uh, connect because uh, it mentions that it has been blocked that's the problem uh, professor mr aap agar help kar sakte hain to yeah the problem with please, that uh, please, madam please send your presentation in my email hello hello professor chulani madam uh, please yeah. send your presentation in my email ah uh, okay
Madam, please send your presentation in my email. Actually, she has left the meeting. Send uh, uh, in my email, uh, Mr. Sir. Yeah. Actually, Madam, ne log out hi kar liye. Uh, phone me baat ho rahi hai. Achha, achha. हाँ सर मिल गया है हमको 
आ, आ गया हमारे मेल में हम जल्दी ही शेयर कर रहे हैं अपनी तरफ से Right, I'm extremely sorry for the burden. Yes, I can see it. <coughs> Sir, can I take uh, uh, get it yeah, uh, yeah. full screen? It is difficult for me to talk because. Uh, no, no, madam, please. Sorry. Uh, please. Uh, स्क्रीन नहीं हो पा रहा है ना तो सर काइंडली इफ यू कैन आई ट्राई माई बेस्ट टू रीएक्टिवेट इट अंटिल दैट कैन यू आस्क फॉर द नेक्स्ट स्पीकर otherwise it it has lot of uh, slides nearly uh, 60 therefore i go for quickly and i have to explain them uh, uh, we have if, uh, um, if they time, have we have, we have time madam please ha uh, uh, present your lecture no that uh, if i can uh, process uh, make uh, Hand, handle this uh, slide presentation it is easy for me then then i'll try my best to activate again until that uh, if you can yeah, is there any possible to uh, go for next next session next session i'm very sorry kaise hoga ye koi idhar se hai to wo kaise handle kar payengi actually uh, all the participants they can see the slides so uh -huh. ma'am you can start your presentation bol uh -huh. next bol sakti hai to iske baad first ko kare fir next bol dengi to wo aa jayega unko wo handle karna chahti hai to kaise wo to unki taraf se hoga hmm अच्छा नीचे जो स्क्रॉल है ना वहां पे कॉप सेप के जो हाँ फिफ्टी परसेंट लिखा है वहां पे क्लिक करके देखिए तो फुल स्क्रीन होगा क्या कहां पे नीचे जहां वो हाँ, हाँ, ये ये आया हाँ <coughs> तो मैम कैन यू कैन यू सी द स्लाइड्स नाउ इट्स इन फुल स्क्रीन प्रोफेसर चुलानी अभी वो <coughs> मैडम प्रोफेसर चुलानी प्लीज अनम्यूट योर Unmute yourself. Yes. Okay. Okay. Ah. Uh, show me so next. Show me next. Okay. Show Show me next one. Ah. Yes. Ah. Right. Okay. The other one. Next one. Yes. Next one. Next one. Next one. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the thing is that ah uh, uh, now it is okay. Okay. yeah the next one right okay i can manage it uh, please uh, <laughs> then i'll i'll mention it next 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 all right okay i'm sorry the uh, please uh, go for first one the picture hmm so picture first one first one 
पहले में चले या टाइम व्हाट अबाउट द माय टाइम सर यू हैव टाइम मैडम ओके 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 सर थैंक यू सो मच वेरी सॉरी एक्सट्रीमली सॉरी फॉर द डिस्टरबेंस नाउ यू कैन सी बिफोर कम टू द टॉपिक यू कैन सी हियर द मोस्ट रिस्पेक्टेड टेम्पल इन श्रीलंका द सेक्रेट टेम्पल ऑफ द टू थ्रेलिंग इन कैंडी द आइडेंटिटी आइडेंटिटी ऑफ द कैंडी the we call that dalada maligawa maligawa meaning palace the, uh, the palace of the tele uh, tooth relic uh, uh, next one i i mostly welcome and invite you to uh, visit sri lanka and to worship the uh, tooth uh, temple of the tooth relic uh, here my topic is development of cultural heritage and ancient self settlements in the kandy area of the central highlands sri lanka actually i have done a lot of research related to the uh, central highlands this research is part of my uh, uh, own research uh, and, uh, before i go for this uh, topic i would like to uh, uh, draw your attention about the heritage of sri lanka because it is necessary to understand about the uh, archaeological and uh, uh, socio cultural economic and technological background of sri lankan uh, heritage uh, next one uh, uh, sri this is the island of uh, uh, main uh, sri lanka uh before we go to the historical uh, uh elaboration uh, it is uh, necessary to have an idea about the geophysical divisions uh, of the island uh, we have uh, actually basically according to the relief features uh, uh, the island has been divided into three parts first one is coastal and low lands up to about 1000 feet above the mean sea level this is the coastal uh, area and low lands uh, second one is uplands it is between 1000 to 3000 in that area can you see my arrow can you see my arrow no i don't be because somebody else is uh, operating the system ah uh, that is the thing yeah so it's a hmm? yeah but uh, uh, it is clear from the picture right uh, third one is highlands it is the in the middle part mountain area uh, the, the the now you can understand the coastal and lowlands the next part is uh, interior one is the upland the highland is the top uh, middle very mis middle um, uh, limited area in the middle part of the country central that the mountain area about uh, 300 feet above in the mean sea level uh, in sri lanka we don't have uh, seasonal uh, uh, variations uh, sri lanka is traditionally divided into dry and wet zone next next slide uh, when we consider about the archaeological uh, heritage of sri lanka sri lanka has a long history and both tangible and uh, intangible heritage of sri lanka shows uh, uh, unbroken sequence of historical development from prehistory to modern time uh, indian influence has been one of the most prominent factors involved to shape sri lankan heritage due to close proximity next slide uh, here you can see the sri lankan historical timeline according to uh, actually it has been it has described according to the common sequence i am going uh, i am not going to describe one by one by one because uh, it will take more time uh, prehistoric period uh, uh, circa um, uh, 125000 bp to 
1800 BC. Uh, then prehistoric transition to protohistory uh, that means from uh, Mesolithic to Iron Age. Chronology of this period has not been identified yet. Uh, then after, after that protohistoric early Iron Age, uh, circa about uh, 900 BC to 600 BC. Early historic period, circa 600 BC to the, the, uh, 300 AD. Middle historic period, circa 300 AD to uh, 1200 AD. A transitional period, circa 1200 AD to uh, 104, uh, 1, 1400 AD. Late historic period, circa 100, 1400 AD to uh, 100, uh, 1, 9, uh, 1948 AD. Uh, Modern scenario after 1948 onwards. Next slide. Here you can see the ex um, uh, most important excavation at the Anuradhapura Citadel. Uh, uh, it has done in 1969 uh, in a city, that uh, citadel in Anuradhapura. According to uh, the, this data is very prominent and uh, very authentic. Therefore, we are using this uh, data uh, uh, to read uh, Sri Lankan history. Uh, according to the layers, the static graphy, uh, first one is bedrock. The second, um, I can't uh, show this because uh, bed, the down bedrock, bedrock, first one is the prehistoric layer. Second one is the uh, transitional period. 3A and 3B we called as a protohistoric period, 4A and 4B uh, early historic period. Then after after that, 5th, 6th, uh, 7 and 8, 9, uh, we considered as a late his, his, historic period. Next slide, please. Uh, prehistory, uh, prehistoric uh, evidence of Sri Lanka revealed uh, from the Ratnapura beds, Iranabadu, and reddish brown earth formation, the KON open air sites in the country. Right, next slide, please. The pre prehistoric period has three uh, phases normally uh, as a Paleolithic, Mesolithic, Neolithic. Uh, but in Sri Lanka, we have Paleolithic and Mesolithic, but uh, it is difficult uh, us to uh, recognize. Neolithic period in Sri Lanka. Next slide, please. Uh, when we consider about the Paleolithic period, there is a secure evidence, stone tools of prehistoric settlement in Sri Lanka. Uh, 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 it goes back uh, 100, one, 125,000 years ago. Sometimes it probably uh, be uh, three, uh, 300,000 BP and possibly be. 5,000 BP or earlier. Next, please. Uh, this evidence found from excavation conducted in coastal deposit near Bundala and Patiraja, southern Sri Lanka. Uh, stone tools of quartz and chert revealed. Apart from such uh, tools, no other residues of their culture have been su survived uh, due to top topical uh, weathering. Even though we do not have, uh, actually, uh, even though we do not uh, know what these people look like, uh, it can be guessed that there were early Homo sapiens sapiens, similar to anatomically modern South, in, uh, South Asians. Next one, please. Uh, here you can see a stone tools of middle Paleolithic period. Next. Uh, uh, now uh, we can uh, uh, thoroughly confirm the Mesolithic period in Sri Lanka. Uh, series of excavations in low wet zone derived my uh, much more complete Mesolithic evidence from about uh, 40,000 BP onwards. Uh, those evidence are revealed 
from uh, several caves. Fahi and Lena, Batadomba Lena, Lena means cave. Uh, Fahi and cave, Batalon, Batadomba Lena cave, Beli Lena cave, Alu Lena cave. Uh, you can see the uh, hierarchy, the, uh, the, the, the breakdown of the uh, uh, chronology. And then after that, open near site at Bellum Pantras uh, near Ambilipitia, southern uh, um, part of Sri Lanka, at about 6,000, uh, 6,500 BP, according to the T, um, TL, thermo, thermoluminescence. The other data uh, have taken uh, uh, according to the carbon 40. And these da data uh, uh, supplemented by uh, those from the uh, actually open air site at Billam Bil Bil uh, Next one, please. Here you can see stone tools related to the Mesolithic and stone tools related to the Middle Paleolithic. Right. Next. The anot anatomically modern prehistoric humans from those Mesolithic sites in Sri Lanka are referred to as Balangudaman in popular parlance because the first discovery of remnants of Balanguda area. Balanguda area is situated uh, uh, near the Kandy region, uh, about uh, uh, 50 uh, kilometers away from Kandy town. Right. Next. Uh, features of Balanguda man uh, can be elaborated as a robust uh, Robust bones, thick skull bones, prominent brow ridges, depressed nose, short, ne uh, short neck, heavy jaws with uh, large teeth. These traits have survived in varying degrees among the Vedda. Vedda means in our tribal uh, ancestors uh, and certain singleist groups, thus pointing to Balanguda man as a Common ancestor. Next, please. Uh, prehistoric, when we consider about the uh, prehistoric genetic continuum, the human remains have been subjected to delete, uh, delete uh, detailed physical and anthropological study, and it has been affirmed that the genetic continuum from the from at least early as from 16,000 BP at Batadumbalena, Batadumbalena, Batadumba Kele, uh, Cave, 30,000 30, BP at Belilena, 6,500 BP at Billambandi Palace, the recent Vedda, the Aboriginal population in Sri Lanka. Next one, please. The Balanguda culture is distinguished by the occurrence of geometric uh, microliths comparing small uh, uh, less than four uh, actually small stone tools quartz and chert such geometric microliths have traditionally been considered as the whole uh, hallmark of the uh, uh, Mesolithic period, first defined in Europe around 12,000 BP. Such tools were found as early as 28,000 BP at Batnabalena, 28,000 BP at two coastal sites in Bundala and Patiraja, southern Sri Lanka, 27,000 BP at Belilena, that uh, the west, western part of Sri Lanka. Uh, Sri Lanka has yielded evidence of this sophisticated technological phase 16,000 16, years earlier than uh, Europe. Next one, please. Here you can see uh, stone tools and bone tools of Mesolithic. Next. Next, please. Uh, other prehistoric uh, Mesolithic remnants are artifacts of bone and antler, beads of shell, marine shells, uh, etc. Next, please. Uh, 
uh, we can identify some uh, art ritual uh, arts and rituals sometimes we uh, those are related to prehistoric Sri Lanka has yet to produce in dispute evidence of cave arts. Ravanala cave and Fahian cave. Uh, red, uh, uh, red Brook had been uh, the re, that uh, evidence of Ravana cave and Fahian cave uh, revealed that uh, Red Brook had been cer uh, ceremonially smeared on the bones. Next. Uh, yeah, when, when we consider about the Neolithic period in Sri Lanka, we don't have, uh, we are thinking uh, at, the, at the moment we are deciding, uh, we don't have Neolithic period. But uh, uh, excavation at the uh, uh, uh provided evidence about the uh, domestication and cultivation uh, evidence. Therefore, we are thinking about. Uh, 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 Neolithic period in Sri Lanka, uh, but uh, it, 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 uh, it, it doesn't uh, uh, confirm yet. Next one, please. Next one, please. Uh, when we consider about the Calcolithic period in Sri Lanka, uh, actually, uh, it is difficult us to uh, discuss about the Calcolithic period in Sri Lanka, but uh, the discovery of a few pieces of Copper working slags uh, from Mesolithic context at Man Tota, Mana, uh, identified uh, this identification uh, of a Calcolithic horizon in Sri Lanka is contemporaneous with the uh, securely dated Calcolithic of Peninsula India. Uh, maybe uh, sometimes by uh, 2000 BC. Next, please. Uh, Mesolithic uh, Iron Age transition, uh, chronology of this uh, period has not been identified yet in Sri Lanka. Next, please. Uh, when we talk about protohistoric period in Sri Lanka, at the uh, commencement of first millennium BC, there are indications of rapid uh, transition from Madam, you are not audible. Professor Chulani, Madam. Left the meeting. Fir se join karin. Network
Can you hear me, please? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Ah, it's okay. Now it is okay. Right. Your screen? Yeah, I can handle it. Okay, okay. Okay, sir, thank you. I off your phone. I can't remember that uh, the slide. It it don't go. Slide number twenty four, madam. Twenty-four. Twenty-four. You stop the show. Right. Okay. Right. Professor Tulani, will please share your screen. Yeah, it's okay. Can you can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, but you. Your screen is not shared. Can you see my screen now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, yes, okay. thank, you. Thank, you. thank you, thank you. Sorry for disturbing you. Uh, I discussed about the proto history of period in Sri Lanka. Uh, uh, no, the, here, uh, yes, proto history period of, in Sri Lanka. Uh, actually, uh, uh, we don't know about the transition from prehistoric period to uh, proto historic period. Uh, still, we are uh, trying to find out the uh, evidence about that. Then, but uh, uh, we can recognize uh, very well proto historic. Uh, period in Sri Lanka at the commencement of the first uh, millennium BC. Uh, from a, uh, it is transition from, from Mesolithic period to Iron Age. Uh, we consider as this. Uh, uh, earlier I mentioned that we, we don't have Neolithic period or Calcolithic or Bronze Age. No, uh, we are jumping to Mesolithic to uh, stone uh, stone age to uh, iron age uh, iron age culture uh, actually the proto history period uh, uh, with compare the proto historic period and the, uh, the information related to south india uh, it is very similar uh, megalithic uh, mortuary complex of Sri Lanka uh, with the uh, mortuary complex of South India. Here you can see uh, a cis burial site. Uh, it falls as Ibang Khatua. Uh, it is uh, 50 kilometers from uh, Kandy Town. Uh, it is situated in the central highlands near the sea area. Uh, uh, the ma district, Matali district. Uh, I, I'm not uh, describing much because uh, we. I have to go for my uh, media also. Uh, here you uh, you can see the uh, dolmen. Uh, we call that as dolmen. Uh, only one um, monument uh, we found in Sri Lanka. 
this is situated in the Kerala district, about 30 kilometers from Candy Town. Uh, and uh, here you can see other mortuary uh, systems, wound and cyst barriers. It is displayed in museum. And this one also. And this is what uh, wound burial, megalithic. It is uh, displayed in, uh, there are so many uh, sites we revealed related to the proto historic period. Uh, the transition to historic period uh, is very important. The early Iron Age of Sri Lanka at circa 1000 to 600 BC is referred to as the proto historic since there is no evidence of the writing in this period. But uh, recently we recognized that the writing of uh, uh, that write, writing stage is going for uh, 600 BC uh, at, at a circa 600. Uh, 600 and 500 BC, the first appearance of writing in Brahmi, almost identical to the Ashokan script, some 200 years later. We have enough uh, uh, Brahmi inscription uh, uh, with the Ashokan script uh, 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 from the 3rd century BC. Among the names of was Anurad, which coincidentally or otherwise, it is stated in the ancient chronicles, uh, Sri Lankan chronicles, to have been named of the minister of Prince Vijaya, uh, uh, the leader of Sinhalis at circa 500 BC. Anuradhapura was the capital during this period, which is thus called the Anuradhapura period. Uh, chronicle uh, credit the Pandukabe, King Pandukabe, it built in the city circa 437 BC and explain the contributions made by the king to various cultural groups in the society. Uh, uh, after that, in Sri Lanka, we have uh, um, a lot of uh, historical periods. I am not going to describe those things because this, uh, this uh, study is confined to the early uh, periods. Uh, now I am moving to my uh, research area, uh, settlements in Kandy and suburbs in the central highlands of Sri Lanka. Uh, obje actually, object uh, of this study is uh, to survey emergence and development of early human settlements uh, and understanding of the distribution pattern of archaeological sites and their socio-cultural aspects in the Kandy and adjacent regions. This area represents the low mountain region of the island. Uh, the low mountain region uh, occupies a central position in the hill country and it has an approximate mean sea level, 1000 uh, feet to 300 feet. The primary physical feature, features are Plateau of Kandy and the river Mahaveli, which is the longest river in Sri Lanka. Uh, you can see this uh, river. Uh, I didn't have opportunity to show you that map at the beginning uh, regarding the uh, physical features of Kandy and its suburbs and the island. Uh, a series of uh, tributaries and smaller watercourses originate from the surrounding hills and they follow, uh, flow to the main river. This has resulted in a fairly complex, uh, complex uh, drainage system uh, within the Kandy Plateau. And uh, given this river system, a rich alluvium. Uh, actually, the Plateau of Kandy. Uh, by virtue of its physical location, form a link zone in history. In physical terms, the upper reaches of uh, the other rivers, such as uh, Mahawai, the Duruwai, Kalani River, are situated in close proximate to the upper and middle Mahavali. 
actually the mid, the, the middle Mahavali is the area I am going to talk. The Candian suburbs. Hello, can you hear me? Hello. Hello. Carry on. Please carry on. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. Therefore, the middle valley of Mahavali uh, not only links several physical areas, but uh, it also forms a link zone for several environmental regions. Therefore, it is useful to understand the locational and distribution pattern of uh, sites in the Kandyan suburbs. Uh, you have to keep in mind about the chronology and the surround of the heritage of Sri Lanka, the archaeological heritage of Sri Lanka while, uh, while uh, serving and describing the, uh, this area. Uh, uh, accordingly, we can uh, understand the environment and the ecological context of the different cultural phases of the area. Historical sources and other archaeological investigations uh, evidence that the history of the Kandy and its suburbs uh, goes back to the early phase of uh, first uh, millennium. <laughs> the area influenced by various foreign invaders. Uh, later on, such as uh, Portuguese, Dutch, and British in late phases in the Candian period. Uh, Candian period is the last dynasty of the of this area. It is the very uh, the highly reputed uh, dynasty. Uh, uh, when we consider about the uh, char characteristics of this uh, area, the archaeological uh, historical evidence shows that the uh, middle basin of Mahameli has been thickly inhabited by humans since early historic period up to the 17th century and uh, onwards. <coughs> However, the middle part of the river basin has been neglected archaeologically during the last hundred years of research uh, in the island due to some practical reasons. I'm going to describe those things. Uh, there are many reasons. The area of uh, study is also significant in terms of it, uh, physiography. Uh, the previous studies on the ancient human settlements in Sri Lanka are confined to the coastal plain or dry zone in the country. That's why I paid more attention about the central highlands or the hill country in the country. Uh, the, the knowledge about the development of human settlements and cultural heritage in the modern region is scarce. <coughs> Uh, the scarcity is crucially influential to understand the subsequent development. Uh, actually, uh, I have done a lot of research in this uh, area. Uh, there are two river basins. This is the upper upper Mahavali area, upper and middle Mahavali area. Candy is here. Uh, uh, the, the other river basin is Mahavaya. Uh, I studied uh, uh, this uh, uh, research uh, areas in order to get, get an idea about the hill country uh, scenario. The, the, see the three dimensional module. Model uh, for this area I have drawn. Uh, here you can see the flat, flat train and um, and then after the drug area. This biodiversity which is identical to the region. It is very specific. Uh, you can understand the biodiversity within the within the ten mile uh, ten uh, miles uh, kilometers in this. Uh, country, uh, not like uh, such a big uh, country uh, uh, in like India. 
according to the geophysical and environmental interpretations in the area has uh, rock and minerals in the highland series various type of uh, soil can be identified uh, soil such as red yellow porcelain alluvial reddish brown latter soil image yellow porcelain alluvial reddish brown latter soil immature brown soil brown loam soil etc uh, that this kind of soil is very suitable for uh, small uh, community of agriculture and uh, uh, the, I am talking about the river valley basins uh, um, uh, set up here. Uh, almost all archaeological sites are situated uh, uh, in that area. Uh, the diversity of flora and fauna are endemic for the region. And the region has variations of temperature and rainfall. Even though it is very small uh, re uh, region. Now I am moving to the historical, uh, to describe uh, historical and uh, archaeological background. Uh, the Candian adjacent region has altitude approximately of 1000 feet to uh, 3000 feet above the mean sea level. This, this is very important because then after that, after uh, 300 feet, it's a uh, uh, steep, uh, uh, steep uh, 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 mountain, mountain uh, area. The primary physical feature in the area is the river Mahavali and its tributaries. Uh, the textual information cursory observation suggests that uh, the middle Mahavali basin has a great uh, potential of cultural continuity from the prehistoric period up to the late historic period. Uh, this is an accumulation of archaeological sites belonging to the different cultural phases, uh, such as prehistoric, uh, protohistoric, early historic, late historic, and historic. But uh, as I mentioned in Sri um, earlier, uh, it is very specific. Uh, the protohistoric period is uh, uh, Actually, even though uh, it is in uh, the vicinity, the evidence it is uh, related to the proto-historic period uh, uh, in the vicinity, the candy and suburbs, it is very difficult to find out the uh, evidence. Uh, uh, when we consider about the prehistoric uh, uh, period, uh, uh, the historical trends of uh, region, it is very significant that information pertaining to the prehistoric man, especially Mesolithic man, could be re revealed uh, in that, this area also. Stone tools associated with Mesolithic man are found from places such as Prim uh, Primrose Hill Candy. It is very close to Candy Town, Peradenia and Gampala region. Uh, here you can see the map uh, uh, related to uh, prehistoric uh, uh, site. Uh, here the candy and one one uh, is the uh, uh, candy. This one, sorry. Right, sorry. Uh, here you can see the pre uh, uh, secured evidence regarding the prehistoric uh, distribution. Uh, non subjection to proper excavation of caves in the region and uh, uh, probable uh, disappearance to proper excavation uh, or uh, data due to the cl uh, clearing of caves for the needs of the Kus towards the early historic period may have been responsible uh, for the loss of uh, definite factors regarding the prehistoric man in the region around Kendi. However, the discovery of definite factors from such uh, sites as Kagal Aludena near, uh, near the Kendi uh, uh, 
30 miles from uh, Candy Town, Daroka uh, Kand. It is a little bit far from uh, Candy, situated in the western slope of the lower mountain region, are evidence for the existence of above trends. Uh, it is uh, also important that the definite factors uh, regarding to the proto-historic, as I mentioned earlier, uh, proto-historic period have not been revealed from the study area. Uh, that's mean candy and suburbs. Therefore, it has to be inquired whether this is due to the studies being limited or due to non-arrival of this cultural or community division into the region. The proto-historic period, which we identified as the early stage of our earlier in age, and uh, has extraordinary cultural features, you know all, uh, such as paddy, um, paddy cultivation, iron technology, black and red wear, uh, sports, <clears throat> I, uh, and uh, institutional formation. And uh, you know that uh, it is included burial, uh, megalithic burials also. Uh, recently, it has been revealed that the black and red wear and suspected megalithic graffiti marks of the proto history period in this area. Even though we don't have a burial or burial uh, uh, complex or uh, uh, megalithic uh, habitation, uh, we found uh, uh, megalithic graffiti and uh, we suspended, but uh, suspected. And uh, black and red were in the area. <coughs> Here, uh, actually, this dolmen site uh, uh, is situated adjacent re region. And uh, I, um, when I was uh, doing my uh, research in this area, I found this uh, caps uh, stone uh, uh, 200 meters away from uh, down um, uh, away from that uh, dolmen. I considered this as cap cap stone as this. Uh, Capstone, uh, but uh, until today, uh, I revealed that uh, uh, 30 years ago, I think, uh, uh, but uh, no one uh, have paid any uh, attention for that until today. Uh, when I was uh, visiting that uh, site, uh, nearby uh, above site, there's a cyst uh, burial, it was reported, but uh, uh, when I was visiting that site, I saw that some cap capstone uh, in the burial uh, site. And uh, the, this one also nearby. Uh, then uh, it is a, a significant feature in the area is uncovering a lot of archaeological factors belonging to the early historic period. It is very prominent. This, uh, the discovery of many cave shelters uh, early Brahmi inscription. Professor Sulani. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Yeah, hello. Hello, Professor Chulani. Yes. Uh, 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 on 130 next session, so please uh, uh, give your talk speedily. Right, okay. Okay. Then uh, then uh, uh, we reveal, uh, reveal that prehistoric period also. Then, uh, according to my research findings, I reveal a lot of uh, uh, evidence related to the archaeological uh, evidence. Uh, Triple H cave with the early Brahmi, Triple H caves with the late Brahmi, Triple H caves with uh, inscriptions, Brahmi letters on bricks, uh, black and red glass, super side, then uh, wayside rest houses. And uh, according to my research, I, uh, uh, I uh, 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 found a, a pattern of the distribution uh, uh, 
first one is quantitative increase of early brachny excretion quantitative decrease of late brachny excretion quantitative increase of uh, late historic period uh, quantitative decrease of uh, inscription of uh, historic period uh, that is the pattern that pattern uh, the in addition to that unique distribution pattern of archaeological site could be recognized within the area on either side of the main river associated with the tributaries isolated uh, uh, occurrence uh, actually uh, it seems this distribution pattern is based on route of communication trade and commerce road based system uh, resource requirement linking soil etc uh, here research findings i don't uh, I, I don't have time to discuss those things so that uh, uh, there are so many uh, uh, Datika, Datika means uh, ivory worker, chuda, that's uh, gem cutter, kumbakara, then potter, manikara, the lapidary, gem cutter, and uh, manija, naga, shiva, upasaka, pojin, raja, gamani, kumara, that kind of uh, social communities we can identify. It. And uh, here, uh, there are so many minerals and spices and flora and fauna in that thing. You can see the distribution pattern of uh, archaeological site is Kandy and suburbs. This one is Bambaragala, that prehistoric, uh, the, uh, it, it, it uh, revealed prehistoric uh, uh, stone tools also. And uh, early Brahmi inscription, this is Gonavata, early Brahmi. This is Bam, uh, Bhagavalena. This is here is the Kandy uh, area. Uh, uh, near, uh, that is uh, 10 miles from Kandy, Bhagavalena. Mentions that sailor to sailing to Parukacha. The, the, uh, uh, Dr. Parmedan mentioned that the Parukacha means the, uh, the port of uh, uh, the Gujarat. Uh, that, that kind of uh, many information um, provided uh, from this uh, inscription. The, this one is very important that uh, many uh, craft uh, clans and uh, craft uh, uh, people mentioned in that uh, inscription. Uh, here you can see the distribution pattern of archaeological site in the area. Uh, it revealed newly discovered Brahmi scroll, Brahmi inscription with replaced gear, uh, so on. Here you can see the. I, I'll show you this uh, as a sample. Uh, two sites, two three sites, Bambaragala. It is uh, this is the Bambaragala site and the inscription. Uh, it, uh, it's inscription situated here. And uh, this is the, the mountain, small um, ridge, Pamaragala. Uh, the, the, the ridge has many caves and uh, the temp temple. That uh, ridge and the Pamaragala te temple inundated or the, uh, surrounded by the waters. Waters mean the reservoir, newly built reservoir. Newly built mean that 30 years ago, uh, Mahavali. And you can see the Bambaragala site here and the uh, dried up the reservoir. And here, Bonavata site the nearby Bambaragala, that uh, reservoir. This is the replace gave fallen down the uh, reservoir. It has uh, many, uh, the, the Bonavata site uh, approached by the uh, villagers, village people. And this is the site and this is the another side the nearby side this is the another side uh, this is another side this is me uh, 30 years ago and this is the late historic site all in the color now you can see the distribution pattern of archaeological site i really uh, really uh, reveal this uh, a lot of archaeological sites in the area uh, to sum up i am not going to discuss those things uh, to sum up uh, opposing to the common notion of hill country as a difficult to reach area with devoid of human activities, the research revealed that the area is an important region with a lot of human activities with focal administrative units throughout the history that lead to rich archaeological landscape. I personally believe that the Central Highlands is inhabited by modern humans even before such settlements in other parts of the country. Uh, however, much more extensive research should be done to prove this assumption. The extensive research in the hills, Central Highlands will be my next focus. Thank you. 
Thank you, Professor Chulani. Now the paper is open for discussion. If anybody has any query. Hello. Hello, yeah. If anybody has any query. I don't think so. Hello, Professor Mishra. Hello. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, sound, sir. Uh, please can uh, conclude the session if any. Uh, Actually, there is no query because nobody is asking anything. So let me conclude the session. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Professor Chulani. So, uh, Professor Chulani started uh, presenting her paper, uh, highlighting the main chronocultural sequence of the Sri Lanka. Then uh, she talked about the beginning of culture in Sri Lanka around, say, around uh, one point, uh, sorry, one. 125,000 years uh, before present with the Paleolithic period. But so far as the cultural history of Sri Lanka is concerned, so there is no clarity about the proto-history culture as asserted by Professor Chulani. Then uh, there is conclusive evidence about the Paleolithic tools, Middle Paleolithic tools, as well as Mesolithic. Again, there is uh, the evidence of the megalithic culture, which is akin to the peninsula of India, that is found in the central region. But so far as our uh, study area is concerned, that is the Kendi region, uh, she has discovered about around uh, 56 sites. And those are those belong to the early Brahmi, late Brahmi, and uh, Brahmi periods. So those are basically historical periods. Apart from that, some uh, Mesolithic sites like your Primrose and Peridonia. She has come across the Mesolithic settlement in these areas. So definitely the area which uh, she was talking about, it is the, the having the potentiality right from the Mesolithic period till the present day. And similar is the case with everywhere, because the uh, there is threat to the heritage sites, people are occupying so many cities, and uh, the population is increasing. So there is threat to archaeological sites, and uh, many of the people, the public awareness towards cultural heritage is not so much there. And I think this is the case with uh, Sri Lanka also, the region of your study. So, so far as apart from the technical glitches, what we have encountered just right now. So your talk basically talked about the cultural history of Sri Lanka and the participants, I hope, must have enjoyed listening to your presentation. Thank you so much, ma'am. Okay, thank you so much for your advice. Now, Professor Mishra, it's up. Uh, I'm handing over the mic to you. Okay, thank you, thank you, uh, uh, Professor Prabhas Rao sir, for chair the session, and uh, Professor Chulani from Pordenia University, Sri Lanka, uh, given a nice talk in this webinar series. Uh, thank you both of you, sir, uh, and madam. Uh, for your uh, uh, kind co uh, cooperation. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. So Thank you very much. Now, next session, our uh, speak, uh, eminent speaker, Dr. Tahir Rasheed, Regional Head South, uh, South Director Wildlife, WWF Pakistan, and our here person, Dr. Manoj Borkar, Professor of uh, Geology Department uh, from Goa, Formal College of Farm and Goa. Welcome, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. 
डॉक्टर ताहिर रशीद साहब आदाब आप हो डॉक्टर रशीद साहब ज्वाइन कैन आई हैव अ रिस्पांस फ्रॉम द लीड स्पीकर प्लीज एमिनेंट स्पीकर डॉक्टर ताहिर रशीद सर आप ज्वाइन हो गए हो प्लीज अनम्यूट योर सेल्फ डॉक्टर ताहिर रशीद सर डॉक्टर रशीद साहब कैन यू हियर मी ये सर कैंपेन मोड क्या होता है कैंपेन मोड में है वो आ ठीक है सर मैं इंट्रोड्यूस करा दूं ताहिर साहब की इंट्रोडक्शन तो, सर आ जाए वो है टाइम एक्चुअली 1:30 का उन्होंने टाइम दिया था जी 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 कंटिन्यू हो रहा है जी सर वी विल वेट आई थिंक फॉर हिम टू जॉइन प्रोफेसर चुलानी प्लीज क्लोज योर स्लाइड योर प्रेजेंटेशन प्लीज क्लोज योर प्रेजेंटेशन ओके सर जस्ट मैं सर कांटेक्ट कर रहा हूं हाँ जी हाँ जी अभी वैसे भी सर और एक दस मिनट बचे हैं तो शायद इन्हें पता नहीं होगा कि हाँ, हाँ, तो, वो दिखे तो मैंने फिर कोई प्रॉब्लम नहीं सर वी विल वेट डॉक्टर ताहिर प्लीज प्लीज ज्वाइन द सेशन यस सर यस सर प्लीज ज्वाइन हाँ यस नो सर नाउ यू ज्वाइन सर चेयर हाँ 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 आप हैं हेलो आप वो गूगल मीट से है ना गूगल मीट से ज्वाइन किए होंगे हाँ यस आप दिख रहे हैं हमको यस 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 सर आई थिंक डॉक्टर ताहिर रशीद इज ऑलरेडी लॉक्ड इन रशीद साहब एक बार रिस्पॉन्स दीजिए Can you hear me, Dr. Tahir Rashid? Auto joining है sir. Auto joining है कोई permission necessary नहीं है. Direct join करें आप. यदि आ रहा है कुछ तो उसको ignore करें और आगे बढ़ें और join करें. हमारी तरफ से कोई permission की जरूरत नहीं है. आप तो दिख रहे हैं हमको. Photo आपकी दिख रही है हमको. जी. जी जी. आप सीधे गूगल मीट पे क्लिक कर दें बस वो आ जाएंगे इट से डॉक्टर रशीद इज ज्वाइंट अनम्यूट योर सेल्फ आदाब आदाब रशीद साहब आदाब प्रोफेसर मनोज बोरकर साहब कॉर्मेल कॉलेज फॉर वोमेन गोवा इंडिया यस सर डॉक्टर मनोज बाबकर साहब प्लीज शेयर द सेशन एंड जी सर जी सर गुड आफ्टरनून टू एवरीबॉडी इंक्लूडिंग आवर लीड स्पीकर एमिनेंट स्पीकर डॉक्टर ताहिर रशीद जी इट गिव्स मी ग्रेट प्लेजर टू कनेक्ट फ्रॉम गोवा टू पाकिस्तान दिस इज दिस इज अ वंडरफुल फीलिंग वंडरफुल फीलिंग and um, uh, it it is my privilege to introduce uh, dr tahir rashid ji uh, let me try to highlight some of these uh, 
his major achievements has been a development practitioner with multidisciplinary educational qualifications in the field of anthropology uh, rural development and forestry rashid saab possesses 32 years of professional exposure and experience in the field of rural development natural resource management and climate change adaptation uh, prior to his present assignment as uh, chief executive officer of brsp he has been engaged with worldwide fund for uh, pakistan as director wildlife and regional head sindh and baluchistan he's also been the ceo of south punjab forest company general manager lead pakistan national project manager undp chief executive officer of sustainable use specialist group of central asia head wwf pakistan at present baluchistan uh, region um, based on his qualification and practical understanding of environmental and social issues he has been actively involved in conducting a number of socio ecological studies developing policy documents uh, that is inclusive management plans development and conservation plans manuals etc and has also provided very valuable professional inputs to wwf indo china vietnam conservation based organization in afghanistan and kalpurvaksh in india in formulating environment education strategy conservation as well as development programs and national report on community conserved areas of pakistan of course he's also been serving as master trainer in the field of environment and development for governmental and ngos from his uh, region his interests include protecting biodiversity empowering grassroots organizations and sustainable management of natural resources he is concerned with linkages between environment and development and the way international negotiations affect indigenous communities so this is just a, in a nutshell Dr. Tahir Rashid Saab's uh, achievements and accolades. I am sure Dr. Rashid Saab would uh, enlighten us with his talk on Chitragol National Park biodiversity heritage values. So, uh, with this brief introduction, may I request Dr. Tahir Rashid Saab to kindly start the presentation. Over to you, Rashid ji. I'm sorry, my uh, there's a little problem with my camera. So I'm sorry, I I am not being seen, but you'll pardon me for that. Ji, Rashid ji, please. Sir, up up, unmute ki jega, please. You are not being heard. Up unmute ki jega, please. Nahi sir, abhi bhi sunai nahi de raha hai. Aap apna mic khollein, Rashid saab, yes. Dr. Rashid, we can see your yes. screen, but yes. we cannot hear you. Sir, Sunai nahi de raha hai. Aap unmute kariye ga. Aap apna mic khole, sir. Mic. Hello. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Very clear. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Professor Manoj. Uh, I think... Uh, such a wonderful opportunity and such a wonderful occasion that uh, I am uh, sharing my feelings and sharing my, uh, what you can say, experiences while sitting in Pakistan uh, to my friends. Uh, there. I think uh, we have lost connectivity, Mishraji. Uh, can you see? Can ji, you ji, hear me? Rashid Sahib, ji haan, ji haan, ji haan. Ji, uh, can you can you see my screen also? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. So thank you so much, uh, everyone. Everyone uh, there in India. <clears throat> um, I, I think it's a pleasure and honor to share my feelings with you uh, while sitting here in Pakistan. Uh, first of all, um, uh, my presentation will be revolving around the cultural heritage and how the cultural heritage is benefiting the biodiversity conservation with specific reference to Chitralgon National Park, 
and uh, their surrounding areas. And then definitely uh, in, uh, and in generally in Pakistan. So it's, it would be a very, a very interesting uh, uh, presentation and I will try to share my bit. So um, why I took this particular topic and did my research because uh, uh, by training I'm a forester and then I uh, did my doctorate in uh, anthropology. So I was eager to know how the indigenous management systems, the local values, myths, uh, contributes uh, contributes to the protection uh, of the natural resources and protected areas, community protected areas, and especially the buffer areas of the protected uh, area. I mean the national parks or the wildlife sanctuaries. Um, uh, uh, I think it's the story uh, that I am sharing with uh, with all of you that how these uh, centuries-old time-tested uh, value systems traditional management systems, traditional knowledge has contributed, is contributing uh, towards the protection and conservation of the natural resources. So um, uh, thank you so much for your time yet yeah, that you are bearing me out. Um, as far as my, the presentation's outline is concerned, so I will be giving you a very uh, basic uh, bird eye view of the bioculture diversity of Pakistan, then definitely the, uh, the national significance of the indigenous um, uh, conservation areas and then situation analysis, what are the challenges and what were the challenges and what are the prospects of the traditional management systems in the conservation and protection of the natural resources. Ladies and gentlemen, when I did my research, uh, so, uh, that, uh, so the methodology I used was one-to-one -one consultations with the stakeholders. And basically, these consultations were uh, with the opinion leaders, local intellectuals, all, uh, and the old timers of the area, hunters, storytellers, historians, officials, and policymakers, and the managers of the traditionally managed areas in Chatral. So, and then uh, in the last, I had three to four consultative workshops in Chatral and in the northern areas and Koita. Koita is one of uh, the provincial headquarters of uh, one of the largest uh, provinces of Pakistan. So, uh, as far as the significance of the biodiversity heritage areas of Pakistan is concerned, and the con uh, and especially with reference to the community conserved areas, so you know the Pakistan is the land of social, cultural, and ecological contrast. We are not as diverse as your uh, your country, India, but definitely as far as the size of the Pakistan is concerned, we have also, we, 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 we enjoy the social, cultural and ecological uh, diversity in our country too. So uh, it's a um, diverse biocultural country uh, where the traditional management systems are still alive and the people are using that. The, the indigenous communities and the local communities, and especially in the three, um, uh, in the three, uh, you know, provinces of Pakistan. One is the uh, uh, Balochistan, and definitely then um, uh, in Balochistan there are a lot of areas where these systems are still in practice. And then we have the northern areas, and uh, in northern areas, and uh, and um, in the KP uh, province. We have the area called Chatral. This is one of the districts of the KP uh, province. So here, the, the local people and the indigenous people are, uh, are what you can see, using and utilizing these, these systems. Um, Pakistan is definitely about of the diverse cultures and different languages and different uh, ethnic groups. And right from uh, the northern areas up to the deserts, uh, and, the, and the oceans uh, of Pakistan, the Arabian Sea. We have different dialects, different languages, different cultures, and, and different ethnic groups. And, uh, and, and, and uh, the last thing is, yes, we have- Can, we I, are... can I interrupt? Is your slide yes. supposed to yes, be moving? Please. Rashid sahab, your slide is not moving. Now we are on the first slide. Pe hi hai. Oh, sorry. Uh, 
हालांकि आपके जो नोट्स हैं वो हम पढ़ पाते हैं सर उसमें कोई वैसे परेशान नहीं लेकिन आप स्किप नहीं कर रहे हो स्लाइड्स जी मुझसे तो स्किप हो रही है लेकिन अनफॉर्चुनेटली सर यहां पे कोई भी स्लाइड नया नहीं देख नई स्लाइड नहीं देख पा रहे हैं ओके मैं एक दफा फिर हाँ ट्राई करता हूं एक बार आप उसको फिर से प्रेजेंट करिएगा स्क्रीन सर आप स्लाइड मोड में ले लीजिए वरना नीचे जो बार है ना वहां पे क्लिक करिएगा जो भी स्लाइड आप डिस्प्ले करना चाहते हैं ये स्लाइड मोड में है मेरे पास हो गया हो गया सर अभी हो गया अभी बढ़िया है अभी आप देख सकते हैं हाँ जी बिल्कुल सिग्निफिकेंस ऑफ बायोडाइवर्सिटी हेरिटेज एरिया ऑफ पाकिस्तान when you talk about the significance of the biodiversity heritage areas of pakistan so the uh, you know the indigenous uh, uh, community conserved areas or the community conserved areas of pakistan um, are the land of different socio ecological contrast i have already talked about this uh, as far as the uh, indigenous and community conserved areas of pakistan are concerned uh, ladies and gentlemen we have more than 400 plus protected areas community protected areas or you can say a uh, few of them are the indigenous 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 community protected areas so as far as I, and out of 400 plus uh, 132 are notified when i say notified that has been recognized by the governments uh, different provincial governments and the federal government um, as far as uh, uh, the major indigenous management systems are concerned uh, for instance we have a local system is called suck suck is basically um, a, a traditional uh, put, uh, what you can say protected uh, area management regime and that has been uh, what you can say uh, uh, that has been operationalized in chatral area the area we are going to talk about and we are talking about so uh, uh, in chatral is called suck in that particular suck the community sits together and they decides that this particular area is protected and nobody can go uh, without the permission of the community for grazing or for any other use of that particular protected area it's a very viable tool and the people are using that and because of that particular suck which is a traditional management system it has a very very wonderful impacts uh, on the national park and that is called the chatral goal national park because all these communities are residing in the buffer zones of the uh, that particular national park another area that is used and uh, the, the 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 protected protected regime that is used in balochistan is called pargore and pargore is the pashto word and that uh, and that also uh, uh, has the same definition as the suck has but that particular protected area regime is uh, very much in in our Balochistan, that is one of the largest province of Pakistan. And then uh, then the same regime, uh, which is called in Sindh and Punjab, and the Baloch areas called Rak. Rak is also a protected protective uh, protected uh, protective management system. And but but uh, the, the, these three terminologies are different in in uh, what you can say, or the three nomenclature are different in three different uh, uh, what, what you can say areas then we have a, a very uh, strong uh, uh, system that is called pehtik pehtik uh, is very much uh, operational in chatral and basically that particular regime is used to stop the illegal cutting of the wood and its regeneration so the people plant the trees uh, uh, and then they also uh, stop their community to cut any illegal tree in their particular area and that particular regime is called and known as pahati then one is uh, the other uh, what you can say protected regime is called kalangi then gram then mizoiz so the me especially the mizoi is especially a water resource management system uh, and uh, and uh, through the mizoiz they they use their water resources in a better way in a in a 
optimum way very very much effective system and and in the northern areas they are using that as far as this gram is concerned gram is is a, is a system where the community the local community or the villagers they do the communal work they get together they decide they they have to, they have to protect they have to replant the area or they have to work collectively for the conservation protection of the natural resources so they do that particular thing uh, through their gram system because gram is also a very effective system in chatral and, um, and and especially and uh, they have also uh, certain systems which can ban the seasonal hunting so especially during the breeding season again this is a very very important uh, uh, what you can say system that they are using uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, we have a wonderful writings and we have wonderful poems that uh, our local people has written and that has been used for the conservation and protection for instance uh, one of the poets say uh, about the hunting and the orphan orphan uh, and, and, and uh, what you can say he uh, on uh, on behalf of the orphan of that particular deer uh, they write um, uh, rather he writes that oh mother oh mother here is a man coming down uh, oh sweet my darling is it not the shepherd of the hills oh mother oh mother uh, our rifle started to flash oh sweet my darling is it not the rays of the sun oh mother oh mother blood is streaming down your breast oh sweet my darling is it is it not this is, is, is it not the sweat of the summer heat oh mother oh mother who will bring up the orphans oh sweet my oh, 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 oh sweet my darling the lord will bring them up so these are the writings and poems that the local poets has has written and that that give a uh, message of conservation message of protection message to uh, to protect their protected areas and so on so forth for instance a few other verses of a poem that um, uh, of, uh, uh, on a on a deer uh, 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 and uh, and uh, and he talk about the beauty of that particular deer oh dear your foot chooses the steps of mountains oh your lip chooses the flowers Oh, your horns are your your enemies. Oh dear, you are my sweetheart. So, uh, so these type of writings, these type of poems uh, in a traditional management systems are also playing a wonderful role. And there are, ladies and gentlemen, certain management systems I talked about, but there are certain myths also. For instance, howling of the fox uh, is the indication of the death of killing uh, is the indication of the death so what is happening the people whenever they see the fox they try to kill it so this is again a myth uh, either it's a uh, what you can say it's not a positive it's not a good myth but it's a myth so that's why they are using that particular thing um, for instance honeybees uh, there is a myth that honeybees bring the prosperity so especially the kalasha people the indigenous people of chatral they keeps honeybee hives uh, in their houses and they say that it, it it will bring the fortune so again a very good myth that is conserving the honeybees in that particular area then so on so forth uh, the indian magpie and uh, it's also considered a very sacred bird so because it is considered a very sacred bird so it is very much protected and the people don't kill that particular bird so this is again a very good thing uh, a good myth that uh, that that protects and that conserve the indian magpie in chatral so spiders and ants are also considered a holy insects again uh, they they don't consider they don't uh, kill the uh, uh, kill them and this is again a, a very good thing as far as the conservation and protection is concerned so on so forth red sand boa this is a snake and uh, it's it is considered to be a family friend so uh, because of that particular myth that this is very much protected and the people uh, what you can say don't kill it and because of that particular thing uh, we are protecting and we are conserving uh, the red the, the red the red uh, sand boa snake in uh, chatral and other in and other areas of the kps 
Um, there are other few myths that um, uh, the, the and one myth is called Shavans. Where, what is Shavan? That the fairies are the custodians of the protected areas. So when they say, uh, if we will uh, uh, disturb the protected area, the national park, the wildlife sanctuaries, or the adjoining areas, the buffer zones, the fairies uh, uh, will not be a heavy one, and they and then there will be a disturbance to their their families or their loved ones. So because they they considered that the uh, the fairies are the custodians, so that's why they protect and concern, and especially the Kalasha people because the, they are not uh, the Muslims, so they have their own uh, what you can say taboos. Uh, the religious taboos, so that's very much there, and they believe on that, and that's why the areas where the uh, Kalasha people live, they are very much protected, conserved, and it has a uh, it has a very flourished protected areas. Uh, uh, they, they, there is uh, again um, uh, the, uh, a myth in the Kalashi culture uh, that the pollution is really fatal. So what they do is whenever they go for grazing. They are very, very conscious about the pollution. They don't pollute their, uh, pollute their protected areas. Uh, and they, they, they believe and strongly believe that because of these protected areas or what you can say, uh, the animals um, graze there and they bring the fortune for their family. So again, uh, we, we are very fortunate that in areas where the Kalashi people live, they are very much free of pollution. And then um, they, are, uh, they sing special songs to, uh, to please the fairies and gods and uh, gods of the pastures. There are different gods of, uh, of their pastures and they have their different songs and they have different, what you can say, get togethers where they get, uh, where, where they, uh, what you can say, uh, they, they sing the song and they try to please their gods and they believe because if the gods are, uh, are, are pleased, so their protected areas are uh, uh, will be very healthy, and they will be getting the maximum from their from their protected areas on sustainable basis. Uh, so, what are the issues of these traditional management systems, values, myths, uh, ladies and gentlemen? Uh, I think uh, uh, the the four most important thing is the lack of awareness among the policymakers, the people who decides the fate of the protected areas, the people who are managing the, the, the so-called, uh, what you can say, uh, the, 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 the uh, latest protected areas, I would say, they are not very much convinced or they are not very much aware of the value systems of, uh, of the uh, uh, value systems that has been contributing positively for uh, um, what you can say for centuries and and their value systems are time tested but unfortunately uh, there is uh, they lack awareness so they are not very much motivated so they are they don't believe in that so they say only the modern uh, management systems uh, are the systems who can play a positive role so this is one of the issue other one is the um, lack of trust on communities uh, this is a dilemma uh, this is a common tragedy of uh, the third world countries and especially the South Asian countries. I, I think uh, you would have the same attitude of the people because they say uh, they, they don't think that uh, the communities um, are the contributors for the conservation and protections, but they but they believe that they are they are part of the problem. So uh, so this is unfortunate, but this is a reality. We have to change their attitude, their mindset. If we want to conserve and protect the uh, and protect the national parks or any protected area, especially in the South uh, South uh, Asian countries, um, then the documentation of the uh, of the indigenous systems values. This is very unfortunate uh, because uh, uh, we don't uh, we have not documented it these value systems. And uh, now uh, I think uh, my, this is my personal observation when I uh, collected the data that in days to come, uh, in years to come, or I think in, in a decade or so, that particular system will be tattered and we would uh, we would have uh, only uh, one or two or very few people left who, who will be carrying forward, uh, who would be carrying forward 
the the uh, the uh, legacy of the uh, traditional management systems so uh, that is one of the biggest issue that i that i conf uh, confronted when i i was in the field so weak laws definitely the, our laws did not consider the traditional management system uh, and these traditional uh, systems uh, would be part and parcel of uh, of our protect, uh, of our laws uh, the other uh, very uh, unfortunate area is erosion of the indigenous practices while uh, the young generation uh, they are shifting from these particular areas they are they are they are they are going they prefer to reside in the cities so they are leaving their 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 what you can say traditional areas for their livelihoods so that's why they are uh, they, their indigenous practices are uh, real uh, what you can say in 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 uh, uh, is eroding in a very rapid pace uh, then definitely this uh, ten uh, what you can say tenorial uh, ten, tenorial issue is one of the issues because their areas are not very much doc uh, what you can say documented in the documents of uh, the land uh, uh, revenues and so on and so forth so that's a big issue and then, then definitely the mega projects are the biggest uh, uh, what you can say a threat or issue for the indigenous communities and their protected areas. Also, what are the conclusions and the policy recommendations, ladies and gentlemen? There must be a framework for joint planning, ladies and gentlemen, until or unless we will not recognize the local communities as the custodians of the protected areas, custodians of the buffer zone, their own protected areas, you can't go uh, you, uh, uh, you can't go for the effective uh, protection and conservation of the protected areas. That I am very much convinced on that, and I have a lot of arguments to support my this, uh, what you can say, recommendation. Uh, then we have to provide the legal cover to the community conserved areas, and especially the indigenous management systems. And if we want to reactivate these systems, we have to provide them the legal cover so that the all the stakeholders should and must respect these systems and use these systems in the protection and the conservation of the natural resources then definitely the human resource development um, we have to engage the local and the indigenous communities also so that they should also be uh, trained and uh, what you can say capacitated as far as the modern regimes are concerned so in certain areas we can blend the modern regimes with the traditional regimes and we can we can use the the the, the blend of both regimes for the conservation and protection of the national parks and the protected areas in pakistan and definitely when i say in pakistan in the south asian countries because we 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 have the same traditions and the same what you can say um, attitude and aptitude um, when you and and the, the last one is the establishment of the new safety nets for the traditional uh, uh, communities and uh, and and uh, most of the tradi uh, traditional communities are unfortunately the poor communities because they don't have the diversify livelihoods they have to uh, what you can say uh, they have to, they, they have to be uh, dependent only of their traditional management systems so uh, we have to diversify and we have to provide them the safety nets so uh, so that they, uh, they, they 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 could be, uh, be they could be playing a very positive role in conservation of the uh, of the area um, this is uh, the i think the last uh, would be the last slide and that is that are the conclusion and the policy uh, sorry the second last one uh, and 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 this particular thing is strengthen the cultural identity of the indigenous local pe indigenous people local people and the mobile communities when i say the mobile communities this is for the experts who are not from the south asian uh, communities but uh, for from for, for my indian friends even nepalis and my uh, my botani uh, what you can say friends we call them the bakawals the bakawals who have uh, who who who, uh, who are also the local and, and the indigenous people who are grazing and what you can say um, applying the wonderful conservation protection uh, regimes for centuries because they are so sensitive of their grazing areas and they know how to graze when to graze 
and how many and and what should be the carrying capacity of that particular area um so now we have to strengthen and their cultural identity and we have to respect them if we want to conserve the natural uh, resource management and conservation system intact then uh, as i already mentioned the documentation is very important and then involvement of the uh, of the communities in conservation and policy planning uh, especially the indigenous communities especially the bucca walls especially the people who have the stake and who are very much uh, engaged with their protected areas that's very very important and uh, then we have to clarify and protect the intellectual property rights and of the indigenous uh, indi indi indigenous groups so uh, no other community or group can benefit uh, from their intellectual property rights so th this is also very very important because sometimes the people like us so called uh, pseudo intellectuals they go their areas they use them and they use their what you can say wisdom knowledge and then they don't recognize the local people and that's the dilemma dilemma of our area and dilemma of the third world countries and even in even in australia and brazil and the and the, and, and the countries who are, who are so called developed countries what are happening with the indigenous communities there and uh, everybody know what uh, you can say know that and uh, there is no any need to further clarify that particular thing so what's the way forward ladies and gentlemen uh, there should be a detailed eco cultural assessment of the community protected areas uh, or uh, what you can say the the regimes of the uh, of of the uh, what you can say indigenous communities so that that could be documented that could be used in future for the protection and conservation of the protected areas and protected and that should be considered as a protected regime and that's an area where india pakistan nepal and our south is uh, south asian countries can work together even the afghanistan because if afghanistan also borders with pakistan so we can we can help each other and we can assist each other and we can we can work on that particular thing and uh, and we can document and we have, we have a detailed assessment what what is left and how that particular left needs to be protected and how we will be protected that application of the lessons from the uh, from the community conserved areas um, uh, 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 that should be uh, what you can say uh, 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 that should be initiated as a participatory approach and uh, it should be legally protected uh, in the country and uh, especially and this is this would be my advice that it should be legally recognized and protected in the south asian countries um, then definitely the border resource management traditional resource rights their social justice their health concerns issues uh, should be addressed because this is very important if we don't have the traditional people uh, people uh, and we then definitely we, we we would not have their management systems their their regimes so is there if their regimes uh, needs to be intacted um, protected so the foremost thing is that the people behind that particular intellect must be protected must be respected must be conserved and must be engaged as a very very important stakeholders ladies and gentlemen this is a very very clear message otherwise it would be too late uh, to uh, and we will be losing a very very important protected areas management tools and regimes in days to come so and then the relationship of the work to indigenous peoples and local communities and how it responds to the locally defined needs um, is very important we have to we have to we have to have a very clear uh, uh, mindset and a relationship between the indigenous people local communities their values their traditional management systems with our what you can say the, the modern management regimes and traditional management systems uh, thank you so much this is one of the pictures of the kalashi this beautiful girl she's from the kalashi society and they are the people who are really protecting conserving and contributing in the protection conservation and uh, what you can say rehabilitation of natural resources protected areas in pakistan and i salute them 
and I really appreciate your contribution. And we all should work uh, to protect <coughs> them, to concern them, and to what you can see, engage them in our uh, what you can say, protection uh, of the natural resources. Uh, and, and with that, I'm really thankful for your time. Uh, again, I would urge that it was a wonderful opportunity uh, to you and to Tahir Saab, I'm Tahir Saab. I'm sorry to intervene. The last slide showing the little girl, the audio was not audible. So can you repeat that, please? The last girl about the last little girl on your thank you slide. Uh, audio was not okay. audible. Yeah. Uh, so can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. yes, sir. Go ahead, please. Yeah. So that particular girl uh, belongs to the Kalashi community. So I was uh, emphasizing in my presentation, uh, and they are the people who are really contributing positively in the protection, conservation of the nature resources and protected areas, and the indigenous community protected areas uh, in Chatral. And uh, I was just saying that these wonderful, uh, what you can say, uh, community must be protected, conserved. Their rituals must be conserved. They should be conserved and protected because when they will be protected, they will be engaged, they will be con uh, conserved, they will be respected, they will be owned. It means we are protecting, conserving our nature resources in Pakistan and so on and so forth. If you are protecting and, and, and respecting the indigenous communities uh, of the South Asian countries, it means we'll be protecting and conserving and contributing uh, the, in the protection and conservation of the natural resources in the South Asia. So this is my message. Uh, and, and thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Thank so you let, me, let me, as a chairperson of this session, uh, thank Dr. Tai Rashid Saab for a very crisp, lucid, and I should say, you know, his acumen with policy making and his connect with the community. Uh, permeated all through his presentation. I think this presentation and many of these presentations that happened before in the last several days from scholars from, uh, you know, beyond India and the neighboring countries only proves one simple point that knowledge uh, does not, you know, get impeded by any kind of political boundaries. And we are all together when it comes to conserving our wildlife and natural resources. So, Tahir Rashid Saab, Bahut bahut shukriya uh, for your time and this beautiful presentation which was replete with knowledge and your experiences uh, in dealing with uh, so many issues uh, where community is a stakeholder of uh, uh, so much of our natural resources. Now I think we should open up this session for a few questions if we have any. So can we have a couple of questions if there are any, please. Kindly unmute and uh, ask direct your question to Dr. Tahir Rashid ji, please. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, yes, uh, uh, Tahir sir, I have, I want to share something with you, with all my fellow uh, scholars. Uh, what you have said about indigenous knowledge systems and people is very true and noticeable even in India. We have found, especially with archaeological monuments, the ancient monuments, the local people who get attached to these monuments serve as security. They tend to the monuments, the locals around, as if it is their baby. For example, where I served, there, there were no funds when I came to the department. As a result, having security was out of question. There were 550 monuments. And if you single them out, there were about 1,500 monuments. And security was absolutely nil. In such cases, when I visited the interiors of the districts and saw the monuments, I found poor people who are hand to mouth also talking about the monument, coming up to me, telling me their problems, telling me how it was, how it, the rank vegetation had to be removed, how they were cleaning it free of cost. And it was really pathetic. So I do believe that it is time for the policymakers to open their eyes. In fact, for archaeology and museums, if you go for a statewide meeting, only if there's an empty chair, you sit down. That is a polit So there is a need of political will and there is a need of bureaucratic uh, bureaucracy opening their eyes to this department. It is a very important uh, chariot of tourism, which brings in uh, money. 
So that was my just my submission to the Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. So kind of you. I think that has been uh, very explicit, and you have eco you've been echoing our sentiments collectively. Thank you so much for that submission. Any other question, please? Anybody else, please? Yes, I can see uh, one gentleman raising Haji Rahmanji. I think he's left the meeting, but he raises. Uh, anybody else for any more questions? If not, we uh, take this webinar proceedings further. Once, again, do we have a co-chair, uh, Mishraji? Do we have Hello. a co-chair? Oh, no. Haji Rahman is very much there. Haji, Haji. So, any if there are no more questions for uh, the eminent Manoj speaker, Haji, Haji, Haji Rahman is back. Ji, ji, ji. Rahman Zab. Ji. Kindly come ji, on Haji and Rahman. come on, Mike, and kindly uh, present your question to Rashid Sab. Rahman Sab, up ho. I think if, if not able to get him, is is Rahman ji logged in? आप कुछ यदि पूछना चाहते हो तो कृपया पूछेगा। मनोज जी, इफ वी डोंट हैव एनी क्वेश्चन, सो जस्ट वांटेड टू कंक्लूड बाय सेइंग दैट माय रिसर्च एंड बेसिकली इट वाज अ डॉक्टरल रिसर्च एंड आई डिड माय पीएचडी इन दैट पर्टिकुलर सब्जेक्ट, सो दैट सिग्निफाइज अ वेरी स्ट्रॉंग एक्सेस बिटवीन द uh, traditional management systems and the natural resource management Beautiful. and the concept. So uh, the only thing is that we uh, there is a tendency uh, to offer uh, uh, to, to to conserve the biodiversity, but the only thing is how to reactivate it and mm -hmm. how to, to engage them and how to use their centuries old time tested models and systems in protecting Beautiful. and conserving them. Sources of the South Asia. Thank you, sir. Tahir Sahab, we share with you that in Hindustan, under National Biodiversity Act 2002 and Biological sure. Diversity Rule, um, Rules 2004, we have a very interesting mandate called People's Biodiversity Registers. Where you are now telling us that community ke through jo inki local knowledge hote hai, usse document karke usse scientific validate validation diya jata hai to jo wahi cheez jo yes. aap jo aap keh rahe ho na sir jo jis par aapka emphasis hai pure presentation mein jo aapne highlight kiya that and as madam madam kedareshwari rightly point out i think in our community we have the guardians and the custodians of our heritage whether it's living heritage yes. by me, by way of our biodiversity and wildlife endowments or our you know cultural heritage ultimately if people choose to kind of uh, you know relate to this history i think it will be a little more easier to preserve it for posterity so once again thank you so much it was a pleasure to yes. interact with you thank you and i, I uh, just wanted to recognize Manoj ji, uh, you are very fortunate. You are very fortunate that uh, that you have people like Ashish Kotari and uh, he is doing uh, wonders. Ji ji. Haan ji ji haan ji. Wo Neema ji aur unki puri team. Haan I ji, think sir. they are they are wonderful people and they Absolutely, are really contributing both heart in taking the agenda of the indigenous communities and their regimes. So you you are doing a wonderful things. Um, uh, I I will uh, really emphasize to my government and my policy makers to take the footsteps of uh, the Ashish ji and his team uh, so that we can we could also uh, what you can say work accordingly in protecting and conserving uh, the traditional management systems and their values thank absolutely, you absolutely rashid sahab i think if all the countries in this region get together we can vouch for the ecological security of the whole you know, the Indian subcontinent in that sense. So I think we have to partner, do a lot of hand-holding and take this mandate further. Thank you once again. Have a very pleasant afternoon, uh, everybody. Back Thank to you, study. Sir. Thanks a lot. Very kind of you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ahir uh, Rasheed, sir, for giving a nice talk uh, on uh, biodiversity heritage values. Uh, Thank you, sir. And uh, Dr. Manoj Borkar, sir, chair the session. Uh, thank you, all of you. Thank you. <clears throat> now, next session, uh, our
चेयरपर्सन डॉक्टर झामक बी कार्की वाइस प्रिंसिपल प्रोफेसर काठमांडू फॉरेस्ट्री कॉलेज काठमांडू नेपाल एंड इमिनेंट स्पीकर मिस्टर जगन्नाथ अधिकारी डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ जुलाजी त्रिभुवन यूनिवर्सिटी नेपाल एंड वीरेंद्र मल्टीपल कैंपस त्रिभुवन यूनिवर्सिटी भरतपुर नेपाल वेलकम वेलकम डॉक्टर झामक कार्की सर एंड मिस्टर जगन्नाथ अधिकारी सर एंड आई एम रिक्वेस्ट टू गुड आफ्टरनून नमस्ते डॉक्टर झामक अधिकारी सर डॉक्टर झामक कार्की सर प्लीज शेयर द सेशन एंड इंट्रोड्यूस आवर इमिनेंट स्पीकर मिस्टर अधिकारी थैंक यू प्रोफेसर इसकान साहब गुड आफ्टरनून टू एवरी डॉक्टर अधिकारी टू बी डॉक्टर अधिकारी जगन्नाथ अधिकारी आई पर्सनली नो हिम फ्रॉम प्रोबेबली मोर देन टू डिकेट्स नाउ व्हेन आई न्यू हिम फर्स्ट टाइम कांग्रेचुलेशन एंड आई थिंक इफ आई एम राइट मिस्टर जगन माइट रिकरेक्ट मी व्हेन वी मेट फर्स्ट टाइम आई थिंक इट वाज अ ट्रेनिंग ऑर्गेनाइज बाय हिज प्रोफेसर चालीसेंडलिटीड बाय दी horse uh, predated by snow leopard that that's incident uh, i remember on him uh, remember, later on he also did his uh, master thesis in the same valley uh, Lang- langthang valley uh, if uh, some of you remember the earthquake uh, uh, the incident uh, can langthang valley was the one worst hit yeah. whole valley was eroded uh, in the in the earthquake and opposite site was his study site uh, on this species Uh, on top of that, he is a current assistant professor of physiology at the Tuvan University. Uh, he holds master degree from the same Tuvan University in physiology. He was a conservation officer of the uh, national NGO called National Trust for Nature Conservation, uh, who works with the government uh, for the conservation of protected area in Nepal. Uh, he worked there for about two year uh, plus two years. uh he is a conservation trainer at various conservation related institutions because he has the the masters degree in zoology a wildlife oriented lot of uh, trainings and visits uh he is a, he is a research fellow of the himalayan environment and public health network uh he owes the book uh, particularly the bachelor level book on handbook of practical zoology a test book of zoology natural resource management for uh, graduate level uh similarly he had published uh, uh for the same he got the uh, award prize from the nast uh, our scientific uh, institution called nepal academy of science and technology to publish these books in 2020 2021 he published more than 15 articles in uh, international review journals uh, a lot of uh, presentation was made by him on different national and international uh, the uh, workshops and seminars and shown uh so recently he submitted a phd a dissertation for evaluation and we congratulate him uh, for uh, being a doctor in recent future if i get chance or invitation to attend your uh, phd uh, if it is in wildlife and zoology sector i will i love to hear uh, you on your presentation also okay, he has a research interest on conservation particularly large mammals birds in particularly bird vultures the birds of prey ecosystem management landscape ecology and limnology He is general secretary of the Nepal Zoological Society of Bagmati Province. Uh, so, with this short uh, introduction, I would like to invite uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Jagan uh, Adhikari to be Dr. Jagan Adhikari for his uh, presentation, which we are awaiting for. Uh, Mr. Adhikari, it's your turn now. Is it sharing, sir? Yes, it's visible now. Yeah. a uh, respected session chair and thank you sir for elaborating my introductions and i also uh, at that times you are the trainers in uh, i am taking the training from you in uh, what i am present here 
uh, uh, dads, uh, also your contributions. And thank you, Jamak sir, and respected session chairs, uh, co chairs, as well as all of the delegates. And also, thank you for the organizers for inviting me uh, to sharing my uh, research uh, with, uh, with the international platform. Thank you very much for providing me such types of the opportunity. And here, I want to discuss about the landscape connectivity for, for the large mammals, uh, especially that is a model uh, of the landscape level conservations in the central parts of the Chitan Annapura landscape Nepal. That is a bit technical, and uh, we already uh, know about the Nepal, such as the um, um, in the parts or the portrait areas of Nepal, as well as tiger conservations uh, and uh, many other, such as the hunting about the hunting mechanisms of the door pattern uh, uh, hunting reserves. And here I want to discuss about these uh, outlines, introductions, land use, and the land cover are they are changing within the uh, periods of time. Then I, I, I think, is, excuse me, I think your slide is not moving to us, to me at least. Okay. Oh, it's now fine. Thank you. Now fine. And what happened? It is fine, sir? Now? It, it's, yeah, it's it's okay now. Okay. Then, specific distribution modeling. Uh, and another one is, is this landscape is connecting? or is it the connectivity is possible? Uh, I will discuss about it. Such is the first introductions. Uh, mammals, these are the highly specialized animals and superior animals and have the remarkable diversity such as the species, ecology, physiology, behavior, and the life histories. Altogether, 6,495 species of the mammals have been reported from the also in the world. But again, what, again, uh... Adhikariji, is it is it slide three or four you are running? We are still in second slide. Okay, what happens here? Uh, something is happening. Yeah, it, it's fine now. Uh, mm, uh, in the presentation mode, that happens. Uh, therefore, I will talk um, by showing. Yeah, non-presentation mode. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, only the two hundred thirteen species uh, of the mammals. Uh, are in Nepal reported from the Nepal and such as the discovery of the mammals as well as the extinction rate of the mammals is going on side by side and uh, next one I want to discuss about what's the reasons one is the habitat loss in the fragmentation that is the major issue such as the uh, landscape uh, due to the different anthropogenic activities as well as the different calamities, the habitat is lost. And another one is the course of the rivers as well as the construction activities, road construction, etc. Habitat is the fragmented. These um, loss and the fragmentations ultimately trace the biodiversity all around the world. But here is, sorry, but here is um fragment fragmented habitat such types of the fragmented habitat not only uh, play the negative roles also play the uh, play the positive roles such as the provide the alternative habitat for the animals that means that helps for the wildlife conservations and uh, they, these habitats play the vital role as surrogate of the uh, surrogate habitat and mid hill of Nepal is highly fragmented and human dominated, such as the women settlements and the forest patches were scattered in the mid hill Nepal. But there, these are the beyond the priority of the conservations because there is a less number of uh, there is less number of the conservation areas in the mid hill, and also there is less study. If such types of the fragmented habitat linking with each other, then this will be the important for the wildlife movement. Therefore, uh, I am also focusing this study. That in next one conservation landscapes of Nepal, and main purpose of this landscape is connect the habitat, such as the fragmented habitat 
or the national park together for the purpose of the conservation. In Nepal, there uh, ten day five uh, three purpose in the five declared uh, landscape uh, in Nepal. One is the Tarai Ark landscape. In Nepal, it covers the 24,710.13 kilometers square that covers the 18 districts in six protected areas, including the five national parks in the wild or one conservation areas. Like this, another one is the Kaila Sakar landscape, which is also associated to the uh, India. Uh, in, uh, in the Nepal part, it covers the 13,246.18 kilometers square. And cover the four district as well as the two ported area. One is the Opinampa conservation area, and another one is the Khapterness Park, that means a part of the Khapterness Park, not all. This one is the Chiton Annapura land is safe. That is the largest uh, uh, land is safe so, that covers the 32,090 kilometers square in the uh, covers the 19 districts and the six protected areas. Next one is the Sakar Himalayan landscape. The Sakar Himalayan landscape covers the 23,336.36 kilometers square in the 17 districts. Like this, another one is the Kanchanjaga landscape. This cover 5,190 kilometers square in four districts such as the Taplejung, Pasta, Ilam, and the Zhapa in one conservation area, Kanchanjangan conservation area. And, and uh, then my study mainly focus in the Chiton Annapura land shape. Here, my study focus mainly in the Chiton Annapura land shape, that is the just between the uh, Annapura and the Chiton National Park. The area between the Annapurna and the Chitton National Park just touching. And here uh, I examine this area is portable for the movements of the animal. Is it is this area is uh, potential for the functional connectivity or not? Uh, here this area is uh, covers 2749.48 kilometers square and follow the Seti River Basin. Follow the Seti rivers in elevation ranges from 150 to the 3300 meter. And is in increasing the elevations or as differentiations in the elevations, there is also differentiations of the vegetations as well as the biodiversity, ultimately biodiversity. And this is highly fragmented and located the part of the Chiton, the cover the part of Chiton, Tanu, Kaski, and Parbat and the Sangja district. And uh, next one, uh, I will discuss about the land use and the land cover changes. Is there any changes uh, the land cover within the uh, period of the time, within the 20 years period of the time? Here, land use and the land cover, that is the major principles of the environmental changes, such as the we say now the climate change as well as the change in the uh, habitat, or the land step level changes at AC. And it is very important to understand the drivers and their impacts on the ecology, such as the forest cover. Is there changing in the forest? And if the forest cover is changing, then ultimately change in the biodiversity uh, other animals. And next one is the anthropogenic process, such as the construction of the road, uh, as well as the developed area. And for this purpose, remote sensing and geographic information system was used to evaluate the land cover changes. Here, uh, a bit technical, and uh, I want to discuss about how these land cover changes uh, obtained, that means the uh, such methodology, and data sources mainly the data. Landsat 7, Landsat 5, and the Landsat 8 were downloaded from globis.usgs.gov. Such as the Landsat 7 for 2000, Landsat 5 for 2010, and Landsat 8 for the 2020. These all raw data with 30 meter resolutions were proceed by using the address image in 15 version and ArcGIS 10.7. Like this, another one is the this. 
uh, image were classified on the basis of the color, such as they have the uh, one color composite, and on the basis of that color composite, also the texture of the features of the remote sense, remote distance data, the image was classified. But for the for the case of the uh, forest type, it is classified on the basis of the dominant plant species. And uh, classify is mixed forest, soil dominated forest, riverine forest by this way. And uh, that is the overall process of the image processing. If I want to so in the let me just more. Uh, have you seen, sir? This one. Hello, sir. I am audible. Yes, yes, you are audible. Uh, then these satellite images were proceed. So say the pre-processing process, so that the layer stacking, combining these layer, then cloud relating, such as the less than uh, if only the less than the five percent of the cloud, then it is regarded as the processing for the image. Otherwise, this image is not used for the uh, classifications and maxing with the training area. These are the pre-processing process. And after that, classifications were done. Here are two types of the classification. One is the unsupervised classification. That is, we say the raw classification. And uh, this based on the texture or the color composite of the image. Another one is the supervised classification. That is, depends upon the ground truthing point. And we go to the field and take the GPS point. And find the exact location words the year such as the if there is the grassland then we make the polygon we make the signature class of the grassland and if there is the cropland that is make the signature class of the cropland by this way the supervised classifications was performed by using the maximum likelihood classifier algorithm and after supervised classification, then there is many processes, such as the push classification process uh, where it occurs, then such as the recording, color editing, and color editing, and class value editing process. And after that, how accurate our uh, image was. Then we perform the accuracy assessment. For 2020 using the ground truthing point half of the ground truthing point was used for the supervised classification and half of the collected ground truthing points was used for the accuracy assessment and uh, for the case of the 2000s and the 2012 stratified uh, random points were generated and that is compared with the google earth map and topographic map and ultimately there is formations of the thematic map uh, which is proceed and reclassify in the ArcGIS. Then, then next one is the uh, that's the result. What's the results comes here? Land cover composite that is classified into the eight classes. And happy to say that this area is covered by more than sixty-two percent of the forest. And but the national forest cover was the 44.47. Therefore, this area have greater than the national forest cover. And accuracy assessment of the image was the 81%. And for the case of the 2000, and 81.6 for the case of the 2010. And for the case of the 2010, and 84.77% for 2020. That is the, the satisfactory classifications. And have you seen, sir? Any problem? Go ahead. It's fine. Okay. And land cover changes uh, in between 2000, 2010 and the 2020. We can easily say here the crop land is in decreasing conditions. Here in the hilly regions, the people migrate to the city area for the better life. And they left their land and this land gradually convert into the forest. So that there is increase in the mixed forest by 37.6%. And build up area and settlement area also increase 31.34% 
and birds and sal dominated forest increased by the 7.76 percent but what decrease there is decrease of the uh, grassland due to the natural succession 49.71 percent and cropland uh 29.87 percent and the barren area 20.03 percent and the riverine area also decreased by 11.29 percent here i focus mainly the five places where there is bigger changes one is the old padampur area and uh now it is included in the chitam national park and before included in the chitam national park the here is a village or a, sorry here is the resident area and this resident area uh, after the resettlement program this area transferred to the another area therefore these crop lands now convert into the grassland as well as the riverine forest here grassland decreased by the 94.45 percent uh here uh, we also uh, i also take the associated area therefore uh, uh here may be decrease of the cropland by the 93 percent and riverine forest 91.2 percent and the mixed forest that is increased by the 62.5 percent but the cropland decreased by the uh, Nath, are you in slide 12 or further i think we are stuck in slide 12. oh not moving uh no, it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Slide uh, 15. Yeah. Okay. And that is the conditions of the old Padampur area. And this area that basically this settlement is uh translocated to the another part and included in the Chitra National Park. Now this area convert into the um, uh convert into the uh grassland or the river and forest, forest area. Now this place transport to the new area that means the to the uh, Padampur now we say the new Padampur area by clearing the forest. Therefore there is a decrease of the river and forest by the 61.2 percent to 1 percent and salt forest by the 54.14 percent and grassland by the 64.88 percent but there is increase of the cropland by 88.17 percent and here is no settlement area then uh, we can see the changes between 2000s to, uh, between the uh, obvious changes between 2000 and 2010 but vigorous changes between 2010 and the 2020 that means the build up area in the settlement area changes by 1433.33 percent another uh, changes occurs in the bass area which is the uh city area of the mid hill city area of the mid hill and the peoples of the surrounding uh, rural area comes to that area for the settlement for the better life so that this area the cropland we can say in the map the cropland convert into the city area that means the build up area so that the build up and settlement area increased by the 86.55 percent where is the cropland decreased by the 40.86 percent like this another bigger changes occurs in the panchase and associate area panchase and the surrounding area here same phenomenons the local peoples left their land left their land and go to the city area for better life hence their cropland convert into the forest convert into the forest so that the cropland decreased by the 51.92 percent and mixed forest increased by the 68.1 percent and the salt forest by the 23.29 percent some uh such is another part in the southern part that with the lower parts of the annapurna conservation area here mixed forest is increased and build up area due to the developmental activities such as the road constructions uh, and also the promotions of the ecotourism uh, here there is uh, increase of the build up area but here crop lights also decrease and decrease by the barren area and the grassland in in happy to share that this uh changes or this um, classifications was published in the parge in 2022 uh, april uh, all the results uh, are included in these uh, articles and next one i want to talk about the 
specific distribution modeling. Is this area is suitable for the mammals, large mammals? And I focus only the nine mammalian uh, fauna. Here I want to uh, discuss about and about the sort, about the methodology, one by the specific distribution model. And that is the just probability of the occurrence of the species to that area. And what the relations with their environmental variables, different types of the variables. For that purpose, for the specific distribution modeling, I use the Maxent, Maxent modeling, which is worldwide uh, used modeling. And for that purpose, two types of the data is necessary. One is the species presence data. Another one is the environmental variables data. Species presence data was collected uh, from the uh, field by using the transit methods as well as the opportunistic survey. And this collected uh, data uh, were especially verified by using the SDM tool, such as uh, that is the fine scale suitability modeling because uh, uh, I use 30 by 30 resolution map, uh, 30 by 30 classified resolution map. <coughs> But generally, uh, we say the species distribution modeling in one into one kilometer. And this especially rarefy data and the environmental variable data that is selected by linking the mammalian species with the environmental correlates of the variables. Which types of the variables affect that animals? <coughs> Sorry. Then, for the collections of the data, that means the point, two types of the methods was used. One is the direct observation methods the, through the transit. Another one is the indirect method that is by the help of the sign, such as the tiger, leopards, and Himalayan black bear. The data of the Himalayan black bear, uh, leopards in the data were collected by using the sign, such as the pugmark, scar, scrap, scratch. Here, tiger is not used in this um uh isn't uh, in this analysis because the presence point is low than leopards and the himalayan uh, black bear like this another one is the direct observation matter in the case of the herbivore ungulates uh about the ungulates hog deer and the rhinoceros were reported uh, uh in the low locations uh, uh only the occupancy point was very low. Therefore, these are removed from this analysis. In somebody or Chittal, Munjak, Oil Peak, and Himalayan Gorans were used uh, for the analysis, such as in case of the primates, races and the langur macaques, uh, langur uh, monkey and races macaques was used uh, in the analysis, such as in the caribou, I collect the data of the black bear and the leopard. In the leopard, such as the killing side, uh, the best points of the killing side as well as the sign presence side were collected and that is the overall process one is the uh, i already told two types of the data is necessary one is the presence data another one is the environmental variable and the, the presence data that is convert into the csp file and another one is the variables data that is uh, habitat variables such as the nearest distance to the forest uh, grassland, water source, uh, habitat heterogeneity, uh, normalized uh, difference, vegetation index, a modified normalized difference, uh, water index, such as the further topographic variables, altitude or elevation, and slope, and uh, terrain roughness index, and also the disappearance variable, uh, nearest distance to the cropland, develop in the settlement areas, and uh, normalize the difference of the build up index and specific variables only for the leopards that is the species richness of the prey which is the important variables for the presence of the prey to that area and these are the input presence data and the environment data are the input of the maxent and the output of this maxent was evaluated on the basis of the area under curve area under curve if the area under curve is more than the seven that is regarded as the satisfactory uh, model 
and the output again evaluated by the help of the jackknife test and variable contribution how the uh, variables were contributed for the occurrence of the species to that area and also the response curve uh, how the animals show the response to the different environmental variables that are sold by the response curve and the modern uh, species distribution model ultimately reclassify is um, highly suitable suitable moderately suitable and the no suitable by this way for categorize and on the basis of the uh, on the basis of the uh, probability of the occurrence and ultimately the habitat suitability map was developed that is the overall methodology and what the result i want to say one by one for the case of the northern railroad that we commonly say the barking deer also among the selected tubal variables distance to the cropland and ndbi and ndbi these are contributed the most one such as the uh, distance to the cropland alone contributed the 59.3 percent it shows the positive response to the uh, distance to the cropland even though uh, in some literature uh, we see that we saw that these are also familiar with the settlements area as well as the croplands and um, in this landscape 6.52 percent of the total area was very suitable for the for the northern red Punjab, whereas the 23.77 percent is suitable and 25.03 percent was uh, moderately suitable for the northern red Punjab. that means these uh, habitat is probable site uh, for the citation of uh, northern red Punjab. like this for the case of the chital that is the another important prey species of the tiger is with a the leopard here elevation contributed the 61.6 percent because the chital only confines to the lowland and only reported from the lowland area which is connected to the chital national park we say the barandabar corridor forest and a bit part of the devat uh, area only therefore these are only uh, found in the lowland area therefore uh, elevation contributed the more one and another contributors were the distance to the crop and the ndvi here only 0.94 percent of the total landscape is suitable for highly suitable and 5.51 is suitable for the uh, chital like this another one is the largest year that is the summer deer. and for the case of the summer deer, here is also the altitude these are confines to the uh, low elevations only here is the graph is the peak here low elevations only therefore elevation alone contributed the 51.7 percent whereas the distance to the cropland contributed the 32.4 and distance to the forest contributed the 6.7 percent here it's also uh, for the case of the summer only the 0.6 percent of the total area was highly suitable and uh, that is only in the core area uh, of the barandabar corridor forest and uh, 1.93 percent was the suitable and 1.94 percent was moderately suitable but 95.47 percent because here is absence of the here is no uh, occurrence of the summer deer therefore 95.47 percent was unsuitable that means the uh, occurrence probability only concentrated to the lowland only and next one is the wild pig that is found from lowlands to the upland but uh, comparatively higher in the lowland here also uh, elevation contributed the 35.1 percent in increasing the elevations then de decreasing the occurrence probability of the occurrence of the wild pig and distance to cropland that is also shows the uh, a bit uh, positive response and another ndvi shows the positive response uh, to the wild pig and only 8.7 percent of the total area was highly suitable and 5.85 percent was the suitable whereas the 25.21 percent was 
moderately suitable for the uh, wild pea. And next one is important one is the Himalayan goral. Himalayan goral here uh, distance to the cropland. Um, the scatter here is the settlements as well as the cropland is scattered uh, inside the forest, scattered around the forest. Therefore, um, therefore the distance to the croplands is the major components here. And another one is the terrain darkness index contributed the 15.1 percent. The these are mainly found in the rigid area such as the rugged area and steep area and elevations increasing the elevations the occurrence probability of the uh, himalayan goran sansa increases 11.7 percent therefore only 4.6 percent was suitable and 10.89 percent was the uh, suitable and 21.16 percent is moderately suitable that means the upland that means the higher areas were suitable for the case of the uh, Himalayan Goral, mainly the Panchas area and lower pa uh, parts of the Annapurna conservation area was highly suitable for the uh, Himalayan Goral. Like this, next one, next one is the races that is found everywhere um, except the uh, rigged area and also the high uh, altitude area and here distance to the build of as well as the settlement area contributed the 22.9 percent these are the sympatropic animals that means these are very familiar to the people and remains intact to the settlement area as well as the build up area and uh, we also say that is our goodness and also found uh, in the commonly found in the nearby temples and among the 11 variables, another one is the distance to the water body. It also shows the uh, negative response. And next one is the elevations, uh, commonly found in the mid elevation, commonly found in the mid uh, mid elevations. The mid uh, in the hello, hello. Uh, something black screen is coming. Uh, what happens? Uh, maybe the net problem? Or what? Uh, our side is fine. Um, can I uh, down the share and again perform it? Uh, maybe it any technical person helping uh, uh, from organizer uh, side, sir? If I provide, yes, let's try it uh, again then. Oh, okay, okay, sir. Stop presenting. Then again, share window. Yeah. Share it. Have you seen, sir? Yes, screen is appearing. Appearing. Okay, yeah, okay. But sir. not not the presentation. Only screen is coming. Not in the presentation, the screen is yeah, coming. only screen. The current screen is showing. Uh, you have to, yeah. I think if you minimize this screen, then presentation might be visible. Yeah. Yes, now white screen is uh white is screen. Yeah. Yeah, it's it says you are presenting, but the screen is white. Oh, what happens here? Previously, it was black. Yeah, I am presenting here. What happens here? Mm, maybe no, screen, screen is visible. Yeah. Is your presentation open? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Open, 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 sir. Yeah. Then, uh, when you say presentation, you should have uh, allowed you to. Yeah, it's also saying uh, you are presenting in the presentation mode, but your slide is. Yeah, we we screen is visible, not the PowerPoint. Oh, only screen visible. Yeah. Mm. So try to rejoin. Rejoin? Yeah, you can try. Sir. Okay. Uh, try to rejoin, sir. That's where suggestion come from. Yeah. Oh, okay, sir. Okay.
Have you seen the window, sir? Ah, uh, yeah. You are, the, the the screen is visible, the, not the presentation. So if you minimize this, your presentation should yeah. come. Yeah. Again, the blank uh, white is uh, coming. I uh, think. Uh, is Have there any more any system? more uh, open uh, screen? Uh, I mean, blank um, PowerPoint in your uh, computer? Yeah, already open, sir. Yeah. No, your your open presentation is there. Is there anything more than that which is open in your computer? No, 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 sir. It's again white. Uh, white screen is appearing. No PowerPoint. Okay. I didn't know. Yeah. Do you want to share your content to the organizer and they will uh, they will okay. Uh, okay, sir. You it is better. Yeah, you have I the will, sir, I will email to the sir, uh, sir. You can close the PPT and you can reopen. You have to minimize. Yeah, now it's coming, sir. It's coming. Yeah, it's your mail is coming, uh Jagannath uh, ji. So you you if yeah. Yeah, uh, I will I will uh, share, sir. Yes, uh Adhikari ji, koi dikkat hai? Yes, uh, your mail is visible, so your PowerPoint should have visible. Mail is visible. Yeah, the, the current screen that you are trying to do the mail, it's visible. And, and it is not visible. No, yeah, presentation is not visible, but your mail is seen. Seen. You you are trying uh, to do some mail, it is visible. So you have to close all, and then you have to click on the uh, your presentation. Close all. Yes. Yeah, Mr. Malik is trying to help you so uh, coordinate with him, please. Karki Sab, what is the problem? His presentation is not seen. So, what do you think? Do you want to join again or do you want to join again? Yes, it's coming. It's coming now. Coming now? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you, sir. Sorry for technical problem and it is coming sir yes yes go ahead uh, and i am discussing about the risk macaque in uh then uh lango uh angur macaque is also found all over the landscape that is the common species and found over the landscape in distance to the cropland alone contributed the 56.3 percent where the ndbi uh, normalized uh, difference of the wind up index that shows the negative response towards the uh, towards it that means increasing the um, uh, increasing the index then the occurrence probability decreases by the 22.8 percent and the elevation contributed the 10.8 percent whereas uh, only the 8.14 percent of the total area was highly suitable and 26.5 percent was the suitable for the uh, langur like this another one is the himalayan black bear sometimes during the uh, winter seasons they used to come to the lower part also otherwise these are confines only panjasi and associate area in the upper part that means the um, part of the annapoda conservation area and uh, from the camera trapping uh, it was also reported up to the 350 uh, meters in the bardia national park in the camera trap and and uh, the elevation among the 12 uh, variables elevation alone contributed the 29.1 percent Whereas the distance to the forest contributed 32.6% and distance to the grassland contributed the 7.8%. That means these are uh, uh, is increasing, uh, these are uh, sometimes found in the open areas as well as uh, for the case of the leopard, that is the common species and found along the elevation gradients, and that is also the major prey. To the mill hill, major prey uh, to the mill hill, and commonly um, saw the woman while I compared mainly the livestock depredations uh, to that area. And prey species richness, increasing the prey species, then also uh, saw the positive response to the prey species richness. Uh, among the 10 variables, another one is the distance to the crop line. And another one is the distance to the settlement. 
or increasing the distance to the settlement then bigger uh, gradually increase the occurrence probability but not very far in um, only 7.75 was highly suitable in 22.19 suitable and 9.7 percent were the suitable for the leopard <coughs> sorry next one is the landscape connectivity on the basis of these uh, land use and the land cover classifications and on the basis of the um, such uh, on the basis of the suitability mapping or spatial distribution mapping the land cover connectivity was determined here in uh, first of all for the purpose of the land cover classification resistance um, map uh, was necessary and for the landscape uh, map uh, it is calculated by using this formula cost map we say the cost map 100 into 1 minus suitability in arc gis that is uh, in the rest calculated and if there is lower cost that means we have the higher suitability and if there is higher cost that is the unsuitable uh, for this for the movements of this animal and how the pairs as well as the habitat or the habitat pairs were identified that is depends upon the suitability suitability uh, first convert into the binary prediction that means presence means one absence means zero and what what basis that is based on suitability is 0 0.2 if the value uh, more than the 0 0.2 that is predicted as one that means probability of the um, presence uh, there is probability of the presence if the value below than the 0 0.2 it is regarded as the zero that is absent if more than 50 percent of the species are present and the pixel size is more than 5000 pixel size that is regarded as the habitat patch that is the condition uh, of uh, identifying the habitat pairs then another uh, process is the mapping the connectivity here indicated tool such as the uh, least cost path lcp we say uh, approach of the circuit theory was used for that purpose program linkage mapper in arcgis was used for mapping the connectivity and linkage mapper identify the nearest pairs where is the connection and develop the network between the patch area then calculate the least cost distance in the path here minimum cost weight, uh, weight distance cwd is regarded at the stone corridor if this c value of the cwd is higher we say that is the weak corridor and corridor is less possible if it is less we we say that that is the highly correlated and uh, there is possibility of the corridor and this analysis the analysis based on the basis of the ratio of the uh, cost weightage distance and the eclodience distance if this ratio is greater than the 100 regarded as the weak correlation and it is below than the 100 there is maybe the correlation that means the maybe the probability of the corridor and functional corridor and uh, core area and habitat patches along this landscape on that criteria we identify only the 15 habitat patches between chiton and the annapurna landscape and the average habitat size was uh, is 26.67 plus minus 12.70 kilometers square and the largest patch is barandabar corridor and the associate area not only the barandabar corridor also associate areas uh here uh you can see the patch 50 that is the largest one and another smallest one is the uh patch number seven this one that is the raipur and Phiri area and that is the smallest one and uh one is the barandabari corridor and another one 
then results for the case of the northern red manjan is it possible here all together 30 linkage pairs were identified by by the linkage mapper but the patch number two and the patch number three that means the australian camps in the lumle area is high, there is possibility of the high corridor that means the high movements of the uh, northern red munja but highest ratio have been seen uh, in the tubans and the 13 that means the 183.47 uh, this one to win and the 13 passes and but here is less possibility of the connectivity like this for the case of the chital chital here is haphazard one and because they, that is confined only in the lowland and therefore but so the linkage pair 30 but only the debar and the brandabar 14 and the 15 here 14 pairs and the 15 pairs and only solves the uh cost weight distance ratio and the equilibrium distance and the cost weight distance ratio only 83.74 percent here is possibility of the connectivity but very weak relations to the other passes because the ratio was more than the 100 like this for the case of the Samodia, 32 peers were identified but all have the weak linkage because that is also confined to the lowland lowland and nearer to the uh, chitra national park only found in the core area and the ratio was more than the 100 therefore there is the weak uh, functional corridor for them and another one is the wild pink 31 but low resistance for the movements in the nishkat park except the panchase and pepantari except this area uh, that is the rigged area that means the fragmented by the high rig therefore maybe the obstacles of the <coughs> sorry movements of uh, these animals and the ratio was 132.22 that means the more than the 100 but uh, and another one is the gomone in the quota area uh, mainly the gomone in the quota area here is also the lung path uh distance and very difficult to the uh zone and next one is the himalayan goral here here is interesting that all together the 26 peers but the peers which are found in the uh mountains area uh, have the strong correlation have the strong correlation but low altitude have the highest resistance that means the uh, mobility or the uh, corridors is possible for the Himalayan black bears to the uh, high, higher elevated area only. And next one, only these have the eastern corridors such as the uh, 45.6 and 49.21 uh, respectively. And for the case of the races here, highest resistance only seen in the 4 and 5 and 30 and 14, but here majority of the patch peers were favorable for the monkeys and uh, here there is no any resistance because these are uh, sympatropic animals uh, and can familiar to the human and for the case of the langurs also here um, highest resistance also seen here to bend to the uh, 13 and most of the for the most of the animals these uh, area also have the high resistance due to the uh, due to its regularity as well as the um, uh, due to the um, river course also and next one for the himalayan black bear uh, here for the case of the himalayan black bear 31 peers have been seen but the lowest lcp was seen between Pass one and the pass two, and our weak relations of the passes also present in the lower altitude. Lower altitude in this here is uh, very low. And uh, for the case of the leopard, leopard here except the one pass nine and the eleven 
yeah, patch nine in the eleven that is uh, uh, among these uh, except this area. All area have the uh, good connectivity. Therefore, therefore here while combining them, we can say these are the these are the major areas or the pin pin point or the pins point and for the movements of the animal. And if such types of areas, uh, if we protected such types of areas, then there is the possibility of the movements of the animals between Chiton and the Annapura uh, conservation areas. That means the between the habitat patches, and there will be the genetic assimilations. Next one is the uh, here by the help of the carbon density. Uh, I also under, uh, identify the hot spots of the movement. That is the maximum probability of occurrence of the mammals uh, for this area. And these areas are the possible corridors between the habitat patches. Hence, that is recommend for the conservation or the, for the protection by making the special strategy. And uh, at last, I want to say in the conclusion, before managing the landscape level habitat for the mammals, not only for the leopard, Himalayan black bear, and their prey species, the habitat suitability study is essential so that we know what's the possible areas in this landscape and where we have to manage and we have to manage the habitat for the protections of these uh, animals to that area. And next one is the uh, this 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 is a model study only uh, concentrated to the central parts of the Chiton Annapura landscape. But this type of the study can implement to the other landscape for testing the connectivity. We nowadays we say connectivity about the connectivity, and if the isolated protected areas were connected with via the connectivity, then there is possibility of the increasing of viable populations of the animals to that area. Therefore, this study is uh, uh, provide the baseline information for the uh, managers as well as the for the coming uh, researchers. Thank you. Thank you very much for your attention and sorry for the technical uh, interrupt. Uh, thank you very much, uh, ji. Uh, it was a pleasure uh, listening to you. Uh, Co-author Professor uh, um, Tej Thapa is also joined. I believe he is now there. Uh, we welcome him also. Uh, can I uh, can I open the floor for the discussion now, uh, Professor Skan? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, the floor is open for questions. For me, it looks like very technical presentation, but has a conservation meaning uh, in the uh, upwards and downward altitudinal uh, and horizontal uh, movement. So with this, uh, I open floor for the question answer session. If there's anything, I will sum up at the last. Uh, you can you can start questions by raising hand or uh, you can put question in chat also whatever way is uh, uh, is better for you anyone please dr yesvir Bhatnagar is also in the list uh, thank you dr yesvir uh, you linked uh, me with uh, the organizer professor skand uh, that's why we are here to present uh, along with few other colleagues from Nepal. My pleasure, uh, Jamak Chak uh, Saab. You know, I mean, it's such a pleasure to see you after such a long time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please can continue. Yes. If there's any questions or uh, any supplementation from Professor Tej, Some of the names are familiar to me, like Dr. Tiger Sange. Uh, I don't know if I recall uh, the same person I met uh, probably when I was working in the government. Uh, well, uh, it, I, I don't see any hand raise or any chat. So can I supplement what uh, 
the presentation was made or professor thapa tej thapa would you like to supplement something uh, uh thank you dr zamak uh, uh nothing to say from my side actually <laughs> uh, it was uh, presented by jagannath ji uh, it is one of the most important uh, corridor that connect lowland to mountain area and government of nepal has declared such type of corridor uh, but it was still to be validated what is the functionality of the corridor jagannath did uh, that okay thank you yeah it was very excellent in terms of the action as i said previously uh, we are waiting if there is any questions if not then i will supplement something and then probably hand over it to the uh, organizers sorry for interrupt uh no problem there's no question as of now only uh, professor tej has added something on your work uh for, from my side there is no question uh it looks like uh, there is some connectivity for some species uh from lowland to upland uh, but for some of the species it looks like the passages are too far for them to cope whereas for the some species it's it's easier like the common leopard Uh, in totality, what if you if I could understood uh, uh, correctly, in totality, the some passages in between are very important to link them from the lowland to uh, uh, the uh, middle and uh, then uh, onwards. Though both the areas are protected, but their protection status is different. Like Chitwan National Park is core protected area, the buffer zone and forest in the buffer zone is protected area, uh, forest part, but the outside buffer zone and uh, other. people area is are uh, having different kind of community forestry uh, and other form of forestry management whereas in the uh, acab area it's a conservation area people uh, joint conservation management system uh, though there also in the community forestry another type of forestry has got conservation significance but their use of people are also equally allowed uh, by the approved uh, conservation uh, operation plans so with this uh, limitation whatever your work has been done Uh, i would suggest rather to you know make uh, your presentation simpler way to the policy maker later on when you defend your uh, uh, thesis uh, so that our policy maker villagers communities are also able to understand your finding that's not for this case but when you write your paper if our organizer uh, request you later on then also try to narrate uh, some of the points which are easier to be understood by the local user committee levels also maybe a separate paper you would be anyway publishing them so i thank you particularly i was uh, i was able to learn a lot of things from your presentation uh, though i worked in chitun but not in anupurna uh, but the work, the way the work as you did with the able uh, professor like uh, the, the professor tej thapa we are we were sure that your uh, outcomes from these works are going to be very useful and that's what indicated in this today's presentation So with this note, uh, I am able about to conclude the session. Unless there is any questions or any charts raised so far, uh, if not, then uh, it's all from my side, uh, Professor Iskan. I again thank you for giving me this opportunity, including yesterday's presentation. And today, because uh, Dr. Espir is also here, so I would like to reiterate again. The for me, it looks like you know the combination of biodiversity. and uh, this uh, the natural history was together in the workshop it's a mix up but sometime and mix up in the same session for some people may not uh, be so easy to digest so only one remarks if i have to made uh, today is to let's try to have a biodiversity sessions in at least half a session or one session so that the participant of those sector would love to join for half day or whole day whereas other days can have a other theme with this note only i i hope you don't mind for this uh, i will close from my side and i would like to see the face of dr s bear i couldn't see you only your mountain pictures are there <laughs> wow <laughs> here i am <laughs> thank you very much <laughs> still keeping those no. posts which is not long like previous <laughs> yeah but greer okay thank you very much uh, for linking this Thank sure. you. With, uh, yeah. With this, uh, it's all uh, from my side, uh, Professor Scon. Ah, uh, yes, sir. Thank you, uh, Doctor Jhamak uh, Karki, sir. Uh, given uh, time for uh, share the session in this international webinar, and uh, uh, Doctor Jagannath Adhikari, 
sir, for uh, uh, giving a nice talk in this webinar, especially uh, National Park of Nepal. Uh, so, uh, all of you, thank you, sir, Dr. Tej Bahadur, uh, Professor Tej Bahadur Thapa, sir, uh, um, Professor of Trihuvan University. Uh, thank you, sir, uh, for a given time. Uh, uh, for this uh, session. Thank you, all of you. Thank you. Have a nice day for the remaining uh, part of the days. Uh, I think this is the last day also. <laughs> uh, now, uh, no, tomorrow also, sir. Uh, oh, so okay. In one day, uh, four talk, uh, about four talk uh, on archaeological field. One, uh, two very important talk, uh, Professor Shokat from Lahore, you know, uh, head archaeology department, Architecture Department, University of Lahore, and one Mr. Mohan Dev Raj, or one uh, talk on Swat Valley uh, from Pakistan, and one from uh, India, uh, Nangpur. Uh, so uh, now next uh, talk, our eminent chairperson, Dr. S. Veer Bhatnagar, senior scientist, Nature Conservation Foundation, Mysore, Karnataka. Co chairperson, Dr. Kanchan Thapa. Yes, sir. Kanchan Thapa. Conservation biologist, WWF Nepal. And uh, our uh, eminent speaker, Dr. Sang Sangay Tiger, head and dean, UN Wang Chuk. Institute for Conservation and Environment Research, Lamai Gompa, Bumthang, Bhutan. Uh, welcome, sir. Uh, Dr. Bhatnagar, sir. Uh, Dr. Sanjay, sir. Uh, welcome. And uh, I am refers to Dr. Yashvir Bhatnagar, sir. Please share the session and introduce our eminent speaker, Dr. Sanjay. Thank you, Dr. Mishra. Uh, it is such a uh, pleasure to be back on this uh, webinar. And uh, before proceeding, I must compliment you again uh, that uh, um, this is perhaps the only such uh, global seminar within India. And this year, you have expanded to our neighboring countries. So uh, many congratulations are due to you and your entire team. Uh, and uh, with that, again, I have a uh, I mean, great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Tiger Sange. Uh, Tiger Sange is among the foremost conservationists in Bhutan. And he has one, uh, worked for his PhD on one of my favorite species, perhaps one of the species which is least known in the Himalaya. Uh, it is the Takin, and uh, he has done a PhD. Very few people uh, have actually seen Takin, and he has a PhD on that. So. It's an amazing effort. Um, he gets the name Tiger Sange because he was very passionate about tigers when he began his career. And it has it is a name which has almost become official uh, in his uh, name. And I think even in the government, uh, everybody knows him as Tiger Sange. Yeah. So it is something which uh, he started off. Uh, he has a PhD, master's and PhD from uh, the University of New England, Australia. And uh, he has, um, uh, he's working in the Ogin Wangchuk Institute for Conservation and Environmental Research, a government organization which is promoting research. And his core area of uh, interest is, of course, um, uh, capacity enhancement and outreach uh, to uh, the, the stakeholders in, uh, in uh, Bhutan. So I think uh, the introduction will take more time. But, uh, you know, given that this is an interesting topic and he's going to introduce us to some amazing facets of conservation. And I'm sure part of the audience will be surprised to know the kind of advances that uh, Bhutan has been able to make in conservation. Everything from species to innovative ways of fundraising and sustaining conservation programs. So, uh, Kanchan Thapaji, if you are there, um, uh, welcome to you also. I think we'll uh, hand over to uh, Tiger now to continue. 
Tiger, Tiger. Oh, oh, oh. 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 Is that a It is not from my machine. So like uh, may I uh, I think what has happened is that there is uh, that you are logged in I can see two logins. Yes. Yes. So maybe there is another machine which is on. So you can just mute the other machine. Okay, yeah, sure. sure. Okay. Uh, are you audible? Yes, yes. Sorry. Are you audible now? Hello? Yes, yes. Uh, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Hello. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> Can somebody tell me whether you can hear me or not? Hi. Yes. Yes, sir. Hello. Oh, my goodness. Dr. Sangai. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Can yes, somebody sir. give me a thumbs up? I yes. No, it's not. I am, sir. I am. Okay, sir. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, good afternoon. Let me uh, first uh, thank uh, Dr. Yashmi for uh, introducing to the audience. And I would like to thank uh, Professor Kant Mishra for inviting me to talk uh, on the conservation uh, efforts in, the, uh, in, the, in my country, and uh, which is a very uh, 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 the topic that I love uh, very much, you know. And uh, I'll be talking about, uh, but since this is an international uh, webinar, I thought I will also introduce. Uh, about Bhutan to the audiences here. Uh, so, so my, my talk uh, will be on the uh, Kingdom of Bhutan and its nature conservation efforts. Uh, so, so I'm, I'm sure most of you, uh, all of you, uh, know where Bhutan is. Uh, we are a landlocked uh, country uh, on the southern slope of the Himalayan uh, mountain range uh, with an area of uh, 38,000 Three hundred and ninety-four square kilometer. Uh, but the astonishing thing that we have is we have an altitude range uh, that goes from uh, eighty meters to over seven thousand meters above sea level. And within that, uh, we have um, precipitation ranging from fifty centimeter to like five meters uh, of uh, precipitation. So that gives rise to the you know, uh, the biodiversity in the country. Uh, the political, we are a constitutional monarchy since uh, 2008. The head of the state is uh, His Majesty the King Jigme Wangchuk. The head of the state, uh, head of the government is uh, His Excellency uh, Prime Minister Lin Chiu. Ching. We have 20 districts divided into 47 constituencies, you know, and then uh, 105 districts governed by elected leaders. The socio-political leaders' uh, conditions of the country also plays an uh, important role in the conservation effort because we have a, a conservation-minded leaders and a very strong Buddhist ethics, you know, which, uh, um, which supports the uh, the conservation in the country. Then we have a legal instrument uh, acts and rules and regulation that also assist uh, that are contributing to the conservation. Uh, uh, work that we have done here in the country. As regards uh, people, we are a small population of like uh, seven and seven and seven hundred and sixty-three thousand people, uh, predominant aggregate society. 
the density of the population is about 19 people uh, square kilometer. The urban uh, dwellers are like uh, one third of the population, and uh, rest are like lives in a rural area uh, on a subsistence uh, farming. The amazing thing is uh, we have 26% uh, of the population under 14 years of age, and uh, that's the good dividend that we have. But if you talk about conservation, then that's the challenge that uh, we will be having in the in, in years to come. Bhutan is also the last numeric. We also have a last numeric hurdle. Uh, you should uh, see the picture on the top two top. Uh, Teachers are from you know, our nomadic uh, herders uh, from Merak Sapeng and Aya, you know. And these are also the last nomadic herders because uh, now, uh, with the good connection of road, uh, the, the, the people are changing fast and, and um, they are opting to you know, uh, do away with herding, you know, uh, nomadic, live a life of nomadic herders. So culturally, as I was saying, we have a Buddhist, we are a Buddhist and uh, we have a pre-Buddhist uh, belief and ethos which respects all forms of life and the interconnected connectedness of the life forms, uh, the birth and the uh, rebirth and all those things, you know. And uh, then we also have a pre-Buddhist belief, like you know, believing uh, mountains, uh, revering lakes. Uh, sacred groves, you know, and all those have also contributed to the conservation uh, in, in the country. The economic, uh, we are, our GDP is about 2.5 billion USD, uh, which uh, comes to about uh, uh, 3,300 3, uh, per capita, you know. Uh, and uh, see, as I was saying, we are dependent on agriculture for livelihood. The main source of economic revenue of the government are hydropower and tourism. But uh, with the COVID, uh, uh, the tourism has dropped up uh, as on minus I think, 90%. Uh, and now uh, the government has opened up since uh, September, uh, the government, government has opened up the, opened up the country for the tourism, and we have been getting few tourists. Uh, Biodiversity, uh, we are a quite diverse uh, country. Uh, we straddle between the two biogeographic things of Pilatric in the north and Intermalane in the south. And we have over uh, 200 mammal species, 770 bird species, and about 5,400 personal plants. And a very diverse system, you know, in the uh, remember, I told you about the altitudinal range that we have from 80 to like 7,000. Within that, we have uh, a diverse ecosystem. You know? And uh, then we have 72.5% uh, of the country uh, under forest cover, of which uh, uh, then we have 51.4% of, uh, of the country as a protected area system. So we have uh, five national park, four wildlife sanctuaries, and one strict nature reserve. And Bhutan is also considered as the biodiversity hotspot. We have uh, some of the good uh, intact habitat for most of these species, you know, in the Eastern Himalayan uh, regions. And we are also a very important uh, bird area. Uh, for example, uh, our institute, we host uh, uh, nature guide courses here. And within a month in the field, uh, it was amazing when, the, when our participants were able to see about 317 bird species. I think that's quite, quite a remarkable you know, uh, to see within a span of like one month. This slide, I'm going to show some of the important faunal species of Paleatic as well as Indian Malian nature. Uh, we have snow leopard, um, red panda, tuckin. Uh, black neck monal pheasant, and blights uh, tragopan, or you know, uh, Indo Malay. We character we have uh, tigers, uh, elephant, hare, goat leopard. But, but Bhutan, Bhutan is also one of the country where we have uh, three top predators uh, overlapping their habitat in Jipin Dolce National Park: tiger, snow leopard, and common leopard. You know, they all share in that uh, uh, national park. Um, 
the one of the uh, Bhutan is also Bhutan also has a six of the nineteenth uh, Eastern Himalayan ecoregion. You know, uh, then uh, all the three Eastern Himalayan global two hundred uh, ecoregion like uh, Eastern Himalayan alpine meadows, Eastern Himalayan broadleaf and conifer forest, and Tarai or savanna and you know grasslands are also uh, quite adequately represented in our country. Uh, Sangeet sir, can you hear me? The conservation policy, uh, the uh, one of the most important uh, conservation policy that we have is is to maintain at least fifty percent of the forest you know, of the land under forest cover, and it is also uh, reflected in our constitution. Uh, very important conservation policies that we have. Then uh, the sustainable utilization of biological resources for economic. Uh, socioeconomic development. Uh, anything that we do here, uh, it's uh, on the basis of you know sustainable utilization. Then we also incorporate all uh, for, for park management the integrated conservation and development. Um, uh, uh, is it uh, is the not shifting? I thought I thought it's going. No. Okay. Your slide is moving. Yeah. Then uh, we, we also, also follow up very uh, important uh, uh, involving people because in Bhutan, the national park, our national park have uh, people living inside, and we have to follow the participatory approach to the conservation. So we engage uh, people, local people, in every conservation. Uh, activities that we do within the park and the less entities. <clears throat> so the one commitment, as I think, we were committed to maintain sixty percent of the forest cover for perpetuity, and uh, conservation-oriented development policy. You know, the so-called gross national happiness. One of the pillars of this is the environmental conservation. One of the four pillars of the gross national happiness is environmental conservation. So protected area covers about 42.71% uh, of the country. And uh, that, because uh, earlier, uh, I'll also talk about the, the evolution of the protected area system in the country later. So, uh, and we had to redesign those protected areas so that we have a good uh, biological and, and the Bhutan's ecosystem representation, you know, and uh, that's why we came up with uh, then later, uh, we also uh, were very mindful in uh, considering the last conservation strategies. You know, that's the time when we uh, got in the biological corridor. You know, actually, this was gifted as a gift to the earth from the people of Bhutan in 1999, when we were celebrating the silver jubilee of the uh, fourth king's reign, His Majesty the King James II, fourth reign, fourth uh, uh, his. Uh, Rain or uh, silver jubilee. So this is the uh, protected area system. You know, earlier we had uh, northern, you know, all the northern landscape, you know, uh, from uh, west to east, and then a few pockets in the south. And they used to consider it as the northern wildlife circle and the southern wildlife circle. And uh, during that time, it was uh, the it didn't cover the biological representative you know, of the country. That's why you know we had to redo the uh, the protected area system, you know, and that's why we came up with this uh, in 1993. So we have uh, in in this we have uh, four national park, four wildlife, and one strict nature reserve. And then later uh, in 1999, as I was saying, you know, we uh, this also came from the work that we did uh, on, on tiger uh, conservation, you know. So uh, we saw tigers outside protected areas, and then we thought it's very important landscape uh, that we need to conserve it. That's how the idea of biological corridor came in, and uh, and then uh, and then we gifted it as a gift to the earth from the people of Bhutan in 1999. So, and in in 2008, uh, we were celebrating the centennial uh, uh, monarch centennial celebration and. Uh, we added one national park. We call it as a one centennial national park. Uh, 
um, at uh, bit, uh, one in the in between that uh, dark uh, color. You know, and that is the uh, Wangchuk uh, Wang Centennial National Park. Now, as of now, we have uh, 42.71 percent under protected area system, which will uh, include five national parks, four wildlife centers, and one strict nature reserve. An additional of 8.61 percent of the biological corridor connecting all the uh, national parks and wildlife centuries in the country. <clears throat> so I, I wanted to take you back a bit. Uh, this is the key achievement from the Tiger Conservation Project uh, that I was uh, fortunate to work um, uh, in my uh, earlier career. So uh, one of the the key achievement is you know, a declaration of 90% of the uh, country as a biological corridors. And uh, the benefit of having a small population is uh, it, it's uh, easy for us to you know, extend, expand the uh, two protected areas. So we also uh, expanded uh, single national park from 768 square kilometer to 905 square kilometer that is to include the tiger habitat you know in some of the south as well as, as well as uh, we expanded the bombay wildlife century in the far east from 1182 to like 1545 square kilometers so uh, the the idea the the uh, the idea of uh, biological corridor came through this you know if you look at this map you can see a dot and these dots are sometimes outside the protected areas and that's why you know we said these are very important landscape that we got to protect it and that's how the idea of biological corridor came in you know through the tiger distribution outside protected areas so then uh, we declared it as the uh, gift to the earth but uh, we were also mindful of our economic dependence you know uh, remember i told you uh, we heavily depend on government revenue from the hydropower so hydropower requires conservation of forest cover that's very important and then uh, we also are very mindful of people's dependent on forest resources as well as forest cover to prevent uh, soil erosion because we are a mountainous country you know 95% uh, of the country is like above 600 uh, meters you know uh, you know if you look at uh, the altitude you know so that's why uh, because of our economic dependence, it was also uh, uh, it was making sense to declare it, uh, declare this landscape as the biological corridor and save it, you know, uh, for our benefit. So, uh, but the biological corridor is also globally important biodiversity. You know, it has a biodiversity like tigers, uh, and it also enhances. The, the tiger movement, for example, one uh, our tigers in Royal Mars Manas National Park uh, was uh, uh, camera captured in Jimmy Dodge National Park in, in like uh, 3,000, 4,000 meters from like in 80 uh, meters of sea level. You know? So that connected, we have, uh, we, have uh, we got secured, you know, and we have started in, in this, uh, in, in uh, landscape. Then some of the important global, uh, you know, uh, population are like we have Rufus neck, hornbill, uh, white bellied, you know, very critical, critically endangered bird. So uh, you might uh, think that this is a. Oh, I had a video here, but <laughs> sorry about, about that. that. I can't. I don't know why it's not playing. Just really, just yeah, just. Uh, it's, it's not, not playing. playing. So, 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 no, often, often uh, when, we, when we get this kind of picture, people think that, that this is a tiger from like Paris, uh, you know, Paris, Russia. Russia. No, it's not. Uh, uh, it's, it's the camera trap uh, image that we got uh, from Jimmy Miller National Park. Then, then uh, very, very uh, in 2015, 2015, we did a national, did a national uh, uh, nationwide, nationwide tiger, tiger survey, survey and and, uh, and analyze it through you know spatial capture recapture and we found that uh, 
have a tiger density of 2.0.24 tigers every 100 square kilometer uh, in the country. And that uh, makes up to like 103 tigers in the country. And uh, one of our colleagues, uh, he also did a genetic study, you know, and uh, he found out that uh, in, in our in our South Asian, you know, the, in our within our Royal Bengal tiger, the 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 genetic uh, inbreeding pressure has set in, and uh, the heterozygosity is like less than 0.7. But our tigers uh, are, you know, about uh, uh, about uh, point, 0 0.75, uh, you know, the zygosity, heterozygosity. It's uh, much higher than the uh, the most tiger population in the uh, Indian subcontinent. Then uh, our forest regime. Uh, uh, <clears throat> We have uh, the forest, uh, different forest types, you know, the, uh, the protected area system, then state forest, then your slide is not seen. Involving people in the management of our forests. So we have community forest. Uh, give me a second, sorry. What is this? I'm I'm sorry about this. Uh, uh, okay, uh, I was I was just talking about the forest and management regimes in the in the country. Uh, so we have state forest, and then uh, we have uh, protected areas in Bali corridor, which makes up about uh, 51 percent. Then we have so-called forest management unit and working scheme, uh, from which we source the timber requirement of the country. But uh, the important thing. We have the uh, the community uh, forestry. You know? uh, we are involving people in managing this, uh, this this community forestry, and it adds value to uh, the management regime because we, most of the community forests are uh, within uh, the vicinity, the in close proximity to the community uh, area. You know, uh, in the village or you know, and that helps. To protect uh, our forest from, you know, forest fire, unnecessary forest fire, and all those things. So that is uh, an additional uh, thing that we have done, and using participation. Uh... <clears throat> and then, uh, as I was saying, uh, we have a very uh, low population, uh, nineteen uh, person per square kilometer. So as you can see from our map here, uh, those. Those uh, so dots, dots are, are the human, human settlements. You know, the each each, uh, each dot is each like dot a household, like a household uh, in, in the country, in the country distributed country. across the country. So that, uh, so we, that can, uh, we can then uh, visualize, uh, visualize the, the, you know, the you know the impact on the on the forest uh, from this. From this uh, but when, when I was when in, I was uh, in tiger, uh, tiger Conservation Project, we also looked at the forest cover change uh, using, uh, using GIS, GIS you know, and, and remote and remote sensing technology. technology. So. Uh, so uh, I, I want to tell the, the audience here that, that, uh, that uh, Tan has, Tan has stopped, stopped uh, exporting any timber, timber, timber in, in, in a, form, in a, form, in a lock, in form, lock form from 2000. From 2000. And then, and uh, then uh, yes, 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 we. Yes, we. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we. Do you have any? Do you have any? Hello, hello. I hope I'm, I hope I'm, I'm, I'm audible. audible. And, and uh, uh, then we then looked we at, looked uh, at uh, the, the layers, layers from, from 1999, 1999 and then 2004, 2004 and then, then looked, looked at change. change. 
But uh, we, uh, found we found out that, that uh, we have, we have uh, uh, um, <clears throat> we found out that uh, in in uh, in far east uh, south southeast, you know. Uh, uh, we got uh, cover, uh, land cover, forest cover change because that is primarily because uh, earlier we used to do uh, slash and burn, you know, uh, practices in that uh, area and uh, government has banned those. And then that has, uh, uh, we got, uh, we got the, we got the uh, forest cover back in that area. So the conservation threat is uh, unsustainable fuel wood harvest, uh, especially in the high altitude, you know, uh, ecosystem, because um, Bhutan uh, is a uh, is in a very cold place. But uh, more than that, we have people uh, who are going to the mountains to collect those uh, cordyceps, you know, and uh, and and that images from there, uh, and uh, those people. Uh, are not very aware of how long does that uh, rhododendron, you know, took to grow. You know, for example, one of our colleagues studied uh, the uh, looking at the tree ring, and he found out that a, a 11 centimeter dia rhododendron took 110 years to grow, whereas these people they just cut it in like a minute, you know, and not very aware of what, how long does uh, that that rhododendron took to grow, you know, and 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 it is also very important for Bhutan because that's the that's very important for our freshwater ecosystem. You know, when we get a snow, uh, then those snow due to the heaviness it goes underneath the and and the rhododendron gives a very good shade and it slowly melts and infiltrates into our soil system and comes out uh, somewhere as the spring water. So uh, people are not aware of such uh, such dynamics, you know. And then uh, forest clearing is for agriculture is another uh, problem. Although we have uh, more, just uh, more than three percent of the country's uh, land area under uh, agriculture, but uh, but you know, the clearing forest for uh, for agriculture. In, in this uh, in this kind of landscape is quite uh, quite a threat also and then the other one is the overgrazing of livestock you know in Bhutan we have uh, so-called free ranging grazing system you know uh, people can let loose uh, their cattle and let it go to the forest and you know graze so that is also not helping uh, the conservation so and we consider it as a conservation threat. So this is uh, the talking uh, uh, that uh, Yashpir mentioned about. Uh, I did my uh, study looking at the the movement uh, ecology of this animal, but uh, the the slide the slide that I am trying to show is uh, because in two thousand eight uh, we had uh, we had uh, it it was a big challenge for you know uh, for for us you know. Because uh, the the migration route of this tuckin, they were thinking of putting in a, a, a structure, tourism, ecotourism structure there, you know, and uh, and then uh, if they had if they put that structure in there, then this would disrupt the the migration of the tuckin, you know. Uh, so the developmental activity uh, in in the prime prime conservation area is also a threat, you know, and uh, it's. Uh, but in that area, in that area, we have uh, hot spring, and uh, hot spring is uh, in particularly for the local tourism. Hot spring is a big thing, you know, and uh, we get especially during winter when the the crop farming is lean. Uh, then people come and you know uh, uh, come to the hot spring and enjoy those uh, such facilities. So. Uh, like uh, everywhere in in the world uh, human wildlife conflict is another threat uh, so i was just uh, googling uh, on on our national newspaper and i saw so many headings of human wildlife conflict reported and uh, the annual estimate uh, monetary value for the crop damage by wild boar itself is like 112 million you know uh, not to forget we have another uh, 
uh, thread. Uh, this is a paper that I wrote for my master's degree and uh, uh, looking at the livestock depredation cases in across the country, you know, and we also can compared it with the Nepal data and, and uh, it looks similar. So we have uh, livestock depredation cases uh, across the country, uh, rightly so, because uh, the landscape that we are in is not uh, uh, optimal habitat for the predators. So I think our livestock is substituting the, you know, the uh, predation of uh, food for the predator, our predators. Some of the uh, other conservation threats are like habitat loss, uh, extraction of resources and forest fires. So I think uh, I don't have to explain, but uh, we, uh, everybody knows this, uh, this, these things. But uh, this one, uh, the conservation threat from road construction is also uh, one of, one of uh, a concern here in Bhutan because we are a mountainous and when we, when the government awards uh, contract, they say uh, they will build it like eco-friendly road. Uh, but uh, when the, uh, when the construction takes longer time than expected, then people, then the contractor doesn't mind, you know, throwing the debris uh, just uh, off the road and, you know, and then whole ecosystem is disturbed. And the, the long period of road construction is also obstructing or disrupting the migration. For example, uh, I was working in this area where uh, Takin migrate and, you know, uh, we see, and that road construction has been going on for quite some time and that has disrupted the animal movement. So the, the, the total number of uh, length of road in the country is about 18,000 square kilo, uh, kilometer, you know, Length and then we also have hydropower transmission grid running. You know, especially when we have this hydrogen uh, hydropower transmission line, we have to clear it uh, as a right of way, and uh, that is also uh, a threat to the conservation. So the the global warming is a big thing. Uh, Bhutan is uh, grappling with this uh, threat. Uh, because we have uh, 677 glaciers and you know 2674 2, glacial lakes which are receding at uh, 20 to 30 meters annually and uh, of which uh, 25 are potentially very dangerous uh, because uh, uh, the last glow that we had was in 1994 uh, which uh, wreck havoc uh, in the uh, lower valleys. You know, even our monuments, uh, the the Punakha Zong here uh, was um, damaged. So this is the, uh, the 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 glacial lake that uh, some of the examples of glacial lake uh, in the northern in, in the north. Then uh, the demand for resources, right? Uh, as I was saying, uh, 60 or two thirds of our populations are rural, uh, live in rural area and they have to get uh, resources, right? And, but in order to ease uh, these resources, we have uh, uh, 839 community forests uh, involving uh, 36,000 households, uh, which makes up, makes up to like, uh, uh, 30 30 percent of the household in the king, king, kingdom and uh, that has led to you know th 1090 square kilometer uh, as as the as the community forestry you know which represent four percent of the uh, forest area in of the country so these are managed by the community forestry and trying to get resource from from within these community forestry the 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 one uh, challenges that we have is the the rapid economic growth. You know, uh, if you look at the uh, lower uh, right hand side, that was uh, how it was uh, 20, 20 years before. Now that's uh, that become that's like a, a big city there. So we are losing uh, uh, our uh, paddy field. You know, uh, for rapid economic development, you know, and the economic development gaining uh, more priority, you know. And then uh, changing lifestyle is another one uh, because uh, now uh, 
uh, they, the farmers often tell us that uh, they lose uh, they lose their their crop to the life uh, crop to the animals and you know they no longer wanted to you know do a farming so there is a change in uh, lifestyle so people uh, uh, we have been experiencing rural urban migration you know uh, in in the country and that is also not helping uh, is also is also a challenge uh, for conservation <clears throat> Sorry, I think I lost. Okay. <clears throat> The, the plight of uh, our rural uh, dwellers, uh, because they, they make a living in a steep terrain, uh, the agriculture production or productivity is very low, they have no access to market, you know, and, uh, and, and they use like outdated technologies, you know, uh, to farm and, you know, and uh, often they don't have uh, electricity facilities, although uh, government is trying hard to you know provide electricity to all the rural population and uh, now the communication facilities uh, are doing better uh, we have quite a good uh, mobile coverage uh, even in the rural area but uh, these are some of the you know plights of the rural farmer farmer and and then you know uh, they they wanted to leave that uh, uh, living you know and then come to the rural, urban area and you know clog the you know urban area so that's also one of the challenge that we have faced the one of the the challenge uh, conservation challenge is the lack of trained manpower although uh, we, you know, we have been getting lots of uh, people uh, uh, qualified people but uh, we still have uh, a train lack of trained manpower and 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 uh, i think we are like the first generation of wildlife biologists uh, who, who do the, who does this kind of uh, work and the lack of baseline information for most of these species you know although uh, we have conducted uh, nationwide tiger survey using camera trap uh, i think that's a big uh, data set that we have but uh, we have not been able to capitalize it you know uh, and and make an informed decision from there and uh, some of the policies and decisions are based on the you know, leaders, uh, uh, visionary leaders, not necessarily on the empirical uh, data. You know, so that's uh, one of the challenges that we have. But uh, the some of the conservation opportunities are, you know, we have a very intact, contiguous forest and ecological communities. One. And then we have this protected area system and biological functioning biological corridors, you know, uh, already designated and functioning. And uh, <clears throat> and then we also, you know, have to Bhutan also depend heavily on economic dependent on you know hydropower tourism, forestry, agriculture, you know, and which requires environmental and biodiversity conservation. So that's the opportunities on the other side of the. The, the other op opportunity is the economic policies linked to the conservation of environment and natural resources. So then the, the uh, then the cultural and religion religious tradition that respect and emphasize environment, animal and forest, you know, uh, it's an opportunity for us. Population, the small population, uh, less than a million is also and uh, an and added advantage uh, for Bhutan in, in conservation. Then institutional capacity within the government to implement conservation. Uh, so we, uh, uh, we have uh, quite a few uh, conservation uh, NGOs uh, which are helping the government uh, to develop uh, this uh, and, and implement the conservation uh, projects in the country. So the, the 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 expected conservation outcome is, you know, as we, I was saying, uh, Bhutan has committed to maintain 60% of the country under forests in all times to come. Uh, it is also reflected in the constitution of the country. So we have to, and we hope that we'll achieve this, you know, and 
and to have a successful conservation of biodiversity. Bhutan uh, is recognized as the bio biodiversity, and rightly so, because uh, I, I always tell my international students when they come here uh, that Bhutan is the uh, living laboratory, you know. Uh, you drive from Thimphu to like, you know, uh, Pelela, so you will see a change in biodiversity, you know, the, the ecosystem change, because you'll be driving from like uh, 1,400 meters to like uh, 3,000 meters. So then you can see the change in forest and ecosystem and biome and all those things. So uh, <clears throat> it's very important that we do this so that we uh, you know, we have uh, we, we protect those biodiversity. An intact watershed and catchment is also very important. As I was saying, we are heavily dependent on hydropower for uh, government's uh, revenue. Revenue comes from there. And uh, flooding, you know, uh, so stop down river. So including, we wanted to also, you know, uh, by uh, uh, by doing logging extensively here would mean that uh, we would uh, be having lots of flood and erosion and that will also trouble the the the, the uh, our neighbors you know in, in uh, southern neighbors <clears throat> so government uh, revenue we also expect to increase the government revenue from hydropower ecotourism and eco uh, economic empowerment uh, bhutan uh, as a as a educational institute here uh, we also do lots of uh, uh, tourism development kind of thing. You know, we have been implementing lots of uh, nature guide uh, trainings here in order to uh, promote Bhutan as a ecotourism destination. You know, so uh, then the, to enhance the aesthetic, cultural, and religious value of the country. So Bhutan wanted to, uh, as we are as we are recognized uh, by the world as the the global hotspot. We wanted to be a be a world leader in conservation, so that's what we are expecting. And carbon is a is is a big thing. Uh, we are a carbon uh, neutral or, or rather negative uh, country in the in the world. The only uh, carbon negative uh, country in the world. So uh, I have uh, brought you through this. Uh, uh conservation on a journey uh and uh, hope i have made uh, uh i have made an effort to you know talk to you about the conservation in in our country and uh been able to tell you the stories uh, that uh, i thought uh, is worth uh, uh telling uh to to the to the webinar here and uh we must i think uh, every Generation must uh, strive to live up to the greatness of our forefathers. Even with the least technology, they have been able to protect and you know conserve the the, the environment that we enjoy now. And uh, hope uh, with the better technology and you know uh, science, we will be able to protect this and take it further and then hand it over to our future generation. I always tell uh, uh, my colleagues and my students, uh, international, particularly international students, whether you do conservation here in our country or in other parts of the world, we have just one world and we have to cherish and protect as much as possible for our future generations. And uh, <clears throat> so this is the quote uh, from, uh, from our fourth king, uh, His Majesty Jimmy Singh Wang Chu. And, uh, these uh, Bhutan's attitude to attitude and philosophy to a nature and why Bhutan's forests, its animal birds are important part of our, uh, uh, our uh, nation. And uh, with this, I thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, pleasure indeed. Um, but I, I think um, uh, Tiger is probably still unable to um, uh, hear us. Uh, Tiger, can you hear us? Uh, 
I, I can't hear you. Um, so everybody else, uh, I think um, uh, Tiger is still not able to hear us. So let me just try to get that resolved and then we can go to the question answer session. <laughs> yeah. Um, Uh, can you hear us now? No. Uh, can you hear us now? I think we, we, we can uh, raise our question in chat and then we can hear so we can respond, see if he's respond from his uh, uh, voice. No, but it will be really unfortunate. If... <laughs> uh, now, uh, can you hear? Uh... Yes. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, wow. Professor Satya Narayana, some questions you want to know. Yes, sir. Uh, can I speak to? Yes, it's now. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Tiger. You are giving a very good presentation on Bhutan. Uh, I'm very fortunate among the audience that uh, I worked from Jalasba of India for four years in Bhutan. That was during 1982 to 85, when, when uh, His Majesty Jigme Singh Wangchuk was the king. That was something about 35 years ago. What a beautiful country, serene country, uh, totally hilly country, peaceful country, Buddhist country, or not. But uh, those days, uh, I remember we were working from Samchi, that was in the, on the Bengal border in India, that is on the western side of the Bhutan. And uh, I worked out there in the, uh, worked out there for limestone deposits, for, uh, and also, uh, that is in the Ha and Paro area, that is where that uh, first airport was built at Paro. Incidentally, we know, and we went to the house of the then industries minister, Mr. Dorji. In fact, at seeing us, seeing the geologist from Jirajka Surah India, he invited to his house. Uh, that was a mourning period. Uh, his father expired, but still we spent, would spend a, about an hour we had a TV team also, very well known to our GSI uh, officers. Then I worked in even in Sarbang area for a uh, tungsten deposit and also in Gilfu area, interior, Gonkola, that is a copper deposit where we have proved we have to go by, go for about 40, 40, 45 kilometers by walk or by helicopter, which used to come to our advanced camps in that is uh, to either to make supply frequently so that is uh, i want to uh, i want to say that uh, a lot of things have improved over a period of time those days even the chuka project was under construction i remember our geologists used to be there as a consultants uh, 
these are some of the nostalgic memories even traveling from punchling to thimphu very interesting very interesting uh, one may feel uh, that uh, the vehicle may fall down mm-hmm. sometimes the uh, road is to be very narrow but uh, things must have improved i would like to see again the country uh, because after 35 years uh, if a chance comes thank you mr tiger very much thank you very much sir for those kind words uh, really appreciate and thank you for your service to our country a uh, long time back i think those that that time i was in like high school <laughs> thank you yeah. very much for serving i i was doubting whether you were born or not <laughs> <laughs> dr karki uh, only to uh, say very much thank you uh, dr sange uh, some of the comparison in your uh, presentation you made uh, with nepal on conflict of course the our altitude areas and the conflict nature are similar so things are already similar i had also got an opportunity to see thimpu in one of the workshop organized by isi mod when i was in government and travel some of the areas in bhutan maybe a one day or so uh, maybe the 4000 meter uh, ridge which we cross probably is one of the ridge where Uh, our late uh, dr prarad yunjan when he when he served to bhutan they say that the tiger first uh, climbing up to that altitude was reported so uh, i thank you for your work and contribution and very extensive presentation ranging from so many conservation initiatives so i learn a lot in fact updated a lot and congratulate for the remaining works that you and government is doing thank you very much thank you very much sir thank you karki ji any other questions or comments no question only one point i would like to say please sir that since morning 10 o'clock i have been waiting for this bhutan lecture but some of it so i'm not blaming the organizers <laughs> or dr sena or dr yamishra that sometimes it happens it's okay but morning first lecture was on kujraha also excellent excellent and i'm sure you must be happy with the uh, with the bait sir i mean it is uh, it was a very remarkable presentation by yeah. uh, dr sange yeah and so if um, uh, uh, dr mishra is uh, kanchan here yes sir maine unko kai baar sir message kiya hai acha 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 theek hai wo agar nahi hai to वो वो चेयर पर्सन थे पर हमको लगता है वो देख नहीं पाए प्रोग्राम को ठीक और मैंने दो तीन बार उनके व्हाट्सएप में मैंने मैसेज भी किया नो इश्यूज नो इश्यूज नो इश्यूज और मैंने कॉल भी किया पर कॉल उठा नहीं शायद कोई इशू होगा हां कोई चक्कर नहीं है सो इज देयर एनी अदर अभी 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 हाजिर रफान सर जुड़े हुए हैं मलेशिया से हैं अच्छा हां बढ़िया ये मलायन टाइगर के स्पेशलिस्ट हैं सर इनका टॉक था यहाँ पे एक्सलेंट एक्सलेंट यस सर सर कुछ कहना चाहते हैं सर नहीं हम ये कह रहे थे कि इसको अगर और कुछ नहीं है तो हम क्लोज कर सकते हैं रफान साहब को एनी क्वेश्चन रफान सर हजर रफान सर हेलो ही आई थिंक का कनेक्शन ठीक नहीं है ही हेज लेफ्ट द मीटिंग ओके ठीक है सो आई आई जस्ट ट्राई टू आई मीन सो बेसिकली टाइगर सांगे साहब यू कैन हियर अस नो यस यस आई कैन क्लियरली बट आई हैव अ प्रॉब्लम विद माय कैमरा सो आई पुट इट ऑफ नो नो इश्यूज नो इश्यूज आई मीन आई मीन देयर इज नो डाउट इट वाज अ वेरी रिमार्केबल एंड लाइक झमक मेंशन इट वाज अ वेरी कॉम्प्रिहेंसिव प्रेजेंटेशन and i'm sure uh, the people in this audience and when it is up on um, public uh, forum this this uh, recording i mean will benefit a lot from uh, understanding uh, because i think you know bhutan is maine 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 puri recording ki hai sabhi lectures pure record kiye hain excellent sir to ye jo hai abhi ye google mein bhi dekhe ja sakte hain sir google mein hai aur hamara jo group hai उसमें हम पर्डे का उसमें लोड कर रहे हैं सर नहीं नहीं बढ़िया है सो so, इससे यह है कि आई मीन ऑफ कोर्स कोई भी उसको आगे जैसे लेकर के और ग्रुप में डाल सकते हैं कोई उसमें दिक्कत नहीं इसको शेयर भी कर सकते हैं हाँ हाँ बिल्कुल 
जी जी बिल्कुल एजुकेशनल पॉइंट से है कोई है वो नहीं दिक्कत उसमें बिल्कुल बिल्कुल हाँ वो हर कंट्री के लोग अपने यहाँ कर सकते हैं क्योंकि तो प्रचार प्रसार की का थोड़ा सुविधा हमारे पास कम है <laughs> हमार, हमारे आप ही लोग हैं जो <laughs> नहीं नहीं अपने अपने बहुत रिमार्केबल जैसे मैंने शुरू में कहा कि योर एफर्ट हैज बीन रिमार्केबल एंड रेवा में बैठ करके आई मीन यू हैव मैनेज सच ए शो सच ए सच ए कैंड ऑफ ए कोलेबोरेशन अक्रॉस द मच ऑफ साउथ एशिया सो इट इज अ वेरी वेरी रिमार्केबल थिंग and the fact that it is available to uh, not just academics but other students and all is a very uh, commendable thing uh, dr mishra and of course your team so i would again like to commend that aap logon ka cooperation raha sir na kafi cooperation jo team banti hai wo aage hamare sath madad karti hai ye acha hai aapne bhi sir bahut acche acche humko speaker diye aur unke through fir humne aur bhi liye nahi nahi bahut acha hai ji तो बस इसमें मैं मैं कंक्लूडिंग उसमें यही कहूंगा कि आई मीन टाइगर साहब ने जो है अपना पूरा कॉन्टेक्स दिया है कंट्री के कंजर्वेशन का पूरे अपने जो जोग्राफी इकोलॉजी को उन्होंने पहले समझाया है कि मतलब द ले आउट ऑफ द कंट्री द पॉलिसी फ्रेमवर्क इन द कंट्री संक्षिप्त में ब्रीफ में ही हेज ट्राई टू एक्सप्लेन दैट बट ऑफकोर्स देन गोइंग अक्रॉस लॉट ऑफ the emerging and existing threats opportunities which is very important and not opportunities generally but across many many sectors he has told how the opportunities are but the beauty is that opportunity ko sarkar ne unke government ne and many other um, uh, you know entities uh, ngos and others have used those opportunities to uh, affect conservation in a very very constructive and substantial uh, positive manner i think that is uh, clearly uh, it shows that uh, bhutan is a world leader uh, like uh, it aspires to um, and being carbon negative is is a very remarkable thing it's a small country yet it is not that it is easy to do so across jo uh, inhone ek matlab 15 kya kehte hain aadhe pon ghante mein he has given a very nice uh, Uh, overview of the of the country uh, and its conservation and i think this will make many of the people in the audience and the people who view this video to find out more about this and learn from uh, the positive experiences uh, that uh, bhutan has had so i would again like to thank uh, uh, tiger sange ji to have taken out this time uh to uh, share his knowledge and experiences with uh, uh, all of us thank you so much tiger sange and again dr mishra uh, once again it is a remarkable thing i really wish the uh, and hope that uh, jaisa aapne bataya the this these videos the, the recording and the sharing can go to a lot of students across uh, the country and um, south asia and maybe rest of the globe that will be very very uh, useful So with this, I hand it over to you. Uh, back to you, Dr. Mishra. Thank you so Thank you. much. Thank you very much. Yes, you did. एक वो है proceeding का काम भी हमको जो मिल रहा है उनका कर रहे हैं book का एक book लगभग हमारी जो biosphere reserve में है वो just तैयार हो गई हो सकता है एक दो महीने में एक महीने में आ जाए और आगे भी second जो national park और tiger reserve पर थी वो second हम शुरू करने जा रहे हैं और इसमें भी इस webinar में भी मैं भी request करूँगा वो जरूरी नहीं कि रिसर्च पेपर हो उनका बल्कि एक सा, सामान्य जो है छह सात पेज का जो है एक जनरल वो यदि मिल जाएगा तो उसको हम बुक फॉर्म में प्रोसीडिंग में लेंगे वॉल्यूम में आगे चल के अभी मैं रिक्वेस्ट करूंगा लोगों को भेजूंगा ये मैसेज जो है और कल सर चार बजे करीब चार पांच टॉक हैं उसके बाद शाम को चार बजे हम बैरिडेक्ट्री सेशन कर रहे हैं तो उसको भी उसका भी इन्विटेशन हम शेयर करेंगे आज तो चार बजे आप लोगों का समय जो है वो मिल जाएगा तो थोड़ा सा और डिस्कशन हो जाएगा एक घंटे एक घंटे का रहेगा चार से पांच तो सो थैंक्स डॉक्टर यशवीर भटनागर सर फॉर गिवन टाइम एंड चेयर द सेशन एंड एंड डॉक्टर टाइगर संगे सर गिवन ए नाइस टॉक Uh, on bhutan uh, so 
many many thanks uh, uh, to uh, um, from uh, uh, our organization and uh, uh, our country also thank you very much sir yes. for inviting me yes. to talk thank and you uh, thank you, thank you uh, dr jamakarki sir dr satyanarayana sir uh, uh, for uh, share your views uh, in this session okay thank you Hello.
हेलो मिश्रा जी इज वी आर स्टार्टिंग वेलिडेटरी वेलिडेटरी टुमारो सर आज के सारे सेशन खत्म हो गए क्या हाँ आज के सेशन खत्म हो गए हैं केवल अभी हम वो जो यूट्यूब उस दिन गड़बड़ हो रहा था लसारी साहब का उसको हम यूट्यूब में फिर से चला के कर रहे हैं यूट्यूब यूट्यूब में आप देख यूट्यूब में आप देख सकते हैं आज का यूट्यूब ग्रुप हाँ उसमें जिसको तो उसके बाद ये खत्म है कल कितने बजे रख रहे हैं मिलिट्री का कल वही दस बजे से फिर बात है कल चार पाँच तक कल एक पाकिस्तान तो, के हाँ चार पाँच तो आप बच गए थे हाँ हाँ तो कल दस बजे से है सर तीन बजे तीन साढ़े तीन कल तीन किन का है साढ़े हाँ सर साढ़े तीन से वेलीडेक्ट्री कर लेंगे आप चार अच्छा अच्छा चलिए बहुत बढ़िया अभी इन्विटेशन में शेयर करूंगा वेलीडेक्ट्री का ओके ओके है ना अभी डॉक कंप्लीट हुई है आज की और कल कल जो है दस बजे से टॉक पहले मोहन देवराज की है अच्छा सिंध के मॉन्यूमेंट और टेंपल पर होगी सेकंड ओके हाँ सेकंड टॉक जो है वो स्वाट वैली पर है और थर्ड टॉक एक और है मैडम ऐसा करके है सर अब इसको हम शुरू कर रहे हैं यूट्यूब में देखें सर यूट्यूब में ओके 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 चलिए कल वेलिडेटरी में कुछ आ, अच्छा वो सारा भी तो व्यवस्था करना होगा आपको लेटर्स वगैरह है ना आ, नहीं वही भेजेंगे हम वही उसमें व्हाट्सएप में चलिए ये ठीक है ठीक है व्हाट्सएप में भेजेंगे मैं वो लिंक देखता हूँ यूट्यूब वाला हाँ हाँ आप सब लोग उसी YouTube की लिंक देखें जो ग्रुप में है ओके आज वाज अभी लसारी साहब का जो टॉक होगा वो आपको यूट्यूब में दिखेगा गूगल मीट में नहीं यूट्यूब लिंक में और यूट्यूब ग्रुप में है मैं सभी ग्रुप में डाल रहा हूँ यूट्यूब यूट्यूब का लिंक आज का
in the present day administrative province of sin in addition to that the areas of baluchistan on the north west of sin up to the rebulan and sibi and also the areas which are on the north of north east of the sin province up to which in the present day province of punjab and in the south the district of laspela is also included in sin because all these areas were culturally part of sin and had been under the influence of the events which took place in mainland sin for our study we see sin is divided into three administrative units under the sultanate of delhi the upper part of sin and the central part of sin the third one is the southern sin which extends up to the shore of indian ocean the period which we are talking about is the period when the tugluks were trying to consolidate their grip over the subcontinent of india and these were the times when the ill administration of last khilji rulers had rendered the center some what weaker in this background we see that mohammad shah tughlaq in order to consolidate his power attacked sindh and it was here that he died of fever and feroz shah tughlaq took over subsequent to him shah feroz shah rendered his rule in a some benevolent manner that he was able to extend his writ to most of the areas which were earlier claimed by the khiljis but after the tugluks the center the power of delhi went weaker and weaker this was the times when the sayyids and after them the lodhis were ruling tehli uh, but sen was exercising some sort of autonomy but after that we see that arghun center khans fir khuras khan came and occupied most of the parts of baluchistan and sin at the end of the 16th century akbar came and attacked chatta and claimed chatta as part of his mogul empire in the 18th century nadir shah came and attacked delhi he under an arrangement with mohammad shah mogul got sin under his control his brief rule came to an end when he was murdered and subsequent to that the moguls reclaimed sin but their rule over sin at this time was very brief and ahmed shah abdali again under the arrangements with the mohammad shah got control over sin the afghan rule over sin 
came to some sort of a halt in the beginning of the 19th century and Talpur's exercise a degree of autonomy for a very brief period when they were under the agreement and arrangements with the British lost their autonomy and were taken as prisoners first to Bombay then to Kolkata and to their ultimate space where they were kept prisoners. The British rule continued and uh, it was end of the 20th century that uh, the Britishers left subcontinent and Sindh became the part of Pakistan. Why the funerary architecture comes into existence? It is because, as a simple reason, it is because that the people who were related to the person gone and ordered the memory of the loved ones, the elders, they create the tombs, tomb buildings, create platforms to make the burial prominent and they gave compounds to that. It is in order to preserve the memory. Second thing is that the funerary structure is an indicator of power. It is indicator of some sort of greatness attached to the person who is buried. It may come as a token of respect. As we see most of the religious people, the people having some spiritual claims are often found buried under the tomb buildings. So, token of respect and further point, this can prove to be the marker for territorial claims. Further down in the talk, we'll discuss about how this territorial claim was furthered by the tribal people at various junctures of history of Zen. Coming back to the architecture and its styles, during 13th to 14th centuries, we found that the normal fleet roof, squarish tombs were in practice. And we see these in Uch and also Mundan and some parts of Sin, the modern day Sin. These are normally uh, having the roof supported by the timber columns. Somehow it is a weaker sort of a structure and requires lots of maintenance. Another type is the brick built buildings with the roof of smaller domes. And also there are certain cut brick buildings with the high domes, extraordinarily high domes. And also we see that uh, there are chandris or canopies or the pavilions as you may say. And these are also found during the earlier centuries within the area of our study. Some of these structures with the flat roof having the wooden columns supporting the roof are even available presently could be seen and enjoyed in which 
and the adjoining regions. For example, the uh, tomb building of Jahanion, Jahangash, tomb of Abu Hanifa, etc. The cut brick type the high dome tomb buildings are found in Arur and also in the area of Las Pelas. These are very much there and their prototypes are also found in their Ajat. And these are also present in southern part of Balochistan, which is in the upper area of Sindh. Another type which is seen during the 14th to 15th centuries is the cenotaph. Cenotaph is a monolith, a stone monolith, a longer piece which has the carving over it, decorative motifs from simple one to the very intricate ones. And these cenotaphs have actually developed evolved to become the most beautiful pieces of work of art. And also during the earlier part of the 15th, uh, 15th century, we see also emergence of assemblage of carved stone graves, which are having a typical style, having the distinct identity and the tribal people have preferred this sort of tomb indicators for them. It may have one to four steps and it may even have a chamber. These are found in Las Pella and the old Dadu district in Karachi and Chatta district. Besides that, the old type of the Chatris and Kenopis were also given the four walls. So it rendered the look of sanctity, privacy, to these buildings and somehow the tribals thought that it is equivalent to the dome building which is constructed with the bricks or the, or the stones. The uh, stone carved graves are mostly uh, popular during the 15th century and during the 16th century they achieve a marked distinction in a style which came to stay for a couple of centuries further down the road. These platform graves, these monoliths of the cenotaphs have the very humble beginning but still they can be seen asserting their aesthetic force through the careful making of it. These can be found in district of Thattata and an old site of Peer Patto. Platform graves were also becoming popular during the earlier centuries, 14th to 15th century, when they had specifically sized bricks to be applied and they built the parametrical style of the platform graves which were uh, very prominent and with the careful selection of cut brick decoration could become the point of attention. We see that this 
14th and 15th century period has some wonderful, wonderful dome buildings which are coming up in the area of Uch and also down within the region of Sinvaluchistan. These dome buildings have their majesty, but incidentally, all these dome buildings are associated with the people who have some sort of a spiritual relevance or presence. These are hardly to be found associated with any administrative personality or anybody who was actually uh, assigned chieftaincy of this region. At the beginning of 16th century, we see a dome building, a real beautiful dome adoring the burial place of Jam Nizamuddin, the ruler of Sindh. Jam Nizamuddin's claim to the history is that he consolidated the position of sin uh, and he was the one who actually wrinkled out of the grip of the Delhi Sultanate and he was exercising some amount of autonomy despite the fact that the Timurids on its west side were having claims to the India and they had never relinquished their claim on India. Jam's tomb building it is an uh, amalgam of the stone carver's craft which is very much present in Gujarat and also it is having some local relevance when it is an squarish building, high and having embellishment with the holy text and also the flora and fauna which is depicted on its walls with intricate carving. In this picture you can see the 14th century canopy of the Jam Tamachi, another famous person who was taken away from Tatta to Delhi and remained in subjugation there for a year or so and then on the conditionalities he was made to return back to exercise his control over Tatta for Delhi Sultanate. During the earlier part of 16th century, we saw the coming up of the tribal graves, the graves which are made out of the carved stones to achieve a sort of classical standards, which then became hallmark of the commemorative graves for the tribal people who were actually living on the brinks of the Sindh on its western and southern borders. The Riyakhan's grave is one such structure which became standard and was followed all along during subsequent centuries. On the other hand, the tribal people did try to evolve some sort of designs and styles which are there and could be seen and enjoyed. Uh, as you see the variety of the work and these are the 
15th and 16th century structures. During 16th century, we see that Chatta, Karachi, and Lesbella are very prominent with the outstanding uh, stone guard graves. Additionally, we see some of the uh, structures, but not so beautiful within the Piedmont of Kirtar and the present day districts of Jamshur and Dadu. When <clears throat> we see that uh, lake of the uh, built buildings dedicated to the burial place of the chiefs, we see hardly there is any such structure during this period when the influence is exercised by the Heli Sultanah. It is always the king and it is his privilege to allow anyone to erect a dome building or the burial place. So the area under our study has never been so much in the, uh, the favors of the Sultanat, the monarch there, the king there. And this was the reason that the petty chiefs here and the chiefs which were assigned to regulate the area, the region for Sultanat would not allow this fanfare. During the earlier part of 16th century, we saw the arrival of Rohan Sektar Khans. Now this breakaway people from the Hirati king claimed their area within the upper part of, uh, within the lower Baluchistan and said they started having certain fanciful ideas, but yet they were having the fear of the Temurid princes and they were not uh, having that much discretion at their place that they could go for the high dome buildings over the graves. So we see that uh, they have been actually erecting the graves on the platforms and also they were having the enclave walls but no dome building for the graves. Later on when the Aragons moved out of sin because the last Argun Shah Hussein died without a successor. The power was taken over by the Drakhans, who were long associated with the Argun's. And then one of the Drakhan structure, which is remarkable and which has the high dome, was actually built over a child who died prematurely. So it was a fatherly love, a token of the very much paternal affinity shown by the father. Isa Khan Khan one built mausoleum or Sultan Ibrahim, Sultan Ibrahim being the name of the child. So it was not over some administrator or some governor or some uh, person having uh, the sort of claim to royalty. The late 16th century saw two buildings coming up in Makli, Bakha, and also cenotaphs, which were also in the, in the lower Sin and also in the upper part of Sin 
and also uh, another enlargement of Kalandar's tomb we saw in the middle of Sin and it was done by uh, Jani Beg who had the love for the saint where he went and he actually replaced the similar tomb building which was erected under the orders of Pharaoh Shatrugl. So he gave the Gumba de Kalam replacing the six similar domes over the tomb building. So this was a transformation of the building and the way it was dealt by uh, the later builders. 17th century saw some of the remarkable buildings to come up under the Mughal aristocracy. And these buildings were again spread all over to the upper part of Sen and the central part of Sen and also the southern end of it. And here we see that uh, the cenotaphs were much in practice and uh, these cenotaphs form the basis of the marker of the burial place and uh, these were not necessarily given an independent building but there were platforms most of the times where these were put the burials were also taking place in some of the masks associated with certain personalities so one can see that still the people desisted from going for dome buildings because it was out of protocol to have the dome building erected over the grave without the consent of the king. The Kazi of uh, Bakha, Abul Baki, Burani was buried in his uh, mask. Mother and Abul Qasim Namkeen, who was the aristocrat under uh, Jahangir, was buried on the platform which he had built for his evenings. And likewise, Shah Mahmood, the last Subedar, or the controller or the administrator of Bakhar region, was also buried on a platform which was open to sky. Likewise, we see that the, the assemblage of carved stone graves were also spread all over and remarkable uh, uh, tomb buildings or tombs were built within the lower part of Sen and also some in the central part of Sena. These cenotaphs were given beautiful calligraphy which had the funeral statement and they gave the fact of uh, the date of the death likewise and it also recited some poetry. The proud carved stone graves are remarkable and are spread over a larger area in the southern part of Sydney. These are basically the marks of pride for the tribal people who were always trying to rule their life under the principles of chivalry that was the call of the day for them and these were the times for the urban people to have the 
platforms for their graves and there were the different type of platforms nevertheless sometimes these graves were having also the pavilions over these Mir Masum's family graveyard has one remarkable site where we have the cenotaphs and we have the pavilions or chhatris and these graveyards are marked by the buildings which are not necessarily attached to any burial but these are the token buildings which are built for the relief of the visitors for the resting place and one such a structure which is awe inspiring but in another way the curious structure called masum shah's manara but it's not associated with the funerary practices isa khan tarha was a mogul official and he was appointed most of the part in different areas other than Tata itself. Tata being his native place but he was serving the king in various different parts of the Mughal Empire. He started building a stone pavilion which was quite large, extraordinarily large. And once when he died, he was buried there. This is a remarkable structure, unique in sin. And its study gives us the insight that he had been influenced by the structures within the larger Gujarat area where he happened to have been serving. Another official who was buried at Makli and he had the honor to have the dome building over his grave was the famous Sharif Khan who during the days of uh, uh, Jahangir did really made the bad treatment to Shah Jahan who was at that time rebelling against the king. So there are certain incidents for which Sharif Khan became infamous. When he died while serving, he died in Tata and he is buried there. The other dome buildings were basically for the religious figures and you can see that during 17th century there were quite a large number of such tomb buildings available all around in Sin. Similarly, uh, the uh, 17th century and earlier part of 18th century saw the very many chhatris to be there. One interesting incident happened when the Mughal armies, when they were coming to chastise a tribal leader, was ambushed and its journal, two journals were killed. The locals, fearing the <clears throat> wrath of the king, hurriedly built two buildings out of these two generals, one was Bajay Singh Rajput and his dedicated tomb building was decorated with the scenes from the invasion of Lanka where the prominent role was played by Hanuman and his army. So these were the times when the tribal elders took liberties because the 18th century 
we see the power of Mughal kingdom was waning and another uh, power vacuum was created by the invasion of Nadar and the murder of Nadar and the subsequent events. So this all along the 18th century we see a lot of tomb buildings now coming up not for the only religious people but for the local chiefs and elders. And these were spread over to every area of Sindh. These were for the religious uh, people and also for the people who were administering Sindh for uh, the Mughals. Mia Yarmama's stone building in Dadu district is wonderful, remarkable structure. Likewise, uh, another Kalula administrator who died at Hyderabad, a stone building is again very impressive. And the sub high ranking and low ranking people were also having the similar structures over them. These were the times when the tribal people were also having the platform graves and also the pavilions and chatris erected over their graves. So it was it was from all over Karachi district, Las Benda and also uh, even in the the central of Seth and seven region well, there were so many such remarkable uh, pavilions which were built. Now, <clears throat> late 18th century saw the shift in power. The Galoras were replaced by Talpurs and Talpurs were at that time really asserting themselves fully well and their power actually showed. And they happen to wriggle out of the grips of the Afghan kings. The platform graves having the pavilion over it could be seen throughout this region during the Talpur period also. And also the tomb buildings on the the remarkable and outstanding personalities, whether religious or political. So all types of structures were dedicated to the construction of the tomb, whether it be by the bricks or be these with the stones. In every case, these were given beautiful carving or beautiful fresco paintings. With the inception of British, the British started with documenting the uh, local revenue positions. So they had offered the locals that if they are submitting to the British power, they will be allowed to retain their properties, their land, their leases. So this was the time that they started asserting the local chiefs, the local elders and the people who were the landed gentry had the time to actually go ahead with uh, making their claims. So now the verification has started and the elders felt that when the inspectors would come to their area, so they would see what. So they started constructing dome buildings over the graves of their elders. So this was a hurried exercise which was supported by the builders from Marwar and we saw emergence of 
many such buildings all around Sin. And these were such buildings which were constructed on low budget and uh, they were built within a very little time frame. So we saw these is the signs of reclaiming their area of influence. And Kalmatis, Jokyas, Polfats, Lagaris, Mari, Jamalis, all these tribal elders were associated with this exercise. These little tomb buildings were decorated from interior with the fresco paintings. These showed flora and fauna and also depicted the folklores. Thank you ladies and gentlemen for your attention. Hello. Hello. आज ये वीडियो अभी वीडियो चल रहा था जो लसारी सा हेलो कोई जुड़े हुए हैं ये वीडियो चल रहा था वीडियो रिकॉर्डिंग खत्म हो गई है अब आज का कार्यक्रम समाप्त होता है और कल 10 बजे अंतिम दिन रात दस बजे से शुरू होगी और तीन बजे वैलिडेक्ट्री सेशन तीन साढ़े तीन बजे के बाद वैलिडेक्ट्री सेशन होगा साढ़े तीन तक टाक होगी कल पाँच टाक होंगी दस बजे पहले टॉक मोहन देव राज की है जो पाकिस्तान से हैं सिंध पर बोलेंगे दूसरी टाक जो है वो फैजल की है जो फाटवेली पर पाकिस्तान के तीसरी टॉप सत्य कुमार जो इंडियन म्यूजियम कलकत्ता के हैं और वेस्ट बंगाल पर बोले और चौथी टाक प्रीति त्रिवेदी मैडम की जो कि वहाँ पर नानपुर में है और टॉक देंगी और अंतिम टाक पाँचवीं टाक शौकत महमूद प्रोफेसर एंड हेड लाहौर यूनिवर्सिटी आर्किटेक्चर विभाग की है जो सिख मानूमेंट पर टाक देंगे और उसके बाद वैलिडेक्ट्री सेशन रहेगा वैलिडेक्ट्री सेशन में सभी को हम आमंत्रित कर रहे हैं सभी लोग आमंत्रित हैं और एक या डेढ़ घंटे तक वैलिडेक्ट्री सेशन चलेगा और फिर बेलना खत्म हो जाएगा